Hey, everybody, welcome to the annual, I guess it's annual now, I think this is the fourth New Year's Eve five-hour extravaganza with guests. Good to see all of you. Some of you, I'm sure, are watching where it's already the new year, 2024, but for those of you that are here on the East Coast or later on, uh, it'll be a fun night tonight. I've got a few few guests that are going to come on. I'm not sure when but they will be coming on here over the next few hours. Um, let's see here. A couple uh, uh, things. Going to extend the sale that we extended that goes until midnight tonight, the uh, the bundle sale that I've had on since, um, since the live stream last week. It's going to expire at midnight Eastern. Uh, I'm growing a beard, so it's 89 bucks for that. Obviously, the arpeggio course is out, and we're going to be announcing some merch that we're going to sell in the store for the first time. It's a limited amount. Uh, I'm going to bring Mike on to talk about that for a second here. Mike, here, here we go, and then uh, I'm going to talk about some more stuff. Here's Mike. What's up, Mike? You're muted. You got to unmute. That's my first stream yard, man. I'm getting used to it. There you go. Okay, so Mike, um, talk. Tell us about the merch. You're using. You're wearing one of the hats, the like that hat. Yeah. Well, so we uh, we ordered some merch for the the live shows that we had over the past uh, scattered over the past couple of years, and um, we have very little, very little left. So we're um, we lowered the price, and we're going to try to get it out to everybody that wants some because uh because we've never offered merch never had it. well actually we had merch early on in the channel but not in the last couple of years probably yeah. three years or so uh what do we got mike tell well, us what, tell us what we got here well we'll start we'll put this one to the side yep so the, for t-shirts these are all on the website rickbeato.com Ooh, i like that one that's a good one nice gray it's a gray shirt yep we have all almost all sizes available very few in a very few in uh triple xl and this this is a very special one rick how why is this special this was designed by my daughter lennon she did the entire t-shirt design that's obviously my signature guitar on there that she drew and um we have a limited number of those too right mike yeah this was uh this was a popular tour one because the guitar rick signature guitar just came out and uh, obviously, it's a personal favorite because Lennon drew it. So, a uh, little piece of uh, history there is pretty, it's very well drawn as well. I mean, we, that's like when when Lennon drew it, we we had to do it because it was like, wow, this looks like a thirty year old pro did it. <laughs> okay, what else, Mike? All right, we have. What about the hat? There, there we, go. we go. The Beato trucker hat. That's there you the, go. That, there you go. You can't go wrong with that. I'm a hat uh, guy. I can't wear my own hats, you know. It's not not a not a cool thing, but but I'm a I'm a big proponent of trucker hats. I like them. Yeah, this is my favorite one. And we only have I think we have about I uh, only about 40 of these, so this is yeah. probably the least amount. So if you want to get some uh, Oh wait, is there more? Two more. Two no more. No way. So these were um these are items so if you're a VIP the Auto Club member, um, we drop ship uh, special merchandise to everybody that belongs to the Auto Club, VIP or above member, um, and we do that four times a year. And so we have a few items left of that, uh, you know, because we you order items in dozens basically. And so we have a few items left, which you saw me wear before, which is the uh, famous slogan like that, little beanie, like uh, that, and it's insulated as well. So. For me, up here in Iowa, it's very nice because it's cold <laughs> and it's snowing. No. And, no. and we also have these. Yeah. We have a, a two koozie package in the store. Um, perfect for my LaCroix or, you know. Hey, I'm not indoors, oh, but I'm nice. drinking LaCroix. See? See that, Mike? Hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm getting older. I need to watch my uh, belly so I don't drink sodas. And this this uh, has enough bubbles to make me feel. I need one of those koozies because mine's get, probably going to get warm now. It's sitting on my uh, on my converter here. There you go. 
like that. I like it. Okay, so is, is that it for the merch? These are all That's in it. the uh, these are all in the store. You can go see, you can check them out there. Um, all right, so I want to talk about some stuff that Mike can Mike, you can stay on here. I'm gonna talk about some stuff that uh, I always love having a sidekick, especially Mike. Mike travels with me. Mike's my production manager and uh, travels with me on all the interviews, on all the trips that we made overseas. Where did we go in the past year and a half? We went to Iceland, we London. Went to London. We went to, to, to Stockholm, Stockholm, we to Zurich, and other places in Switzerland. We went to, um, to Berlin. Yeah. And then obviously the all the other shows we did. Where do we where else do we play? Chicago, Seattle, Seattle, LA, LA, Chicago. Yeah, Atlanta. Atlanta. We went to um, New York twice, performed twice there. Yep. There are no more. Um, I, th I I feel like we're missing one. I don't know. Um, there are no more gigs scheduled. We've kind of talked about it, but um I don't know. I'm not sure if, if I'm going to do any more shows ever. Pro I probably will, but I, I don't really have anything. Um, I don't have anything planned right now. Uh, I see some comments here of uh, some people they'd like to see on the channel. Uh, Mateo Mancuso. He's probably, uh, probably going to be on the channel here pretty soon. Uh, Aaron just pasted in the uh, bundle for 89 bucks. That's the cheap price that I've offered only four times this year. Uh, that's all four of my courses. Um, so I want to uh, uh, talk about a few things here that, uh, that I'm going to incorporate in the next year. So next year, 2024 is going to be the year of more uh, current artists, current inter interviews with current artists, more talking about contemporary music. I'll still do the historical people like I've been doing, but, uh, but I'm going to have a much more of a focus on new music, on female artists, on uh, music related videos that are teaching and uh, song breakdowns, things like that. I will do. Maybe not called what makes this song great, but but uh, song breakdowns. Um, let's see here. I have some uh, some things I want to play here, Mike. I'm going to put you in the uh, in the bullpen here for a second. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to move Mike aside here. Okay, there we go. He's Mike is backstage now. I want to talk about some of the. Um, some of the videos, I have some clips from some videos that happened this past year. I'd like to do a little, this kind of like a little highlight reel that I want to play some, some things that I put together. Um, I, this was an amazing year of interviews. So here's some of the ones that, that uh, I pulled Dave aside before they went out the door and said, have you ever played to a click? And he said, no, why? And he goes, I, I think maybe we should try it you know, try, it might be worth it on the song to keep a really steady groove. And I had, I always carry this tiny little rolling drum machine with me. And I think he had a, maybe a kick snare hat, or maybe they'd still set up in the rehearsal room. Anyway, he said, I'll go, I'll go try it tonight. And he came in the next day and I said, how, how'd it go with a click? He said, I, you know, I, I think it's okay. I don't like playing too much, but I, I think it'll be okay. So we roll a click, lithium, first take, boom, done. Perfect. I mean, I didn't have to do any drum editing. I was just like, oh my God, Dave Grohl is a machine. He told me years later doing Wasting Light that when I asked him to record. play with a click track, I broke his heart. <laughs> I really like that. I like, uh, I like stories like that, these, these personal stories. Um, Butch was a uh, uh, such an interesting guest to have. I, I'd love to have Butch on the channel again in the future. Here's another highlight of the year. This is from my interview with the great Keith Jarrett. Do that. I got less interested with fourths. He's talking about way, fourth voice. You never played fourths. McCoy. More, yeah. I did, I did do it, but, uh, uh, you know, on a couple of things. Yeah. 
like the the thing I played for you that I did in um in at East at Eastman at Eastman yeah yeah there were some parts of that I mean yeah. playing the fourth let me give you a little context about what Keith's talking about there related to fourth he's talking about fourth voicings in the left hand like McCoy Tyner used to do Keith did not do that very often but it, when I visited him a couple weeks before this interview I visited him and his wife Akiko. And we hung out for a few hours and we listened to music. And this one piece in particular he's talking about is a piece that he wrote for the Eastman Chamber Orchestra in 1970. But I mean, uh, other than Coltrane. Okay, so um, I, I edited that here. This I, I, I condensed some of these things here. Um, but Keith goes on to talk about, about how these type of voicings these fourth voicings that McCoy Tyner used and a lot of piano players back then used, he didn't, uh, he really didn't go that route and how uh, we talked a lot about his triadic harmony. And that was a thing that, that really differentiated Keith and Pat Metheny and Gary Burton and Steve Swallow and a lot of the ECM artists of that era, Keith, especially though, that, um, that, uh, that harmonic vocabulary it was, it was fascinating to talk to him about that. We have some uh super chats here. Um, let's see, band come about to go to bed. A few hours since we turned up the clock. Happy New Year, beautiful people. Rick, keep it up. Love you. Thank you. Oh my god, that's so cool. Um, happy new year. The uh, the super chats I'll put up on the screen, but pl please don't spam me by uh, last year. Some of you kept putting up little super chats so they could uh, they could do it. Just if you're going to do it, just do one. Um, OK, another thing that was a great, great interview, really fun. Was this. Okay, so one of the great things about doing these interviews is that I get to sit next to these people while they're playing, and that's always the best part, to, to sit next to Keith Jarrett, to sit next to Steve Lukather. Um, you know, it, that's the... You know, just an amazing, amazing thing. Here's another one of my favorites from the past year. This particular interview, I really out on a nylon, like Robert this, DeLeo, okay. and it was literally just started out as a a bossa nova. You're you're channeling your Jobim. Yes. Yeah, so. works so well as a bossa nova. Yeah, that's how it started Beautiful. out. And just... But I knew I couldn't do that bass line to that. Right. So I... You know, just put it into that. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of... That allowed me to do that. Okay, so Robert is as nice of a guy as you can imagine. You just... You know from from seeing him there that he's a great guy, and he's exactly that person in person. Um, <clears throat> another one here. Ever Mark know Rainey. if you're going to retrack a song? I Hilarious. have overdubbed Asia so many times. <laughs> Every time somebody passed me on the back about the bass line, I said, I played it so many times, it better be good, but it should be. <laughs> On all the songs, I think the only album that I did with this with the Steely Dan where I didn't do a lot of overdubs was the Royal Scam. Okay, 
Uh, they're all you seven. and Bernard are pretty much, that's the whole rhythm section there. Yeah, well, you know, coming from the area, the New Yorkers, Okay. you, you get it done. Yeah. In L.A., you can take a week to do something that we could do in New York in one day. <laughs> I love Chuck. So it's interesting. When Chuck came here to, to the studio, he uh, when I told him where I live, he goes, you know, my daughter lives there. And his daughter lives a couple miles from me, maybe a mile from me. And Chuck's like, oh, I've been by your street before. I was like, What? Isn't that random? That was amazing. Uh, Chuck was was incredible. Incredible. And then, of course, this particular interview, Daniel Lenoir, talking about... Um, always empty sections and production. Talking about Peter Gabriel. What we've had good luck with is if you're on a metronomic time journey, then make it longer than the song need be. Leaving room at the back end for improv stuff and jamming. So the song, okay, the song's finished. Let's have some fun. And the sledgehammer became that. At the end, there was a little about, okay, uh, the song's done. We'll get it right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Kick the habit. Shed the skin. Let's go out dancing to the new thing. So Peter, Peter just went off and and went into improv lyrically, and we were able to take those improvs and bring him to earlier points in the song to help build the arrangement and the journey. That was amazing to, to hear Daniel talk about all these different records that he's been part of. That was, he was talking obviously about Peter Gabriel's So, which Sledgehammer's on. And we talked about the Unforgettable Fire U2, Joshua Tree, Octung Baby, uh, All You Can't Leave Behind. We talked about, um, Records he did with Bob Dylan, with Willie Nelson, with Emmy Lou Harris, with uh, uh, some of his solo records. That's that's the longest interview that I've ever done. Really interesting thing with that particular interview is that that interview, the average watch time is forty five minutes. Now in YouTube land, you gotta you. you that is an insane, insane amount of time uh, for people to, to invest in the three hours. I think it's three hours and two minutes. If you get a chance to check it out, I would say that, um, that, that you should really try to get through that interview. That was, that's, that's one of the best interviews and, and a personal favorite of mine. We got a couple more super chats here. Um, um, this particular one here. I'm not sure how to get this on here. Michael Hargan says, Happy New Year, Rick. Great content this year. Looking forward to future content interviews. Maybe Copeland or Benson. How about both of them? Uh, maybe both of them. Uh, here's another one. Nancy Copeland. Rick, I love your channel. I'm not sure uh, if you have done a breakdown of Kate Bush. I have done a break breakdown of Kate Bush. Running up that, that hill, I did. Uh, you should definitely check that out. I did it when it when it became the uh, number one song in the country, which was amazing. Okay, let me uh, play another uh, uh, interview here. One more clip, then I'm going to bring out one of my guests. They have a first lick they play. <laughs> Look out, here I go, and I'm gonna show you what I can do. More like an Olympics, I call it the Guitar Olympics, where people are gonna put up, it's a nine, it's an eight. It's a 10. <laughs> that was fun. The fact that uh, that Nuno played that on my guitar, he had, I don't think he'd ever played that solo other than when he played it on the record, and he just picked up my guitar, and I, I he was, as he was picking up my guitar, I pulled out my cell phone camera because we didn't have the camera set up yet. And he played that. He's like, I don't even know if I know how to play it. And then he played that. And it was unbelievable. Uh, Mark says 2024, the year rock and roll came to life again. Marcus. Hold on here. I can put that up there. Marcus. Marcos. Marcos. You know what? I think you're right. I think it is going to be the year um, that rock and roll comes to life here. Steven, Al Cooper, absolutely. Um, 
There's, I thought, I thought I saw another one on here. Um, maybe I missed it. Uh, let's see here. Hold on. I'm going to do one more here. Uh, hypes. Give me a second here. This is, uh, I guess I still hold it true. Is that a fretted note on the guitar is an open string. It's just a shorter open string. Mm -hmm. Touching the guitar as if you're setting an open string is a different experience. If I say I want to play this G sharp. And I'm really, my finger is basically acting as the nut. I just have to sound an open string and then you play an open string that's being set by this nut. That's a different experience than I need to press down on this G sharp note because the note's coming from there. And then I've got this open string, which I'm not pressing down on. That relationship has always fascinated me. And I think when you have a chord like that, I think it's asking me as the player to just set a bunch of open strings in motion so that the B doesn't sound like an outlier. Also, you Julian, the way it. that you're strumming the chord, it's the way true. that you play it in the it's tune, different. You, everything is so even. It sounds beautiful. Like right, it. right. You just like went up to a piano, put the, it's the same pedal on it, went, yeah. you just kind of do that. Yes, Julian Lange is that nice. He is, what, what a great, great guy. Okay, I got a couple other clips here I want to play because I have to actually remove these things. Hold on, let me see. Remove from studio. Let's see if it actually does these. Okay. Because I have more clips I'm going to play later on. I'm going to get rid of these ones I've already played. Yes, Julian, what a great guy. That particular chord that he played there, that, uh, what chord would that be? F, C, D, A, B, G sharp. It's a uh, F, 6, sharp 11 with a sharp 9. How do you like that? Uh, F major six sharp 11. You got an F major triad. No, I don't think he plays the open D on it. So he's doing an F major spread triad with a sharp four open B and with a sharp nine, which is the G sharp, which is amazing. Love that. Okay. Here's another great interview here. That's Christopher Cross. That, right. Talking yeah. about sailing. You playing that with a strat. I guess so. You don't remember, right? It's like people asking Ringo if he used a tea towel. You know? Right. <laughs> you know, it's 40 years ago. People ask me, did you use a click? I don't really remember. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it was very well played. I think it was a strat. Uh, probably one of those. It could be one of those Japanese strats that I had. Okay. But a uh, strat through that gray chorus pedal that Boston made for flat. Okay. Lady. Well, that was my next question. I figure it sounds like it's a chorus. Yeah, that gray one that's metal. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's just through that and through the strat and uh, probably doubled it on acoustic, I suppose. But I don't know. Okay. Okay, so Christopher Cross, everyone was saying, I can't believe that Christopher Cross is 10 years older than Rick because he looks 10 years younger. He's what he, he has this youthful energy. I can't explain it, but he is just, um, I think it's his delivery. I'm going to ask uh, Hypes. We're going to, when I bring him on, I got one other thing to play here, Hypes, before I bring you on. When I say Hypes, I mean, my dear friend Keith Williams from Five Watt World, but I always refer to him as Hypes, and he refers to me as Hypes because that's been his nickname and my nickname forever. Um, but this was another special thing that happened this year was the uh, Billionaire Reunion. This is our tune, I felt me.
Oh, uh, you, you missed all that. I was muted. Okay, so I said that the um, that the billionaire reunion was a real highlight of the channel this year. 22 years since we had played together and it was uh it was just incredibly fun to to see the guys. I hadn't seen Walter our, I had only seen Walter our bass player once at Mark's wedding or singer Mark seven, eight years ago. That's the only time I saw him in the entire time um, that we had been uh, since the last time we'd played in 2001. I mean, really stopped playing together in 2000 and we did one gig um, that was uh, on Thanksgiving night, 2001, where we opened for a band called Holly Faith. And another guy, James Hall. We actually were opener for the for for a reunion gig. And um, uh, Holly Faith, my dear friend Rob Aldridge, who passed away two years ago. He was the lead singer of the band. I made a video about Rob after he passed, uh, and it was a really tough, tough video to make. Uh, he died. Uh, uh, unexpectedly, I guess, expectedly, unexpectedly at, um, I think Rob was about 55 or so, 54, 55. And man, that was tough. So, uh, so that was the billionaire reunion. Um, first time it happened. And I said before my mic was muted that, uh, we're going to probably make a record this year at some point where we'll be, uh, where we will film it and put it out. We're so we're talking about it. We'll see what happens. Okay, I'm going to bring on my first guest. Welcome to the stage, Mr. Keith Williams, otherwise known as Hype. Hype, you get your mic on. You're not like me, right? No, I was saying that's that's very five watt world to have your mic off. It's nice. It was very welcoming. I found that you, very you much felt you felt it right, right at home. Yeah, I can feel it right. Just like. Okay, so I mean, I'm curious to see how many how many of my guests uh, have their their name with lowercase all lowercase letters. That's like a pet peeve of mine. I can't um, I can't have names with lowercase. Okay, well, you know, thanks for having me out. (laughs) (laughs) Hypes, I love the the purple. Looks amazing. Thanks. It's my. Now you notice that Keith's video looks way better than mine. Just uh, the lighting, everything. (laughs) Well, you know, you don't have much gear, so true. You got, <laughs> you got to make do. Actually, I'm a little dark. I could, I could probably bring up the lights here a little. No, bit. I think it looks good. Your it's vamp. really. Let uh, me get the lights. <laughs> it, I think it looks good. Okay. And and what do you do? You project a, a purple light on the back wall, and it just, uh, uh, it just. Shoulder oh, light. tricky, tricky. tricky. Th- shoulder light. Nice. Wow, I like it. Very cool. Look at that. It gets a little intense. It almost yeah. looks green screenish when you really slam it. But yeah, that looks yeah, that's amazing. Like it, that's like at six. Okay, so I never knew that it was. I thought you were projecting it from down low up on the wall, but it's no. Right, to, to get right the to get the halo thing. If anything, it should be a little higher so that you get the halo behind your head. So it makes this thing on the wall. Okay, so you guys know that Keith, well, you don't know this, but Keith is two years older than me. But why is it that you look about 10 years what? younger than me, Hype? Why you got to go there after the whole Christopher Cross moment? You know, where. Because everybody looks younger than me. <laughs> Maybe it's the white beard. I mean, I don't know what. Um, yeah. I don't know what I did I, to deserve I, all this white hair. I took I took my mom to lunch. My mom was 86 for her Christmas present. That's what she wanted. And um, my mom's 86 years old and her hair is not as white as yours. Crazy. My mom's hair before she died at 90 was not as white as mine. Neither was my dad's who died at 85. Yeah. And I have more white hair than any of my siblings. So I don't know why. And I'm the second youngest. Yeah. It's been an embarrassment my whole life knowing you that you were younger than me because you were my guitar teacher. (laughs) And I went in and I expected this, you know, crusty old, you know, chicken soup on his shirt jazzer and is this young guy right out of school 
So I, I did have black hair and a black beard back then. Why a lot of black hair. Uh, yeah. People can go watch my video about taking lessons with you. The yeah. part my, I like about when they comment on the video that I made about taking lessons with you is there's a thing where I set up the camera over my shoulder and I'm throwing pieces of paper on the desk. And people are like, how did you get Rick's handwriting like on the paper? And I'm like, I still have the paper from the lessons. <laughs> Rick's like, just bring staff paper. And he'd write out the tunes for me. He's like, here, go go play all the things you are. Come back when you can play the changes. So I, I just didn't come back. You know, <laughs> I, never, I never got to come for the second lesson. It's just one. I took one lesson with Rick. No. I mean, it's pretty amazing, though, that we've been friends for that long. 1987. Yeah, crazy. the other fun thing was about having those charts is like, so when I live in Owego, like 1997. Oh, I should say before I do that, when you were with Billionaire, you guys were on tour, you played in Vestal, you all slept on uh, the floor of like my guest room because, you know, the, the, the whole band was there. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Uh, yeah. So 1997, I was like playing an arrangement of uh, My Funny Valentine. And you're like, you're like, hypes, that's, that that's, cool. What is that? I'm like, it's your arrangement from 1989. Well, you know, oh, of course, of course. Here, let me look at that. I didn't remember. You know, why why would you? It sounded familiar. You taught a couple lessons in between 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, those lessons I taught here when I, after I left Ithaca college in, uh, from 94 to, to 99 was, uh, that was probably as beneficial as going through six years of college. I learned more thing. I learned as much as I learned about songwriting through that. And, you know, I don't think that there's just any more ear training. I, I, I would literally write out a song, 50 different songs a week for people. Cause I was teaching whatever people wanted to learn at yeah. the local music store, I would I would teach the things. So Great. um I didn't know that that in the future that was going to be the kind of the basis of what makes this song great, but that's why I know why uh I know how, how all these songs go. And yeah, well, right after I get off the stream tonight, everybody, I'm gonna be auctioning off some of those handwritten, you know, charts of Rick's. So come over to my channel. No, I'm kidding. I'm not I'm not gonna do that. I'm not logging on. I'm not cool like Ward. I can't wait to, to get Ward to come on. I don't do like the Moochie awards and I'm going to give Ward grief about not being on the channel this year. Not that I know anything about what he does, but you know, I, I think you should have me on anyway. You know? you know, I've had Ward on my channel twice and yeah. I've never been on his channel. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. What, come to think of it. Let's, let's start. No, no, I've had, no, I've had Ward on more times because we got to <laughs> gotta put together the, I mean, what is this? This will be the third New Year's yeah. Eve Ward or the right. second, the third, I think. It's at least the third. Yeah. 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 That's okay. Ward, I, well, I know, I'm sure Ward is going on his. Uh, he's live. Yeah. He's so definitely can bust on him. for not, yeah. another 30 minutes or so. He's going to yeah. know his ears are ringing right now. Yeah. Somebody said they just came over from Mooch. Nice. The Moochies. And, um, and, and billionaires got to play Moochie Palooza. Well, Ward's band, I want to see Ward's band play his trio, his power yeah. trio. When Ward was here, he was playing, he did the entire uh, set of guitar solos from the Beatles from the end of Abbey Road. He did them all back to back. Does he, so does he have a full stack though? He has a, uh, he has a, a, a mini uh, JSM 800 with a, I think a 212 cab. Oh, does he has sort of what, the... what, what are the ones that they, they're, they're the 20 Watts. Yeah. And he's so, they come with the, the, the is it a 212? Copy. Yeah. With a slant, right? Yeah, he's got it. They're cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. 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 Um, I was actually playing earlier today. Um, I have a of uh, a Friedman Jerry Cantrell amp that I got recently, and um I was playing it. I actually played it for the first time today, and it's really good sounding. Yeah, um uh and it's I think it's a twenty. Is it a 20 watt? You know, those ones, I think, I, don't know that amp. I think it's a 20 watt, 20 <laughs> watt amp. You know, the, when I was looking to the billionaire clips, um, and I'm playing through these, you know, these small amps and everything. When I play through those, the big amps there, there's nothing like the headroom of those things. People think that we're blasting ourselves with that. First of all, we've got earplugs on number one, right. number two, uh, the amps are not that loud. 
So Mark had an attenuator on his Plexi, on my Plexi, that's behind yep. it. Yep. Taking it down probably, I don't know, 20 dB or something like that. No, maybe more than that, 35 dB, a lot. Uh, yeah. I've and then um, my, I was using my Jubilee, which, man, did that sound, that sound is so good. It sounded good on the recording and it sounded really good for our live show that we did. So that was, uh, it was fun to do that, to actually play standing up. You don't think about these things. When was the last time you did that, right? Right. You play standing up with a strap on, play through an amp, um, step on pedals. Oh my God. (laughs) That is, uh, that's the thing. So, so tap dance, uh, We've been jamming. I, I haven't made, put out any videos. My kids wouldn't let me, but I've been jamming with the kids, with Dylan, Lennon, and Layla. And so Dylan is learning to navigate, play electric guitar, and navigate foot pedals too. And I was telling him, I said, oh, yeah, there's just one other thing you have to do, Dylan. You got to step on the distortion. We were doing some Nirvana, some, some Led Zeppelin, and and uh these are skills that are that go beyond playing guitar, but are part of playing guitar. Absolutely, like muting the uh, open strings and standing up and playing. And he actually said that it was interesting. He said that it was um, that it was easier to play standing up. He thought. I thought that was interesting. Hmm. And because he hadn't at all till you guys yeah. started doing this, the family band. Yeah, and it, you know when you stand up, it puts your. Uh, it puts your hand, your right hand in a very different place. The left hand's kind of similar, I would say, yeah. if you wear your strap at a di- different height. I, so when you used to do your jazz gig each week, you, you sat down for that, right? Nope. You stood up? I stood up. I, I Well, no, I always stood up. Okay. Um, yeah, because I was playing a D- the Black Diakisto at the beginning, yep. the Fender Diakisto. And then, um, and the thing was just, I'm like, you know, I'm just not that big a guy. And I switched to a Parker uh, Fly Deluxe with just the tiniest bit of piezo rolled in. And I played it that way for, you know, with flats, with uh, 10 flats. And yeah, but that uh, thing weighs about three pounds though, right? It weighed like four and a half, five pounds. Yeah, it weighed nothing. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it, but that guitar is interesting. It's kind of like switching from a Les Paul to an SG. It's like, yeah. where is the fifth, seventh? You know, it's like, it shifts the everything. So, um, so yeah, you had to practice standing up. Really big so, so uh, uh, Dean asked the question. He says, is Dylan left-handed? Yes, Dean. Dylan is left-handed. He's got, uh, he plays a left-handed SG. He's got a left-handed Gibson uh, double O. Uh, what, Hypes, what is it? Double O. What, what is the small Gibson? That's oh, the, the, right, he has an LO1 maybe even? Yeah. Du- uh, double O is a Martin thing. So it's an LO1, like a little blues guitar. It's a, uh, it's, it's like, like this parlor guitar. I guess you'd call it that. It's a small body. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful guitar. Is. Yeah. They're I mean, really a great speaking, sounding, great, great voice sounding guitar. Yeah. Really good for singing because they've, um, that, cause they're not getting in the way, you know, of all the bass and stuff. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's, I thought it's called a double O. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, and I ordered these Fender uh, Jag Stangs for, for Dylan and me, right-handed and left-handed, that'll hopefully be here in a few days, uh, which I'm excited about. So we can do dual Nirvana with the <laughs> left and right-handed guitars. That's an, that's an Instagram post waiting to happen. I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a bass. I told, told you this. Lennon has a hard time playing uh, jazz or P bass because they're so heavy. Yeah. You know, she's 14. She's not that big. Yeah. And, and, uh, so I think you and I talked about this. That yeah, so was Dan Electra Longhorn. Yeah. Well, I was, I was also looking at the, um, I think Fender has three quarter scale, three quarter inch. Three oh, they quarter, make, they make short scale bases, right? So, yeah. um, yeah, like a Bronco. Yeah. So, um, they're, they're going to fill the, uh, they're, they're going to fill the, the chat with what, it, with the models here in a second. There we go. There we go. Yeah, so so I, I haven't gotten her one yet, but um, it's it's difficult. She can't stand up and play because the I mean, honestly, the bass is heavy. When I stand up and play my jazz or P bass, they're heavy. Yeah, they are. They're, they're just heavy instruments. Yeah. Yeah. They're big. Yeah. Uh, compared to playing an SG or my signature guitar here, which are incredibly light. Right. 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 Um, yeah. So 
Hypes, what do you got planned for the new year? What's what's the what's the what's going to happen on your channel? You had some oh, big, what's, really what's big videos up? recently. Well, it's funny. People are always like, um, "Well, you've done them all." I'm like, I have 130 <laughs> topics on a spreadsheet. So um, I just got a copy of this. These aren't that hard. To, these aren't that easy to find. Okay, uh, copy of Yamaha. Um, and I actually have a line to talk to Matt Blackett, who was one of the original authors. Um, I didn't know Yamaha is still the biggest instrument company in the world. Oh yeah. Just by far. Yeah. 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 Um, um, who are some company. Yamaha players? Um, well, like way back in the day, Springsteen had a custom Yamaha okay. and at this, and at the same time, I well, don't think, same, I don't think of uh, hypes. Come on. You already had Springsteen in your telly video. Okay. <laughs> well, you made him want people to buy tellies. Um, but at the same time, I think it was the same model. Paul Simon was using a Yamaha. Okay. Time. Um, uh, Tom Schultz played Yamaha uh, 12 string. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yamaha um, had some very, very nice guitars. Very playable 12 strings before. Well, they had, they had great acoustic guitars in the 70s. Yeah. Those are still really collectible. The red was, guitars. Was Kurt nice. Rosenwinkel a Yamaha player? Did he play Yamaha he, guitars? He's still. He's, still he's, like, it, right? he's playing like that SG-1000 with the dot neck and the white, white guitar. He's playing those. Um, I think, um, it, I think those Mateo are Man, Mancuso plays. Yep. He does. Mateo Yamaha. is a Yamaha guy. Yep. Is it the same guitar he plays as Kurt? No. Um, Mancuso is playing a, a previous generation Rev star. The okay. one that Rhett made the video about a little while ago. That was okay. such a big video for him. Um, and those, they do those at like three different levels. Um, and then, um, uh, what's the entry, the one that's been like the entry level guitar forever, uh, Strat style guitar. Pacifica, the Pacifica okay. line, like, yeah. So, uh, you know, but, but like you said, it goes way, way back, you know, and then of course Santana used one on the Moonflower at mm -hmm. that time. That was, I mean, it's, it's very much like a Les Paul, but, and an SG sort of stirred together. They're heavy guitars. That's somebody the put, model. That's the model that Kurt plays. Okay. Somebody put that. Uh, I don't know if they put Rick Emmett in here from, uh, from Triumph. I, I don't know. He played, he might've played Yamaha. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, very well may have played Yamaha. Yeah. L.A. Smith played Yamaha. So I had a friend, Boris Mihailov, that was a friend of mine in high school, eighth grade or so. When I first started playing guitar, he played guitar and he had a beautiful Yamaha acoustic that sounded amazing for, back in the mid seventies, you know? Nice. nice. We got and uh, let's see, we had a big, let's see, Maddie, uh, what is this? Maddie K. Matty K. Uh, cheers to the two greatest gentlemen YouTube music. Gentlemen. Oh, he must not know us, Hypes. Um, well, great to man. see you together, Rick and Keith. Here's the 2024 has in store. Happy New Year's to all. Matty K. Matty, thank you so much. Really Maddie's appreciate it. Um, uh, really appreciate it. Yes. Uh, so, okay. So, Hypes, you're going to do a Yamaha. Yeah, video. I'm going to do the Yamaha one. I probably, yeah. I'm probably going to do, um, <laughs> though they've been so much fun. I'm probably going to do the uh, top 20 SG players that changed the world video coming okay, up. There you go. Yep. Yep. Those, those have been very popular um, and uh, divisive. <laughs> right. You know. Well, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting experiment in agreeing to disagree or just recognize that people get to have different opinions about, you know, who made the biggest difference, you know? So, so I, have been making countdown videos, listicles, whatever. You've done a couple. I've yeah. done a couple. And um, the only <laughs> one that I've made that people, that no one watched because I think they were mad uh, was my top 20 pop punk songs of the 90s video. Oh, right. We were going to read I left, title that. Yeah. I, because <laughs> I left the offspring off it, people got mad and didn't watch it. I, but I think I'm going to change the title to see if it helps is top 20 pop punk bands of the nineties besides the offspring. Yeah. Well, and mine's going to be, you know, uh, greatest ES three thirty five players who weren't Alvin Lee and, and, and didn't have that one show where he was seen anyway. So just to take everybody off. Yeah. yeah you know, everybody who's important to everybody's different. And, and I say that in the video, um, but it, by the end they're all whipped up and they're just, uh, you know, flying away. So. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, those are opinion videos. Yeah, they are. And and the, S, the SG one will be good because we'll get Zappa in there and we'll get some people that I haven't done 
anything on, you know? Um, yeah. The, I, I redid the, um, this was great. I redid the guitars of Eddie Van Halen video. And, um, and people don't might, uh, unless you followed me very minutely in the channel, I had, I had that video get taken down because of a photographic copyright claim and, um, through connections in the business, people Rick knows that I know I actually connected with this guy who was the photographer. He's one of the top three or four rock photographers of all time. And, um, and he was cool about it. And I said, yeah, I'm going to redo this, but I don't want to use your stuff again. And he gave me access to his online gallery. And I would, every time I was using a picture, I would go back and forth, make sure it wasn't his and all this kind of stuff. And then he's, he's like, well, I'll look at it for you. I'll, I'll call you right back. So he calls me back and he goes, he goes, well, yeah, you know, these three pictures are mine. And then this picture of Jimmy is mine. And I'm like, what do you mean that picture of Jimmy? The picture of Jimmy is in the white dragon suit. I said, that's from the song remains the same. He goes, yeah, I was, the, I was the still photographer on that. I was like, it just blew my mind. This guy was the still photographer backstage at Madison Square Garden for Song Remains wow. the Same. And yeah. how old is he? I don't know how old he is. He collects motorcycles. Um, he, he was, he, like I said, he, he was, he's been in the business forever. He was really good friends with Eddie Van Halen. He's done two or three books of photographs of just, you know, that you've never seen these pictures of Eddie. Um, and he just knew, and it's interesting, you know, he's a photographer. He doesn't know anything about the guitars. I asked him questions about the guitars. He's like, I don't know what that, I, the white one. I'm like, yeah, the white one, Never mind, you know, but really nice guy in the end. Um, and like I said, if, if I, if I didn't know people through YouTube, I could never have connected with them. Um, but that thing about the, the Jimmy page photograph, I was just like, okay. And in the end, you know what, in the end, he let me use all four photographs for no fee. And and and, the, and you re you re uh, posted the video, correct? I, I recently reposted the video, actually, yeah. um, this last month. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to bring Mike back on here for a second, so he can he can do a little merch uh, talk about the merch drop here. Mike, oh, I didn't know we had Mike here. So yes, you... Mike has been in the bullpen, and and uh, Mike and we have we have merch hypes just really for today. That says like hat like that like that man. It's a ha like that hat like. Like that, like that, I like that, like that, you like that. I like See? that. <laughs> you have that and hypes, and it says hypes like oh, that. Oh, oh, it says Excuse like me. that, like that. What else, what else we got in there, Mike? Well, we have uh, the, the favorite, the trucker Beata hat. trucker hat, covers up my messy hair. Yeah, that saves you. You that need looks that. Good, yeah. Then it, there we go. Music. Everything Comes music. Great. I've seen Great. people wearing those. I, I I sold them at at my live shows, and I've run into people wearing those. That's before. pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. And then and then the, the our favorite piece, the Lennon designed everything music with my uh with my like signature that. car on that. Wow. Picking so, up the bill and blue for the name. That's good. Yep. I like it. So that's uh so those are our our pieces of merch that are on. If you go to rickbiata.com, you can find those. Got the bundle on sale until midnight tonight. Eighty nine bucks. This is the end of the sale. It's been going for uh, for since the uh, uh, right after Christmas. Nice. And um, it's also a way to support the channel. Uh, Hypes has a uh, uh, a Patreon. If you want to support his channel, you can also become a, a, a member of the Beato Club. It's another way, but. This is how, uh, and he's got merch. He's got his five watt world. Tons of merch, yeah. Yes, There's lots and lots of merch. And that you're, you realize purple. that your your purple matches perfectly with, uh, so you know the color setting yeah. on it, right? I, yeah, right. Maybe, maybe, maybe I might have had a consultant in here earlier. So, so the YouTubers rely on selling things to, um, you know. Uh, my, I mean, that's how, that's how we actually are able to keep making videos. Yeah, right. If you didn't, if you so, didn't have the multiple streams of income, it, it just wouldn't yeah. be possible to keep going. Yeah. Absolutely. I, you know, I, a lot of my interviews get demonetized. My Steve Morris interview that I just did got demonetized. Steve will be getting all the money <laughs> or whoever has the publishing on the song that he played uh, at the beginning. It's his, his track. And um, that happens with a lot of the, um, a lot of the interviews I do, the people from the bands make the money of the video from the videos. So uh, I need to support the channel. Um, 
through selling things in my store and, and, um, and Keith has merch and he has a Patreon. And if you want to support his channel, I would highly recommend I'm a supporter. I'm a Patriot patron he is one of the earliest. Yep. Yeah. So, um, uh, so anyways, that's it, Mike, I'm putting you back in the bullpen here. And, and I want to point out, unlike Ward, I've had you on my channel. Wait, wait, how do I, how do I get rid of Mike from here? Hit remove hypes. I don't even know. Uh, I don't have that screen up anymore, Hold but on. yeah. Okay, there, there we go. go. Okay, there remove. Go. Remove. There you go. Ives, come on. You move and how remove. How long did it take to get the purple of your five watt world shirt? Which, by the way, when you open it, it's still covered by the microphone. If you're gonna really do a, a merch plug, there you go. Perfect. Uh, there you go. Merch plug. Yeah. Uh, the purple. Well, it's funny because I because you know me, like my clothes are pretty minimalist. And I started, um, I bought some shirts I, for a long time. The only merch of my own that I owned is a shirt that just says enough and five watt world underneath. And I would wear it. If I wanted to buy a guitar, I would say it, it, it's enough. Come on. You, you don't need that. Is it ever enough? Hypes? Come and, on. and then I'd buy it anyway. So then, um, so right. So then the, the purple is the only kind of wacky color that I wear. So that's the thing along with the, the signature blue jean shirt. I can't believe you're not wearing your denim tonight. Now we're in my denim. Uh, Nina got me this for Christmas. This is a corduroy. You know, I'm, I love wearing corduroy also. <laughs> um, Such children of the seventies. This is a per. This is a perfect shirt too. This is a really nice. I like. Uh, I always wear shirts that have uh, that have. You have to have a pocket on each side. You, you do. Um, oh, I guess you do. You do. I didn't know you did, but well, did. I mean, I need that. That's the the part. The things that people don't know about me are these. I need to have things balanced. I need to have doors closed. <laughs> I have to have the doors closed in the studio always. I can't have one door open. You have to have the same number of Les Pauls in each rack. The in the billionaire <laughs> video, the the while well, we're playing the song, the door is open over by the drums, and that is such a it's, it's that's so room. wrong. It it <laughs> when I watch it, it hurts. It 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 really just kills me. <laughs> I, I can't. Well, we were talking about this the other day. You you actually um, think about a lot of, and what well, we all think about, obviously the, the the setting and the stuff. And we joke that your house is really a film set, you know. Right. And you've and you've spent a lot of, and you're still spending time, sort of thinking about how how that morphs over time and how that works. Well, the, the the colors, for example. I mean, now I'm not lit very well. I'm very washed out here. I probably could use some yellow light on me. You think hypes? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, what I tend to do is like white on the left with the key, and then I fill with a little more yellow to so if give I, me the illusion of having blood under the okay, skin. Let me see that. Let me see if this actually helps. Hypes. Let's see. I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow to this. Yeah. And and tuck the. Uh, is this any better now or no? Yeah, that's a yeah. little better. It is a little better, and it also you got more fall off on the other side. See, this is free consulting, boys and girls. This is this is the kind of stuff that you, you pay the big money for. I, I was, uh, I'm growing my beard out. This Still. is, the first, the, I don't know when, this is the first time I've ever grown my beard for, I, I rare, I've only had a beard. I've had a beard a couple of times, but this is the first time I've ever grown my, started to grow my beard out and it did not itch at all. I can't even believe it. I don't know why it doesn't itch. It just oh, doesn't. Interesting. Well, I just realized the other day that this is the first time in my life that I've had, I've had this full beard now for a year. Wow. Yeah, because I grew it. I had COVID last November, mm -hmm. and I literally was so tired that I had just enough energy to do my videos, but not shave. I was exhausted. And then, and then my brothers had some health stuff, and um, and I, I ran into him. And he's like, "That's cool that you're doing the November thing. That's cool, man, that you're doing that." I'm like, "Yes, yes, I am." And that got me to no, into December, and then I was like, "Oh, now it's cold," you know. So, and then I met my girlfriend. Roman, who she's like, she's like, yeah, you're gonna keep the beard. I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't care. Well, it's not, we're starting to get a little bit of cold weather, weather, but it's, um, it's been very, it's been pretty warm here in Atlanta. It's right on the edge of freezing. You know, I, people, people, when we do this together, people think we're in the same town. Well, I guess then I'd be sitting in the room with you, which I have done. You know, I've come down there and we've made videos and people are like, you should come over to the store. Why? Where's your store? You know, it's in Buckhead. I'm like, I don't live in 
you know, Atlanta. So it's very funny. I'm up here in Syracuse. It's 30 degrees up here today. Oh, yeah. Although I was over on Seneca Lake earlier today. It was it's still beautiful. It's still the Finger Lakes area is just gorgeous. Rick's been to the cottage. To my, my I have been to the cottage. Um, yeah. The uh, uh, the I, I saw a couple um, things here. Let's see. Rick looks beard makes him look old. Is that both of us? Beard <laughs> looks cool. Well, I saw John go by, John yeah. JL Trim go by and oh. he said, keep the beard. Um, and then I, um, Hill Blocks View says, does Rick have shark the leg syndrome? I think you mean shaky leg syndrome or he something? Does. I think that yeah. might be an autofill error. Yeah. Shark, shark the leg. Sharky leg. Shark <laughs> no, the shark leg. the leg. Uh, oh, shark the leg. Shark the leg. That is That would be a great band. I'm not sure what kind of music that would be. Shark the leg. What's the name of your band? I, I play in shark the leg. Really? Yeah. I'm hearing Bobby Darren in my head. No way. Shark the leg, leg is a punk band for sure. <laughs> no, I meant, you know, the, the shark bites. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. So, and, and people don't, we, we didn't do the story. So you and I met, I said it briefly that I took guitar lessons with you because Steve Brown didn't want to teach that guy from the admissions office. Like, yeah, I got no time for that. Um, so uh, that was, um, yeah. So then, so then I was assigned to take lessons with Rick. Demoted. Demoted down. And then I took lessons with you. And then we immediately started hanging out. Yeah. And then Rick was like, hey, you want to? And, and people would comment to both of us that we walk too fast and that we talk too fast. And, you know, Rick and I were, you know, both upstaters. So with this twangy accent that we have. Can people tell that we have the same accent or not? I don't know. You'd have to ask. I, I run into people when I lived in Vermont, um, people people would recognize that I was from upstate or they might guess Pittsburgh, which is not a hundred miles apart, you know, um, accent wise. It's, it's, Pittsburgh accents pretty different. I, I, I knew people that had very heavy Pittsburgh. Yeah. Well, Corey, Corey Congelio is like my, my model of Pittsburgh accent. I'm like, Oh, Corey. Okay. And right there, if people know who that is. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, so that was the thing. And, and everybody said we talked fast and that was when the whole hypes thing started. And I can't even remember who started it. Um, but that's not, even, it's like substitutes for hello. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, so. and just to be clear, just because we're calling each other hypes doesn't give any of you the right. right. No one else can call us hypes. To refer to us as hype. You, you know, I, yeah. Yeah. If you want I've to always that, historically, yeah. I usually make nicknames up for all my friends and then we call each other that same nickname. Oh, is that true? I feel yeah. so much less important now. No, I'm just that that's that's kind of a, a Rick thing. So what, what do we call Mike? I don't have a nickname for Mike. <laughs> Michael's Mike's crying. Mike Mike's nickname is Mikey, but I refuse to call him that. He he refers to he he won't say it in my presence because uh, he knows it bugs bugs me that who could take him seriously. Him, they call him Mikey. See, yeah. it says it in right you can see it right there in the chat. He's talking about the the Beato Ultimate Bundle, 89 bucks, but it says Mikey Loy. Mike, come on. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, he I can see him going like this. He's 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 in the bullpen. <laughs> he can't uh he can't help it. That that's just what his uh must be what his G oh it's what his Gmail is. I think we're uh, we're locked into that or something. That's it forever. Forever. Um yeah. so so what else, hypes? What else you got? Um you have what the else? Yamaha book. But what you have any other things that that you're uh, that you're thinking about other than your top? Well, uh, you actually video? you actually pointed me in this new direction because you brought up this book, and I, I can't believe I missed this book. There's this book called um, Stolen Focus, which is all these different things that are happening in the world now that make it hard for us to focus, and and that really gave me a whole bunch of ideas for different video ideas because our whole ability to focus has everything to do with our ability to play an instrument or even our ability to sit and enjoy playing an instrument or practice or when to practice. And so I actually was sitting um, at the lake before, you know, lunch with my mom today. And I, I just wrote out a ton of video ideas that are kind of spinning out of the things that are challenges for us. I mean, and I, and I just took, um, Rick always tells me I have no discipline when I end up doing this, took Instagram back off my phones and all this kind of stuff. He's like, just don't look. I'm like, yeah, I, I can't do it. So, um, and, and, and that, that actually is a theme. Like I'm going to, I'm going to try to be online less, try to push the number. Okay. So back. hypes will delete Instagram and all these apps off his phone. And then, then I'll put them back on six months later or whatever. But yeah. I was like, why do you, why not just not open them? 
Yeah. Lack of discipline. That's a good book. I, I'm Rick, you know, Rick, Rick tells me about these books and I read them and then talk to him about them. Well, Aaron was the one that told me about, it, I think, or somebody put it in the comments on uh, my video I did with my friend, Dave Rolf, where we talked about this, about, um, about screen time is. Uh, yeah. Well, the interesting thing was the whole first section of the book is really about the internet and screen time and stuff. And then he's going into all these uh, sort of social and environmental factors that are impacting kids' abilities. There's a whole section I'm in now that's on ADHD. And I've had people say to me, oh, that's ADHD. And I'm like, I don't have ADHD. It's because I'm old enough to not have been diagnosed or anything. But the fact is there's all these things that have sort of been growing through our whole life that make it harder and harder to focus, harder and harder, harder just, just to sit and, and play, you know? It's interesting because we are the last, I had this conversation with someone recently that we're the last generation of people that grew up without the internet. We are, yeah. you know, where, um, where we would get bored when we were kids. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have cable TV when I grew up. We, we oh, just yeah. didn't have it. Not until I went to college. Oh yeah. No. Um, I was out in the country. Like, yeah. Yeah. So no video games, no, no, um, no cable TV. No yeah, nothing. There's, a, there's a thing they call um, mind wandering, like mm -hmm. that you let that you give yourself space to let your mind just wander. And they're saying like like you go, we'll talk when you're out for a walk, right? Yeah, I, I have really lousy reception here, so I can't do that. But when you go for your walk, sometimes we'll talk at that slot, and um, they're talking about not listening to a book when you're out for a walk, not talking on the phone, just let your brain drift. And that that has a tremendous um, impact on your creativity. It's when your brain kind of shuffles things out and you go, yeah, you know, this kind of goes with it. Oh, wait, that's an idea, you know, um, and we don't leave our I don't know. Do you ever drive around with the radio off? Uh, I never drive around with the radio on. Yeah, I've never done. I've never been a radio guy either. I don't I don't yeah. listen to I don't music. listen to music in the car. Yeah. Unless I'm driving the kids to school and I want to, And that's the only chance that they'll get to hear. You're going to quiz hear new stuff. If I, yeah. that's the only time they can listen to Alan Holdsworth. <laughs> lucky, lucky little kids. <laughs> if I played Alan Holdsworth, Layla, if Layla was, I say, you know, this is, yeah, it's Alan Holdsworth. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's way too easy. Right. Nobody's tone is like Alan's. Give me a break, dad. Right. <laughs> he tell you the, tell you the whole setup, tell you the whole rig. Ba, ba, ba. If I if I asked Lennon to sing City Nights, she would she could she would do that immediately, right in the right key too. <laughs> in the right key, your kids have good uh, a good uh, relative pitch. They have very good pitch. Um. Uh, but yeah, but the that the idea of uh, um, you know walking around and doing things. Yes. We never could talk on the phone when we walked. You're always just with your own thoughts. Yeah. Back right. then. Yeah. We and like you said, you had a chance to be bored. But yeah. I, I never walked when I was a kid, I ran everywhere. So if I had uh, one of my best friends, Joe Pachotti, he, he lived about three miles from me and I would, I never even rode a bike. I, I had a bike, but I didn't ride it that often. I would run, I would sprint hmm. the whole way. And, um, there and back, never got a ride. My parents, um, my parents never drove us around. That was not a thing. Were you sort of known for that? You grew up in a small town. They're like, oh, that's Beato. I just would always run everywhere, like Forrest Gump, kind of. It had to be something people noticed. I just didn't want to waste time. <laughs> I'm going to get there as fast as I could. <laughs> so well, people, people may not know that that led to like a. Uh, you know, a running career in school and athletics and stuff. Well, I, I was, uh, I think it was that, that uh, it's kind of like when Steve Morris talks about Jocko wanting to go run and burn off energy before they could jam. And I definitely had some type of uh, attention, uh, whatever it is. I, yeah. I definitely had trouble paying attention. I was too poor to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> too poor to pay attention. I was going to say you're. It was too noisy at the house. You had to run away and get get some quiet. Because really, when you're running, people can't just stop you and talk to you either. True. It's, it's kind of like when I did. I did a live stream about mental health and the guitarist, 
and I, I was kind of brainstorming and I realized that I grew up in a family of five, Rick's in a family of seven, right? Yep. Yeah. So in a family of five, um, I, I realized that one of the reasons I played guitar was my family wouldn't talk to me when I was playing guitar and it was kind of a quiet space. I could be even with them, but in the corner playing guitar and they would realize that that took for me uh, enough concentration where they had to kind of leave me alone. So, um, well, my siblings would say to me, don't you know anything other than that one scale? I was like, what do you mean scale? I'm playing chords. <laughs> How do you did not you, know there's between a scale and chords? Did, did you play the same thing over and over, over again? No, but no. they they, just, they didn't they couldn't tell. That was just their their way of saying that I was annoying them. That's funny, basically. But I would sit on our front steps. You've been you went by my old house. We uh, I've been by your old house a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I would sit on those little there's four four little wooden steps, and I would sit out there and play guitar. And there was this kid that was a that was a guitar player, Dave, and I've never could remember his last name. You know how I have, I have a phenomenally good memory for things. Yeah, especially especially like people that you know had something to do with your guitar playing and stuff. Yeah, there's this guy though that 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 would come by. I can picture him, glasses, long, dark, curly hair. He was a guitar player in town. I remember him coming by, and any guitar players would be walking. We lived on the second house in from Main Street in Fairport. And any guitar player that was walking by would always stop if they're walking down Main Street, if they, they, they'd they come over and they'd listen. And, and uh, but that said, I would just go out there and play. Yeah. Was, um, that was my thing. I loved, um, I loved sitting outside and practicing. Yeah. Well, and there's the same thing for me, you know, like in college, I, uh, I would sit and play. I actually, um, one of my jobs when I worked in the art school was taking down the handmade instruments from the wall in the dean's office and and tuning them and taking care of them and kind of keeping an eye on them and i would go into the hallway at rit at the at the art school where i was working not going to school there but i was working as a student and i would play in the hallway mm -hmm. and, and i met somebody recently and their wife was like oh i you know he said jim said you went to school at rit yeah I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't, I didn't, my hair wasn't like this. It was a little longer, <laughs> about, about like yours. And she goes, well, where'd you go to school? I said, well, I went to school in economics, but I, I worked in the art school. And he said, you're an art student. Yeah, yeah. What years are you there? We like crossed over. She goes, wait, are you the guy that used to play guitar in the hallway? I was like, I don't know. Did you like it? <laughs> yeah, it was like, yeah, that was me. That was me for years. I, I would that. play in the hall. Uh, in the stairway at Ithaca College outside where my, where eventually became my office. Right. But I would sit in the stairwell because they had incredible reverb and I would practice my classical guitar out there all the time. Yeah. And that was really. Um, Your guild, which you still have back there. Which I still have. I have it somewhere. It's not in this room. It's in the, it's in the control room, but. That's um, crazy. Uh, but, well, somebody's saying what's RIT, Rochester Institute Technology. Where my, where, my, where my brother Lou still teaches. When my dad was a professor in the art school there. And I'm the second oldest of five kids. It was still free for me to go to college there um, when my dad was. I mean, that's, this is all these benefits are all gone for college professors now. But um, and so I didn't know what I wanted to study. So that was perfect to go someplace that wasn't expensive. So that was that worked out. So it was really good. And there was a school for American craftsmen there. So there was a lot of people making instruments. Do we miss a top chat? Chris Butler. Uh, yeah, Chris, uh, Christopher Butler. Great meeting you and Keith in New York City meetup uh, at the B4 Gramercy show, before the Gramercy show. Forgot to, to bring a copy of Jellyfish uh, tracks for you. Jack Joseph Puig's minus vocal mixes of belly button and spilt milk. Bear arrangements start, sound incredible. Funny about that, Christopher, is that um, I worked with Jack Joseph Puig, who who produced and engineered and produced the uh, the Jellyfish records, the first couple records. And I asked him, I love the drum sounds. I love all the sounds in those records. And I he assisted Glenn Johns, I believe. Wow. So I he mixed this one song for me that I should make a video of. It was. Um, called the same in any language I've talked about. It, it was a, for Cameron Crowe's Elizabeth town. It was a closing credits song with I nine. Who's tune and is it? It was uh Cameron Crowe and Nancy Wilson co-wrote it. Wow. And I produced it and Jack Joseph Puig mixed it. So I was asking him, I said, Hey, tell me about how you recorded the drums on spilt milk. And he said, well, I used the, the, um, 
And this is, of course, the first time I really knew anybody that knew anything about it. The, uh, the Glenn Johns three or four mic, mic yeah, right. recording technique of drums. And he, and I said, okay, can you show me where the mics were placed? And he walked out to the drum set and showed me exactly <laughs> where they were placed. Should which you was do a amazing. Quick, quick so Glenn that, John set up. Yeah. So that was, um, that's great. That was a, uh, to, to learn it from someone that, that learned it from Glenn Johns, I thought yeah. was pretty cool. That's okay. That's kind of okay. There's a, there's another person that, that I really learned about recording drums from was a guy named Ben Gross and Ben was the, uh, produced engineered mixed. Oh boy. He did the first filter record with Hey, Hey man, nice shot. He, there's a bunch of records that he mixed and, and was a producer and he was a very good recording engineer is a very good recording engineer. And, um, in 1995, I went up to, Detroit to his studio. He has a studio called the mix room in, uh, in LA. And, um, he, uh, I didn't know anything about recording. So I went up there to work with this band called orbit to play bass, to fill in for a couple, uh, for, for a couple gigs. And he had all these mics and the drums top and bottom on the toms and everything. And I asked him, I said, well, explain to me how, how you choose, how to do this stuff. Like, why do you choose these mics? I didn't know the difference between a 57 SM 57 and a Sennheiser 421. Mm -hmm. Didn't know at all. I mean, I knew, a, I knew a, I knew a 57. That was the only microphone that I knew of and maybe an SM 58, but uh, he's telling me this stuff and I just wrote it down in a notebook. So when I started producing, I had this notebook. I was like, where are those notes? Oh, here they are. I'll just mic it the way Ben did. <laughs> And it worked great. What, what I remember, I said this to you the other day, what I remember the most of when you were starting to produce was I would talk to you and you were listening to music and you were listening to music in your car. I'm like, what are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm studying. I'm like, yeah, sounds like, you know, um, rumors, Fleetwood Mac rumors. Yeah, I'm studying. And then you did a bunch of covers with like um, uh, friends of yours who were singers and stuff. And, and you were basically recreating the sounds on the records as an exercise. Well, we used to do that. And, and I, you know, I've made a few videos like that, trying to recreate sounds. Like I did one on uh, the ramble on guitar sound. And, um, but when we weren't working, um, I'd have grand Lanyon come in here and he and I would work on, on getting sounds. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny cause I, I mentioned this, Yesterday, I was being interviewed for a podcast and um, about when I interviewed Ron Carter and I asked him about Ru working with Rudy Van Gelder. And I said, would you guys ever work on bass sounds? And he said, yeah, he would go over to his studio if he had a day off and they would if if Rudy got a new microphone, they would try it on the bass and he'd move it to different places and different distances. And Ron said he'd bring his two sons over and yeah. they would just play and they would uh, experiment. Yeah. My, my favorite moment from the Ron Carter interview was when you asked him how they decided to not have Herbie come in in the first in the first you know section of the tune. And then he comes in and it's just this wonderful lays in these chords. And you're like, yeah, he was late. Ron, Ron Carter's like, yeah, he was late. He, he, right, he showed even... up to the gig late. It was a live <laughs> recording. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He's like, he's like, yeah, it wasn't so much a decision as like all we had is the, I was like, that is so real. I well, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that the things about my, these miles records that he didn't, they didn't know when the records were being recorded and he, they would just be released. And he's like, wait a second, I played on that record. And then you have to bring it down to the musician union. Right. And right. Uh, wow. And I guess get paid for, for uh, and get paid for it. Somebody says, I look like a werewolf. Yeah. I take that as a very high compliment. <laughs> So I, I, I appreciate that. There you go. Um, okay. So, uh, Aaron's texting me to remind me about the sale. Okay. I don't need, uh, so it's, um, 89 bucks for my Beato bundle. That's going through midnight tonight. Uh, and that's for my ear training course, my, uh, Beato book interactive. They're all video courses. All the ear training courses pro has programming with it. My beginner guitar course and my, um, Quick Lessons Pro, which where I say like that. So the so the it's on the sale only lasts while you're live today. While I'm live today, That's it. then it's over. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, and we have merch for sale that Mike mentioned. And before. Mike is smiling now. He's backstage. Yeah. Um, and uh, a well-trimmed werewolf. Someone said that. That's um, well. That's of course. <laughs> um, let's see. You were saying, "What am I going to do this year?" I, I'm going to I'm going to do more kind of old. I'm going to do some more old school content. People are always like, "What is the most music from the least?" Gear? Why do you say most music from the least gear all the time? And then you do a history video. <laughs> and it's, it's like, I, you should stop saying that. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? It's my channel. I'll say what I okay, want. Okay. All right. All right. So historically people had very little gear if you think about it there's almost no pedals back in the day i mean hendrix's pedals what do you have five maybe four i mean how it, many pedals he had, he had all the ones that existed all the ones that existed van halen yep. they had very few pedals everybody yep. they interview the the most complex rig of anyone that i interviewed from the 70s was frampton because he had the the Leslie, right? He had the talk box. He had he had amplifiers for those things. He had uh, uh, he had the Benson Echo. He had the Phase ninety. He must have been carrying a number of Bensons, you know, to keep it running. Show yeah, show. yeah, just and yep, a bunch. Yeah. Um, okay, somebody, uh, Mike is asking something about what I don't know. What he's asking about here. Somebody's asking me about the policy for super chat. Um, super chats. When hypes reminds me that there's a super chat, um, I will answer them. But I, <laughs> I'm scrolling back. I don't. I don't really. Um, I think we. I think we hit the. We hit the ones that went by. There was one. I guess there was something really, really early. But it. 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 it things go fast. So fast and um, and okay, and Nancy Copeland left. Did, did another one. Came across a YouTube that was that, that was mad at me for saying Neil Young should have made the Rolling Stone lives love, love your channel. I didn't say Neil Young should have uh, made the shouldn't have made the uh, Rolling Stone list. Um, What'd you say? No, I said that that <laughs> I used him as an example. Probably not a great example because I was really like a lot of these indie rockers that, that are just, you know, chord strummers mm -hmm. who I love, you know, some of the people, Liz Fair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent songwriter. Love so, Liz So Fair. what did you think of me, including Chris Cornell in my ES335 list? What are you talking about? Chris Cornell is an amazing guitar player. Thank you. Thank you. Cause some people gave me grief about it. Oh, so, uh, but I said that Neil would play one note guitar solos and everything. And yet he played the one, one good note, but come on. Cinnamon girl. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to leave off George Benson and put, uh, you know, some of the indie rock, there's there were a bunch of indie rockers that were on there. Yeah. And leave off George Benson, Alan Holdsworth, jo who else? John Petrucci, Ingve, all these influential guitarists. Alan Oldsworth, uh, uh, I forget who else I mentioned, all the people I mentioned, but um, that, uh, you know, I figured that Neil, and I said Neil's a great songwriter, but does, uh, but you know, it's actually kind of unfair to Neil because Neil's a phenomenally good rhythm guitarist, but there's a lot of great rhythm guitarists. I, John Lennon wasn't on the list, I don't think, and he was a fantastic rhythm guitar player. Maybe, maybe was on the list. I think Paul McCartney was on the list. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, the list was just so wrong that. Um, I mean, come on, no George Benson. Give me a break. Right. Exactly. Instant, no credibility with your list. Um. Let's see here. Okay, now all the people are going to be uh, saying bad things about Rolling Stone. I don't have a problem with the Rolling Stone, well, or or just putting putting in the people that should have been on the list that also weren't on this, like Danny Gatton. Danny Gatton was not on the <laughs> list. The Humbler, come on, right. give me a break. Right. There must have been somebody that was about twenty five that was doing it, or some people that were in their twenties. Right. Um, that and that plus Google builds a list. Right. Um. Neil's acoustic playing, Stephen says this, is, is fantastic. He is an excellent acoustic player. And, you know, there is some, there, there, there's a finesse to playing acoustic guitar, a certain feel that Neil had that was amazing. He, I thought he always had a, um, 
always had a great feel, not just, for, not, I don't mean timing even. It was like these guys like Gordon Lightfoot, uh, like, um, uh, like uh, James Taylor. I mean, these the Croce. people were Croce. Oh, God. oh my God. They were phenomenally good players. Yeah. Just, amazing guitar players. Yeah. Yes. Was Dwayne Allman on the list? I don't know. Uh, Guthrie was not on the list. Guthrie Govan. I don't think he was on the list. Um, Nick Drake is was an excellent guitarist. Um, so no, Glenn Campbell. Is that true? Glenn Campbell was not on there. He only plays on on you know. I don't think Tommy Tedesco was on there either. <laughs> People might not know who that is. Tommy Tedesco was one of the greatest studio players of all time. All these great stories about Tedesco, but he also wrote a column in Guitar Player Magazine, which is how yeah. his, which how you and I probably know him is from these these columns in the back where he wrote about being on studio dates and all these great stories. So, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, my favorite my favorite Tommy Tedesco story, and this is a paraphrase is you know, he's in a full orchestra thing and he's got a Telecaster in his lap, and the guy's like, "Yeah, you know, I like Tommy. I like what you did there, but." Could you, could you maybe, could we do a pass where you play mandolin? And Tommy's like, yeah, sure. Hold on. Oh, that was, uh, that was, that was, uh, Lee Scalar told that story. Oh, is it Lee? Tell, everybody tells yeah. that story. And then, yeah. and then he's like, yeah, hey, yeah, it's great. How about, could you like play some band? Yeah. Hold on. And he's playing everything on the Telecaster. You know, <laughs> I love that story. Um, Tommy Emanuel was Tommy not on the list. Bumblefoot, oh my God, come on, Ron should be on the list. Gary Moore was not on the list. I mean, that's, okay, we're done with we're done with Rolling yeah. Stone. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's my God. You think we that barrel. hypes with your uh, three thirty five thing, or yes. uh, you know, yes. you think you got grief? Yeah, right. I could I could have written the Rolling Stone list. That's right. Ooh. Now I wouldn't even people you know kept saying to me, Rick, why don't you write a Rolling Stone? Why don't you write your top 250 guitarist list? Because that first of all, it's way too many people for a list. Right. Um yeah. and you have to have some uh, first of all, I'd set some boundaries. If you're gonna do an all-time list, you have to have a, a you have to have enough distance from the people in time. I, I've always believed that uh, when you put young people on there that um, that have two records out or something, you know, and um, well, you're basically reminding everybody that to do what we what they didn't do, which which is define your terms, which you and I both do, which you actually really were on me about when I was going to do the, the videos. And actually, your brother John was great. Like when I did the Strat video, which is very successful, John's like, okay, well, are you going to do super Strats or is this like three single coils? I was like, I don't, I don't know. He's like, well, <laughs> you got to decide. Like, you know, John, John was very adamant and he was completely correct. He was completely correct. So, and I, and I've I, seen, I've seen all these people. I mean, the people are putting all these, these great players in the, uh, in the lit in the chat here, all these fantastic guitar players that were not part of that list. But I mean, the glaring omissions right off the bat. I, so I had Aaron write a program because I said, can you write a program for this Rolling Stone list? Because there are so many pop-up things on there and it's annoying to do this, to go through, to try to, Oh, to try to deal with the list yeah, online. Yeah. Right? Because you can't, there's no way to search it. So Aaron said, yeah. So he wrote a program and, and sent me a list. He put it into a, in, into a spreadsheet that was searchable. So I just asked him, I said, okay, let me ask you if these people are on here. Is George Benson on here? No. Is Alan Holdsworth on there? No. I, I mean, I just knew the people that wouldn't be on there. Right. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Really? Um, Jay Monty asked me when I'm going to interview Stuart Copeland. I hope sometime. I hope sometime. Um, you know, I, I never say it until I've actually done it. So you, you don't, uh, uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they're in the can. Sometimes they're in the can. Yeah. Right. You can't talk about it, but, uh, but I'm not going to say that Stuart Copeland is or isn't, I will not confirm <laughs> or deny whether, or deny whether he's, whether I've interviewed him yet or not. We're in the Nixon years here all of a sudden. Right. Right. 
Um, well, I, in the, the 335 list, I, w I had an early version of the list and it wasn't in any order. And I sent it to John, your brother, John. And uh, I think Carlton, just because of like the ones that I thought of and the way he was like eight. And he's like, yeah, send this list to Rick and get back to me. See how that works. See how that goes for you. <laughs> like they're not in order yet. You know, calm down. He's very helpful. John's well, very helpful. I always would put things on when I make my lists, I was, I always would think, okay, who's somebody that needs to be on the list that, that people are going to be like, what? And so I would always throw in Holdsworth or someone like that on my list because people need to hear them. I put them on, on my top guitar solos of all time, top 20 guitar solos. I had the kid Charlemagne was number three, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, because, and that's just a solo that, that early on in my channel was something that, that I thought people should be reminded of for the people. Yeah. I, I try to put people in, um, honorable mentions that like maybe other people wouldn't put on the list, but really important, you know, players for me. So that they're going to end up in the honorable mention list. So, yeah. So I've got, um, uh, I have some, some, interviews lined up that I, I'm not going to say, <laughs> but I have some really yeah. interesting, uh, I have some really interesting things coming up that I'm excited about, but I will say that uh, more bass players in 2024 Hill blocks view said, um, yeah, I'm going to be doing some, uh, some different instruments, some, some uh, I'll be, I'll be doing interviews with people of different instruments. I mean, I've done a lot of drummers, I've done bass players, um, but I've done more guitarists than than anything else, probably. But I've done plenty of of them, and and uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of uh, Peter. Happy New Year. Um, there, there's a lot of people that uh, deserve to I don't know, deserve that that I want to hear tell their stories. Uh, that's, and I've learned some amazing things. The story, the stuff with Steve Morris talking about, about Jocko and Matheny and Hiram Bullock and all these people being at the university of Miami at that time. Oh my God. Yeah. What a moment, right? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Somebody rich says real in the years is better than kid Charlemagne fight me. Real okay. in the years is an amazing solo. It is, but that guy doesn't have a microphone. That's not going to work out. <laughs> um uh that that of course hypes you know who did the real in the year solo was it diaz nope this is fun yeah <laughs> so so um um Why am I why am I blanking right now? Wait, wait, wait. You 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 did that to me, but you don't remember right now? Yeah, no, i I just blanked on it. Well, I could have done that. <laughs> I figure some Elliot Randall. There we there go. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, yes. Stephen. There you go. Um Roman asked me if I was my girlfriend Roman asked me if I was gonna, you know, if I should get a guitar, if I was gonna sing on, you know, do a tune. And I said, uh, the first rule of flight club is you do not upstage Rick on his live stream. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <laughs> Cause so, we just, uh, we just did the big family, you know, jam at my mom's house. So uh, we you, you played all these John Denver songs and, you know, Neil Diamond and stuff. And, and so, yeah, so she just, she just came from that. She's like, you should do it soon. I'm like, yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. So some, another person, re restless leg syndrome. I do. I shake all the time. I've always done that. I can't help it. Um, what's it going to take to get Frampton into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Somebody says, "Is he really not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame?" You know, that's a hard thing to search. Huh? To. Interesting. Don't you know somebody? I don't know anybody. Okay. You know that whole. That's like doing Rolling Stone lists, you know, yeah. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I actually had a good time um, when I was working on the 335 list. Chuck Berry was the first person inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As he should have been. And, th and that was a cool thing to come across. And then if you kind of paying close attention, B.B. King was number two on my list. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame started in 1986. And B.B. Okay. King was inducted in 1987. Boom. As it should be. There you go. So it's that would be interesting to kind of look 
over time. But again, it's sort of like, it's just a list. It's just, a list. it's a list organization. You know, I met BB King one time and it was in the lobby of Berkeley in 1986, I think, or 85. Wow. And he walked in the lobby and, and he had immediately was swarmed by people. Of course. What a nice guy. Oh, couldn't believe it. I was stunned. I was stunned. Uh, somebody says, how about Ty? Richard says, how about Ty Tabor? Uh, Ty Tabor from King's X. There you go. That would be a great interview. Yeah, our buddy Johnny would love that. His yeah. Favorite band. Um, here in Italy, it's 2024. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to my Italian brethren. <laughs> a happy New Year from Cork. Rick and Keith. Rick, please do a show in Ireland. 2024. Somebody actually... Uh, offered me uh, a show in Ireland or wrote to me about that um, today, as a matter of fact. I sent it to you, Mike. Mike, did you get that email? Handle it. No. Um, and I think I said that I, I, I wrote to Mike that I've, I've only been to Ireland to, to, uh, to Dublin one time. Mm. It was in 2004. And it was beautiful. Um, yeah, I've been I've been to Ireland twice. It's just incredibly beautiful place. And the thing that really got me was people say to you, "So, what do you think of our country?" And then they sit and listen for the answer. And most of, frankly, here in America, we like say, "What do you think about it?" We're like thinking about something else already. Like these people are they, they are that friendly and that engaged. I, it's really great. It was a really great place. Um, Rick, when are you hosting Johnny Marr? Um, when am I interviewing Johnny Marr? I mean, if I'm hosting Johnny, if I interview Johnny Marr, it would probably be over in England. Uh, but the guys from that pedal show, Dan and Mick did a great job with their interview with Johnny Marr. They, as did. they did with, with, uh, Noel Gallagher. Yeah. Those were great. Yeah. Those guys are awesome. Those guys had a real big year. It was fantastic. They did. And I, I, thoroughly enjoyed being on their channel and them being on my channel this year um, uh, and, and going to their studio, which is just past uh, Stonehenge. <laughs> so it's, it's like Spinal Tap looming in the background. Yeah. Um, we took a uh, like an Uber or something out there. I couldn't drive in England. Um, and the it went down this one road that ended on a fence and Mike and I were there. It was like, well, this, there's some fence in this one lane road that was, went out into this pasture. I was like, this can't be it. So we ended up backing all the way up. Mike, remember that we backed up. Well, I'm going to bring Mike on here. Hold on, Mike, you're muted. That was crazy. I thought we were like in some weird movie, you know, like we we're going to get yeah, you know, trapped or kidnapped or something. But well, I remember driving, you know, on, on on the left in Ireland, and you're driving on these little tiny roads on the way Western Ireland. And after a while, you're like, okay, it's hard, and there's somebody coming, and and then they they give up the line. They're like, yeah, the road isn't even wide enough to have a line down the middle. Good luck, everybody. Just good luck. Work it out. You know. So. Yeah, it was. I I that was it was fun going out there, and then Mike and I went to Stonehenge. I never put out my short that I made, Mike. You got to oh, do it. Somebody's got to put that together. I, I I don't know why I didn't do it. I just I didn't think of it till right now. I'll make but, a note. Um, I'll make a note of it right now. Yeah, I can't even remember what it was. It was some obviously a Spinal Tap reference. <laughs> yes. Uh, that uh, Mike and I we stopped. We said, "Well, we should stop there, right on the way back." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." So. Uh, so we had this, our Uber driver drove us over there and did, and waited for us, right? Yeah. Or something. Yeah. yeah. They waited and, uh, and we walked, we took this bus, you take a bus and you go out there and, and, uh, but then we got there and then you couldn't get near it. You're about. It's a big fence. Well, they, they, they don't let you go off the sidewalk. You can't, we couldn't get within probably what, about 50 yards of it, maybe 50 yards. But the best part for the camera is it looks really small. Right. So I was thinking I was do, doing this and it looks like the, like on Stonehenge, you know, on, on a spinal tap because we're so far away from it that it looked really small. So I thought that that was kind of funny. I've actually ruined the thing now. So when I put it out, everybody's like, I already know that 
Rick's Rick's joke on that. So, um, in fear of being <laughs> trodden by a dwarf, <laughs> that's one of the best scenes ever. Um, let's see here, Mike. What else? Um, what else are you going to talk about here? Is there anything else? So, Mike went on all these trips. Mike, if you had to say what your favorite trip of all the ones we've been on, hmm, what was what was the best one you think? I think the first New York show ties with uh, Stockholm, uh, Switzerland trip because the first show was like, how like how's the live show going to work? So there's all this anticip anticipation with Rick, like what am I going to do for the show? How? So I was being surprised seeing what song breakdowns or what was going to happen at the live show and the the new york audience was super hyped up like they, it was like really high energy and so that was probably my favorite but then tide is going to europe and uh sneaking to switzerland in in the middle of our trip for the stockholm show and then you met that you went to that super cool guitar store where he had every oh, yeah oh my God. every marshall amp and orange like it was it's in Zurich. That's a collection of old. Hmm. So we're hypes. We're in Zurich. We we run into a guy that works at Google. We were. It happened twice. I got yeah. stopped. Maybe three times that I got stopped by people in the street that worked for Google. That was actually right next to the hotel that we were staying at. And this guy said, and we were going to leave to go to the airport that day to fly back to Stockholm. And this guy said, No, no, no. You have to go to this thing. It only take you ten minutes to get there. You have to go to this music store before you leave town. So I looked at Mike. I was like, okay, let's go to this thing. So we walk in and the guy's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I I knew you were going to come by here, the owner of the store. I got to show you. And he had my signature guitar there. But then he goes and shows us these amazing amplifiers that he have. He had a Laney cabinet that was cleaner than mine even. And mine is clean. And he said, and he had uh, some Marshall Plexis from the '60s that were in immaculate shape. He's like, yeah, nobody buys these. I was like, what? Yeah. So I went and looked. Uh, I got. I got to go look at his store again. I, that was a. That was a great place. The guy was a great guy, okay. and gave me a strap that uh, matches my guitar because they did, they had a thing on their Instagram. They have guitars that they would feature where they have they put a matching strap to them. Nice. So. Yeah, that was that was my favorite store, and just walk. You know where where we? What's the town that we went up to where we took the little cars up? You know, there's like a, urine. Yeah, yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, but they didn't have a they didn't have a music store in like every fifteen minutes. Yeah, that was a, that was really that was one hot day walking there. It was somewhere I've never been before, which was a, a bucket list thing for me. I've never been in the Swiss Alps like that. Yeah. So Mike has been everywhere hypes and, and to, to actually have Mike go someplace um, that he's never been before because of all the touring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been to Zurich, but like we went up in these cable cars, like up to the top we went of the louder in, in the, yeah. the valley, which is what two and a half hours away from Zurich. You nice. can see the Matterhorn, like from, from a distance and yeah. you know, these storms would roll in. It was amazing. Wow. It was actually the only time it rained. It had that one thunderstorm for, for about 15 minutes or so. It was the only time in two weeks that it rained that we were there. Um, uh, it was a nice uh, product placement, Mike. Yeah. Subtly no, done. No big deal. <laughs> I got a spare one right here if you want to see it. Nice. <laughs> what about those T-shirts you were holding up before, Mike? Which ones are those? Why do, oh. I, why do I not have one of those? I got to tuck my hair back in this nice, comfortable there baseball you go. cap. That's a big improvement. So if, if you want to get any merch, there you go. This is the only time that I have merch available on my in my store is right and we, now. And when we let Mike off, he's gonna put the link in so everybody can quickly get to it. The link is in there. If you right. want to get some oh, okay. Beato merch, yeah, it's limited amount. That's the Lenin Beato design t-shirt. Um great. This is my as a favorite. Yep. Um and it goes with the the toque. Oh yeah, like that, that. with that shirt. That'd be the full. <laughs> Mike, pretty good. That's good, like Mike. That. Did you learn? Like you it. did. You learn how to do that on tour. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm trying to think what else. Um, I had some other um, some other things that I was going to um, that uh, talking about some other things that I did this past year and what I, how I'm going to change. Hypes, do you think about this stuff? Like, you know, I know well, you have your list of videos, but are, are there right now? You know. Yeah. Are there things, though, that you say I definitely want to do like a concept, though? I want to do more, you, you know, about all well, the, the yeah, you know, things like I said, about having less gear. Yeah. More more back to the sort of do, do things. And and I, you know, I was joking around about singing here. But the fact is, like right over there in the corner, I'm putting together like a, a writing and recording corner to do, you know, actually playing guitar. I mean, when was the last time I played guitar on the channel? So that became a goal. For me, because I'm playing more guitar again, um, playing eights, um, you know, uh, 2010 Pierre's Mirror, which is basically like, you know, it's it's like a beato. If you can't have a beato, you know, signature guitar, then you buy an old used beater like I did and put eights on it, you know. Um, that, but that's one of the things I'm going to do. Um, so, yeah. So I'm looking right in the corner. So I got a whole setup over there. And yeah. hypes, give us another plug for your Patreon. Oh, so to, yeah, so five watt world, support, yeah. Oh, and and subscribe to Keith's channel. Amen. Five it's world. great. Make make me know that this time was where Rick is asking me, you know, who played on what is worth the time here and the embarrassment that I'm suffering. Exactly. Elliot Randall. Elliot Randall. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so five watt world, and uh, come in and and the you know people are uh, very kind and you know asking about success of it, but you know it has a had a little something to do with having a friend who already had a little channel. And I, and I came to Atlanta twice before COVID and made videos with you. And um, my the first time you came here and I had you on my channel, right. how many subscribers did you have and how many did I have? Do you remember? I don't remember how many you had. I had 418. I, I had 427. 427 subscribers. Yeah. Not that, I, you know, not that I know the specific number or anything, but yeah, 427. And then, um, then and you then, start getting a th thousands a day. I, I literally, I had a, I had a video in the can. I had done some short history videos about amps, but I hadn't done the big guitars. And when I was there, you're like, why have you not done these? I was like, I have a draft done of the Les Paul one. And then when I got back, I had some days where your video was running and then I put my video up and I had a couple of days where I had more subs than you. And you're like, yeah, that that's not cool. <laughs> I, and actually, those are still my biggest sub days ever, you know, like 2000 subs a day. Um, but it was on the it was on the back of, you know, being on your channel. And, and Roman asked me the other day, like what one of my, my favorite videos and one of my favorite videos was one I made with you and Dave Honorado, where we didn't even know what we're going to do. And you're like, yeah, just just put the camera on. And then you, you look at the camera and you go, well, I've realized spending time with these guys that uh, my friends are music snobs. And <laughs> Completely true, which which is true, you know. Rock way bigger there. snobs than I am. I'm not a music snob. No, you're not. You are totally not. And it's it's amazing actually that that's not, that's true. So, like that. Um, Rick, just f. There's only 10, 10 of these beanies left. Ten beanies they're, left. They're Come on, people. Beanies, Put your beanies. A popular item here. That's it. Wow. I like that. There you go. Ten of them. Ten of them. I, you know, I, I'm going to be doing some more uh, posts, some shorts and things where I'm playing guitar again. I've kind of laid off it. And it's not because I haven't been practicing, because I've actually been practicing. But I I, um, I, just haven't sat down and turned on my amp and done it. I don't know why. I, I, you need uh, a break. Everybody needs a break once in a while. No, I just... Um, um, you're playing with the kids, playing with the kids. Yeah. Playing with the, the family band. Um, Apple Pitts said that, that I didn't read his super chats. Um, I didn't, I can't find his super chats, Mike. Does he have super chats here? Like way read, early. Get it, get, read me one of his super chats, Mike, if you can find it. it. I had scrolled back to try to find it. I got uh, it. I got it. You got I'd it. love to send nice. a song to you to have you do a solo on. Would you consider such stuff from a fan? If so, how to submit? Love you, bro. There. Oh, if you go to the starred Rick, and yep. then it'll bring up all the super chats. Oh, oh, see, see. oh, 
Oh, I don't even know how to use this program. This is the program I use all the time. Oh. Oh, there you go. Look, they're all there. Oh, my God. Look at that. I had no idea. All super chat all the time. Okay, there now you, you know. guys realize that I, I, I don't know if people realize hypes that I don't know anything about any of this stuff here. <laughs> they just think <laughs> they're getting I a do, sense. They're, they're, they're getting a sense. Uh, they're getting a sense. Yeah. Do some 80s and 90s keyboards, keyboardists. Send huh. so essential. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, uh, send me your, email me about that. Uh, whatever the, who was the guy again? I'll tell you. Um, Apple Apple Pitts. Apple. Apple Pitts. Well, I mean, he did the original Super Chat, or she did the original Super Chat at 714. You were just getting warmed up. Yeah, that's right when you came on. I, I came on at 714. It's my fault. I, dude. I'm, I got distracted because I saw you in the bullpen here. That's right. I was in the green room. I was thinking like, why are you so early on this? Because I was, you know, I was getting warmed up, getting my voice warmed up, ready to do a tune. You know, you, you, did you sing anything or no? <laughs> I saw you singing. I saw you playing guitar and shredding. <laughs> That's right. Back there, I figured yeah, not, that. not shredding. That wouldn't have been me. That was Mike. <laughs> no, I saw you sweep. You were sweep picking. You were oh, playing, yeah. You that's, some, that's some so game me. Game. That is, that is that's that's my style, but I try to keep it keep it on the down low. I don't know why you don't want to let people see you play do those super fast sweeps that you do hypes. Ah, uh, that's not who I am. It's just it's just <laughs> you know, <laughs> bust out the southern jumbo and 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 do a Jason Isbell tune. You know that's that's me. Jimmy Page in twenty twenty four, uh, Hollywood, um, uh, Hollywood. I can't read that. Um, so 2024, Jimmy Page in 2024. I don't know. Mike, Jimmy Page 2024. Who knows? Wait, you got you got to know somebody who knows somebody. Keep my fingers crossed there. I know I know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. Yeah. So, There's yeah. a guy that follows my channel. I think I told you the story. Who used to be a doctor in uh, London. Yeah. And uh, and Jimmy had an appointment, and so they cleared the schedule, and Page came in. And the doctor came out, you know, the checked in with the nurse and the doctor came out and he looked in the wet in the room and Jimmy Page is sitting there. He goes, oh, I, I cleared the schedule. I thought I thought somebody important like Eric was coming by and Page just grinned. He's like, nice. Thank you. <laughs> That's that pretty good. Story. Yeah, exactly. I thought Eric um, was somebody had a beer with Robert Plant and said he was a nice guy. Um, well, That's good to know. Yep. Uh, somebody says Tom Bukovac. I have a video that I've already done with Tom that I have, I'm not done editing yet. Oh, I thought you were keeping that close to the vest. I thought that was in the category. No, no, of... it's in the can, but okay. it's, it's in the can, but not on the, um, it's a complicated video because it's, um, it's, there's so many assets to it. There you go. And I have a new computer and I'm going to knock on wood here that, um, the computer seems to be working pretty well uh that at least right now that um and i don't know uh, probably because i have the nicer camera here my webcam looks does my webcam look really uh you look sharp today do i look sharp <sighs> yeah okay my and you see how mike is using a he's using a laptop aren't you mike yeah it's weird because the Apple cameras to me, I don't know, understand why their cameras are not sharp pipes. Why is that? I don't know why they don't spend money on it. We need an Apple explained video to tell us that. I mean, seriously, why aren't they as good as the, as the phone cameras? Crazy. You can why use your they... phone as an app, as a camera with your laptop. Okay. Yeah. So I just found that out yesterday. I yeah. was hanging out with my friend, Brian, and he, he uh, had a, I just got, I actually, I bought the stand that he has this Joby stand that I, I just got today. And he has it behind the um, behind his monitor. He has an Apple monitor. He has it. And I said, "How do you? How does that work?" He said, "You plug it into OBS, and you could have um, you could actually use it for streaming." But then, when he did it, it crashed a couple times. And I thought, <laughs> "Yeah, no, I'm out." Right? Exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's interesting because I'm thinking of going to Europe for a month uh, later in the spring, and I'm trying to think of this. I I'd like to do live streaming from there. Um, cause I could certainly write and re and research and do those things, but I'd want to do the lives when I'm there. Cause I do a weekly live stream and I was thinking, could I do it? Like my, my MacBook and my camera would be my phone. I was thinking I could do okay, that. So, so it crashed because he unplugged it when OBS. Oh, 
was in and and it crashed and yeah. so, so said, i'm gonna start i'll i'm gonna do some testing and do it from here yeah i would i would um i would i would uh i'm gonna try it out actually i'm gonna try it on a, maybe i'll try it on a stream a second channel or something yeah although this camera i have this opal camera is oh, that, is that the opal yeah it's opal oh that's like a 250 fifty dollar camera it looks really good i don't even think it was that much money no that's about what they are is that what they are yeah that's what they are my, I was, I was, whenever I have a, a guest on who hasn't done stuff, I always fall back to their camera. The software in your camera, I mean, in your phone, um, ends up saving you on lighting exposure, does all that stuff for you. Unlike you and I would like here, I have, uh, a DSLR on a, on a boom and then the mics on a boom. So that's my, I use an autofocus. I can tell cause it just went out of focus for a second. Yeah. I use an autofocus for this. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I, I like the soft, this room's not that big. So, and I want a soft background, so I have to have a pretty short, short depth of field. Huh. So, yeah. Um, okay. So flamethrower 82 said the synth suggestion was mine. Don't feel bad. I work in tech and it took me some time to get, understand live streaming on the back end. Why well, don't you ever use this, this program? The I use StreamYard once a year and it's for this. This night. Yeah. Um, will you do more classical, classical music related videos? Be great if the genre were explored more especially piano focus performances, performers. Okay. So a couple of my really big videos are piano focused, classical piano focused videos. Use your Wong video, which is at basically at 2 million. Martha Argridge, same thing, massive, very big videos. Um, yeah. And I hope to have one or both of them uh, interview them. Martha is going to be, um, she's born 1941. So she'd be, 83 this year in i believe her birthday is in august um still out playing concerts amazing <laughs> unbelievable but i have a, i have some some uh classical music topics that i um i, I have some pieces that i want to talk about but i'm not sure how to talk about them and then i have a video that i want to do about um uh, there's a book I'm reading on a classical pianist that I want to do a, um, that I want to make a video on who I, uh, somebody that I've brought up on the channel before and said, I was going to make a video of him, but I have to finish his autobiography. Hence the name of the channel, everything music. Right. Um, White Dog says listening to some 10,000 million years. Don't remember ever commenting on the late Robert Buck. Wasn't he from your neck of the woods? Happy new year. Um, You know, I don't know where 10,000 maniacs are from, but I think they're from the Northeast. Yeah. Aren't they from like Western New York? I think they might be. Is it, could they be, or maybe from Erie, Pennsylvania? Is that possible hypes? Come on, Mike. I'm looking it up guys. Look at it. Yeah. Up. Natalie Merchant. I think, yeah, I think so. I want to say, PA. I think where Mike, Stick Willie says Jamestown, New York. Jamestown. Well, that's pretty close to. That's Erie. like, yeah, that's kind of down southern. James, no, yeah. Fredonia area. Okay. Yeah. Maniacs are from New York. Did you get that, Mike? Are they from Jamestown? Jamestown. The Wikipedia, Jamestown. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So Jamestown, Erie. There's nothing in Jamestown. I've been Basically, no offense to Jamestown, but no offense to Jamestown. I went to college at Fredonia for one semester near yeah, Jamestown. I, I'm living outside of Syracuse. I can't really throw stones here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lucille Ball's hometown. Is that true? There you go. That's pretty funny. You know, it's from Western Pennsylvania too. Well, from Indiana, Pennsylvania, Jimmy Stewart. Indiana, Pennsylvania. Also Western Pennsylvania. The coal mines. Um, I only know that because my uh, my mom's family settled in Erie, in uh, Indiana, Pennsylvania, in the uh, when they came over in the early 1900s. There you go. Um, have I ever approached J John Frusciante for an interview or any other Chili Pepper? I have tried, but I I don't. Uh, I have had no luck. Um, uh, I would love to have Flea on or John or or Chad Smith. So, um, Jim Croce was from Norristown. Is that true? No, Jimmy Croce is from Pittsburgh, wasn't he? Oh, Western Pennsylvania, Norristown. Um, 
<laughs> People are correcting me about where I live. Thanks, guys. Thanks where a lot. Where do you live, Wipes? What's that? Uh, somebody said Onondaga Hill is Syracuse. I'm actually right on the, the and that's a that's a guy who lives near here. Okay. Yeah, he lives. He lives. I think he should talk. He lives all the way out in Manlius or something. So, um, so said, uh, let's see how Howlin Hog. Let's see here. There's so many play, great players in bluegrass genre. Love to see some interviews. Billy Strings would be a great start. Okay, so speaking of bluegrass, I have in the can my Bela Fleck interview, which will be out this week. It's way beyond bluegrass. How's that for uh, for a good start in my, in bluegrass? Yeah, another another just amazing guy. What a nice guy! Oh, unbelievable! Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hail, hail, Fredonia, Stephen. There we go. A little uh, Three Stooges reference there. Um, is it Three Stooges or is it uh, the Marx Brothers? That's not my thing. Um, I was watching Star Trek when that was on. Please interview Slash. Um, Ward will be on here in a second. Ipes. He texted me. Um, Lucille Ball was. Happy New Year. How familiar are you guys with Tragically Hip? Um, I'm familiar with them. I'm um, a music snob. I don't know. Let's see. Rick from... Poss possibly, possibly, uh, you're somebody's from Texas. Love your channel, Isley Brothers or Stanley Jordan. Uh, you know, I've actually met Stanley Jordan, um, Mark's brother, Stephen. Thank you. So I said, Mark, I said, I thought this is three stooges, and I was like, no, that's Mark, Mark's brothers. And he's he, he said, yes. Um, I've met Stanley Jordan actually. Um, funny story. So I did a Victor Wooten. Um, I've done it three times where I've taught at Victor Wooten's camp at Wooten Woods, which is west of uh, west of Nashville. Beautiful area. And uh, Stanley Jordan played there. And he was playing for a dinner for us, for all the people that were there. So, th so Victor... Everybody gets together for dinner and they have a, a stage there. And Stanley Jordan was the entertainment for when we ate. Wow. Okay. And and Victor wanted me to go up and play with him. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna go up and play with Stanley Jordan. So um it was fascinating to see him play guitar. But I saw Stanley play at the nines in Ithaca. Remember the nine types pizza? Totally. Place? Yeah. Apparently it closed recently, but uh, I saw yeah, it Stanley. They, they've been making noise about closing for years, actually. I saw him play in the in the early. I want to say when I was a student there, he, he used to play at the nines. He would come up, yeah, from New York or wherever he was living, and he would do uh, do shows. I was like, my God, have you seen this guy? People would be like, he plays with two hands on the guitar. It's unbelievable. I mean, obviously Van Halen right. had doing that, but I said, no, it's nothing like that. You have to go see. It. So. So I went and uh, and saw him. Oh, okay, so we have someone else here in the bullpen. I'm going to bring in here. Is that the last hat, Mike. Let's see here. Hold uh, on. Like I'm bringing in my brother John. Oh, John. I have to go like this. There we oh, go. There you go. There, there we go. go. What's going on? How are you guys doing? We, you jumped on, so you, we must have needed saving. <laughs> John said sure. that, he would, that he would jump on when I was when I was struggling. He would, he would come on. No, well, Keith is struggling. That's why I came on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Love you too, Sorry, John. <laughs> no, I was here for the free pedal giveaway that you're doing. Oh. Did I win? <laughs> Am I giving away a pedal? No, Keith is. No. No, oh. we, don't, we don't give away stuff. That is so much bread tape on here. <laughs> so much paperwork. Um, okay, so that's my brother, John. John six, not John five. No, John seven. John seven. Number seven. Yeah, number seven. And um, Mike, I'm going to put you back in the bullpen here for a minute. Good to see you, John. You too, Mike. Uh, John, is it cold there? 
Um, it's probably about 30 degrees outside. Oh my gosh. Same thing. We got Ward now. Ward's got his guitar out. I'm going to add Ward in here. Oh dear. Ward, you got the new SG. Yes. Oh, wow. Look, look at that. that. That's and amazing. You're dressed for the Moochies. I am dressed for the Moochies. I'm fresh from the Moochies. <laughs> How'd it go? It went well. Ward, I was talking about you playing the whole Beatles guitar medley by yourself when you were here. Yeah. I do all three parts. Not well. Very good. No, very well, Ward. I was I was extremely impressed. Okay. Thank you. Thank there you. you go. It's so show, Ward, just not. Ward, it works better if you plug it in, though. Okay, so I have to tell this story, Ward. About So Ward had this Kramer guitar. No, was it Kramer or was it? Oh, Jackson? no, it was uh, Jackson. Ward had a Jackson guitar. We were talking, and, and, um, and I said, well, if you break a string and you have a backup guitar, why don't you have something with humbuckers, like an SG? Because he was saying that he didn't like the Jackson. So, no, Ward? Not. Yeah, so... Um... I got the SG, it was an impulse, uh, not the SG, the, the Jackson last summer, impulse by, was we, I put together this new band. I'm like, we'll do some 80s stuff, right? So uh, I, I'm like, I want a Floyd Rose and I'm going to do dive bombs and, you know, so forth and so on. And um, so I actually rebuilt the Floyd Rose to the, you know, the, all of the little things that go in the, the, the string locking and, and, you know all of the hardware wow and uh yeah and then i never played it <laughs> <laughs> and when i did i never touched the whammy part right so i don't the scale length is you know you're like yeah <laughs> very, very, you know of course ward is exaggerating because he's six foot five i was so gonna say really, like, that would really bother like ward. This. he yeah. is yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just like it. it just didn't. I didn't love it. It had a cool look. It was a mirror finish, right? Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so it just didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, and Ward burst buckers, right, on both guitars on your SG and your Les Paul. Yes. Okay, sorry to interrupt, boys. Oh, I think. Hi, I'm Roland. Done. What's going on, Keith? Hello. I think I'm done now. Yeah. You're done. That's right. We we're, we're going out now. All right. Okay. You Ward, have a life have outside you? of this. Yeah, no, no. I, I'll have to bust on you about not you know, being on your show again this year. Again, I haven't been on the show, but I haven't. Yeah, had Ward, we're already talking about that, how you've never invited us on your channel, but that's I know, okay. Ward. I don't know, man. I don't okay. know what that's about. It's a done deal. I didn't know if that was the thing you guys were up for. Ward, I actually have a political political science degree, so. There, see? Oh, I, see? I'm a, I'm a natural All kinds of talent. I love it. All right. All right. Well, Hi, thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. Happy New Year. Bye. See you guys. Bye -bye. Take care. Um. Ward, how did it go tonight? It went well. Here, let me, let me, I, I don't have the mic, the right mic plugged in here. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Here, I'll put the SG back. I like it that Ward has shorts on. With like, a bomber jacket? Yeah, it's like, he's like uh, Angus. This isn't a bomber jacket, John. <laughs> I'm a fighter guy. <laughs> with, with a bow tie? Yeah, it's a uh, Fluxedo, flight jacket tuxedo. <laughs> That's pretty good, Ward. Oh, yeah. Ward. All right, can you hear me? Is it? Hold on. I'm going to have to go to my settings here. Make sure I'm up. Okay, so everyone knows how to use StreamYard better than I do, Ward. Keith, he uses it all the time. You use it all the time. Um, people are giving me a hard time. There's a, I missed a super chat. Somebody wanted to send me a song to play on or something. And... Um, um, Flexito wins the night. <laughs> wow. I like that. I should. Does my audio sound better now? Way better, actually. All right. Ward, yeah. I think we have the same. Is that a Yeti? It's the Yeti, yeah. The Yeti I blue. The same one. Yeah. It's pretty standard, you know, standard rig. Yeah. Unless um, I'm using the, uh, like we were talking about, the, uh, the road labs, right? That's the other one that I use. Yeah. But for StreamYard, I use this. Okay, so um, wait. Somebody said six foot five fighter pilot. What the heck, Ward? Is there any height? Um, he was a Rio, though. I was a Rio, right? So the yeah. back seat of the Tomcat is bigger than the front seat. Okay, the canopy comes down in the front. Yep. So plenty of room in the F fourteen, 
The other thing, so the, the, the answer to the question is, yes, I was eliminated from flying some airplanes. So the first thing that happens when you go to flight school is they measure you at the uh, Naval Aerospace Medical Institute. And they measure, you know, sitting height, hip to knee, all of these things to fit in these uh, airplanes. And generally the airplanes that were designed in the 60s were kind of for small guys, like Alan Shepard was like a, not a big guy. Okay. Those kind of guys. John Glenn was not a big guy. Um, and so F-8, um, some other A-4, uh, although I did fly the A-4 a bunch, but I didn't really fit in it. If I'd ever had to eject, I would have lost my legs, uh, you know, at the knee uh, for sure coming out of the airplane. Um, so, yeah, there were some airplanes I was not eligible to fly. Uh, the other airplanes I couldn't fly were, were airplanes where you had to eject through the canopy instead of the canopy coming off and then you eject. So on the F-14, when you pull the ejection handle, the canopy would come off and then the back seat would go and the front seat would go. So my head was kind of above the ejection handles a little bit, but that wasn't a problem because I wasn't going to be bursting through the canopy, breaking through the plexiglass on ejection. The canopy would come off. In the A-6, you go through the canopy and the like the Harrier and his other airplanes where you go through the canopy. Uh, and so that would be a problem if you're above. Wait, the you, okay. So, so when you get into these ward, uh, uh, are they, um, is it easy to get in being tall though? Is it, uh, get in and out of the airplane? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's tricky, right? It's like, getting into a Ferrari or whatever, or yeah. something with gull wing seats. Your gull -wing Is there room for a guitar in there? <laughs> no. There, we so, did so figure out how to take golf clubs without screaming fraud, waste, and abuse. We had okay, these little hide bags that look like a rifle case. Uh, somebody said that it has a friend with that's a C-130 pilot that's six foot six. What do you think, Ward? Is that? Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, C-130, there's no restrictions. That's a gigantic right. airplane. Gigantic. There's not an injection to the seat either. The the cockpit of a C-130 is big. So yeah, that, that would be fine. You could be a transport pilot all day as a six six person. Okay, so uh getting back to the Les Paul versus the SG ward, do you notice the um the the neck seeming to be further out when you play your SG? John, I'll ask you that too. Spatial uh you know, yeah, you're you're off by about two frets. Every time you go up the neck, it's all neck. So, yeah, and I know. Then, right. Of course, hitting it on a mic stand would be catastrophic versus a Les Paul could probably withstand that. Just saying, from experience. <laughs> so I haven't I haven't used it in the band setting yet, right? I mean, it's brand new. I just I just got it a couple of days ago, as you know, Rick. And and uh, the other thing we were talking about this morning was it's head heavy, right? So when you got it strapped on, if you let it go, it's going to go like that. Um, so that that's something that it takes some getting used to, although you seldom let it go when you're playing. Maybe when you're talking to the crowd between songs, uh, you know, you're gesturing or whatever, but you can't do that without the head falling. But I'm excited. I love, you can tell a real difference between the Les Paul and the SG in spite of the fact they have the same pickups. Yeah. Um, and have, uh, to have to wait. <laughs> well, there's that. Um, <laughs> yes. Which is noticeable. Um, but it's, you know, it's brighter. Um, it definitely has a bite uh, for, for some songs that, you know, I've just been messing around with on our set list here. Uh, it's got this, this, you can tell it's got an edge that's going to be desirable. Um, for certain parts of the set, you know, so I just, I look forward to exploring uh, the difference between the Les Paul and the, uh, and the SG. I also have a junior, you know, which is a completely different situation, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, I haven't quite figured out how to work that guitar yet. And then my, my fourth guitar is this Rickenbacker MG 620 which is that whole jangle, early REM, smithereens, uh, some Elvis Costello. We do uh, What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding. I use that guitar for that song. Um, and so, you know, completely different personalities for all four of these guitars now. 
Ward, will you bring all four of those guitars? To not to not to the smaller gigs, but to Mucha Palooza, the bigger gigs, yes. I just love the look of those all four on stage, you know. Um, and uh, But for we play some pretty small places here in Annapolis. Um, so generally I'll bring just one guitar, you know, but now I'll bring the both the humbucker guitars. So I you know, break a string or whatever. So I have a uh, this guitar which I've never played on my channel yet. I don't think maybe I did once. My um, this my white uh, SG here, uh, the Les Paul Custom, and this guitar is very neck heavy com uh, compared to uh, to my other SGs. No comparison. It's far heavier because it's got an ebony fingerboard on it, and obviously with the third pickup. But the um, and I one thing I noticed is that I put I put eights on it, and I feel like with a heavier guitar that uh, that I need heavier strings on that. The um, it's weird to play eights and not have that resistance and have a have a real heavy guitar without uh, without having that string resistance. I don't know. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and try. I'm gonna try tens on that guitar actually. Well, um, you got me to change from tens to nines. Yeah, I, I can't. I I don't think I can do eights. Yeah, it's it's um, eights work on some of my guitars. Uh, my my Pelham Blue SG, I have eights on, and it plays great. I mean, it's amazing. But some of my guitars, I have I have I I have nines on, and a couple of my guitars I have tens on. He's six foot five. He probably needs tens. No, I don't. I, I love you know? again Rick's episode about are you using the right strings? Convinced me to try nines. I mean, for a while with my my previous band in the when was this the mid aughts. I was using 11s, right? That was the thing. A lot of cording songs. Are you turned, a lot of tuned down, Ward, or no? No, no, okay. just All right. 440. Okay. But I was I was using 11s just because I wasn't doing any bending. And I was also the rhythm player. I had a great lead player in that band. Um, and I do some, you know, memorized lead fills. But he did all the heavy lifting in terms of the improvisation or the excursions we might do. Uh, so I, I thought that 11s were the way to go. And then slowly you walk it back down. And plus now the band I'm in now is a three piece. So I'm forced to do more lead work. Um, and, uh, you know, it's fun. I'm, I, I'm enjoying the challenge. It's forcing me to try to be a better guitarist, which, uh, you know, we all strive to be right. Ward, we were talking earlier about your, uh, uh Keith and I were talking about your 800. It's, uh, the cabinet is two twelves, correct? Yes. Yeah. Two, are they, two, at, are they spaced like this or are they yeah. offset? No, they're, they're right over one. One on top of the other. Okay. Yeah. Um, the Celestians, I don't know which model. It G it's not G Greenbacks. Well. Yeah. Something that's voiced for this cabinet. Um, I love this amp. Um, and I was thinking about getting the Jubilee version of this same series, uh, which I've heard good things about. I don't want the Plexi version of this, uh, I, but I love this amp. This is a set it and forget it amp for what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I've got it, you know, everything on seven and then my effects pedals are pretty, it's a pretty simple rig. I I'm, I'm looking forward to Tim being on the show because every pedal I've brought bought on this board is because of him. Ah, right. What do you, what do you got on there, Warden? Well, uh, so I, I did have this halo pedal that Tim convinced me to buy. Okay. Right. I um, remember when he had that on there. Yeah. And so now I'm back to, let me now i'm back to this hall of fame two okay reverb got slash delay got that yeah right is 90 yeah and and so we got the the yeah standard phase 90 this boost pedal is just for when i need that push over the cliff right and what is that pedal ward i can't tell it's a a joyo boost pedal roll boost so it's just it's not a distortion pedal it's just uh just it, just gain yeah gain yeah. yeah and then this one's a pretty well-known pedal this this uh uh angry drive half jhs half boss pedal yep and i just use the uh um the what, what setting am I? I use the boss setting i don't use or, the, J, the jss what? is too sharp too bright for me i've never actually tried that pedal 
it's cool. And I just need one thing from each one of these things. Yeah. Right. So especially with how I have the Marshall set up. So rhythm crunch, I just step on this one. And then for the lead, I'll step on this. And then if I want a little wetness, I'll add this. But if you do that too much, it starts to get really muddy. So um, I do this sparingly. Is that a phase 90 at the end though? Yeah, yeah. it's a phase 90. Why is that yeah. not at the other end? I don't Over I don't here? Yeah. Before distortion. Huh? Before distortion. I don't know. I just I don't, I, I don't know I don't, either. I use it with um with the crunch, you know, and so I like to have a little bit of of edge to it, you know, with what we're doing. Like when we're doing um for instance, we cover Lagrange, you know, and there's this one like sleepy excursion where the lead guitarist is going off and I do this descending chord riff. And it sounds cool to have the phaser working for that part. Um, and what else? I don't use this a whole lot, really. I used to use it more. Um, and I'm using it less and less now. So, and then obviously a tuner. This is a cool tuner. Which tuner is that? It's the Boss uh, Chromatic Tuner, the the Wazacraft. Oh, uh, interesting. How is that? How is that different? Well, I don't know. It's just it's accurate. I'll tell you that. John, do you know <laughs> about that? The Wazacraft. Do you know about those or not? I think it's the same thing. It just costs more. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Right? I, bought it. I mean, it, it, how could I walk it be any better? I'm like, what is the most expensive tuner than, you have? than the Boss <laughs> Tuner? I mean, I have the Boss Tuner, the TU three or whatever it is. I. I you got to pay mean, more, John. What, what are you doing? <laughs> Just support the business. There's hardworking folks trying to make a living building. Oh, my, God. oh my gosh. I, I, know. This is a first for me. Um, yeah. Or John's learning something here. This is good. Yeah, I like it. Um, I, You know, I, I, I kind of go between my boss tuner and my um, TC electronics tuner. I have the TC clip-on, is it? The Yeah. The polyphonic. Yep. Um, but I always take it off because you can't have a tuner on the no. headstock. That would. You know, I was very militant about that at the beginning of my channel. Where well, I that's was, not a good look. That's that's an amateur look. It is an amateur look, but I I gave up on it because a lot of my favorite guitar players play it and everything, and and even though it's, I always thought it was illegal to do. Illegal. You know. It's kind of harsh. It's just a. You know, kind of a, a bad look. It's like wearing Birkenstock with socks when you're when you're playing grunge. Yeah, but if you're an old Italian guy cutting the grass, <laughs> it probably looks fine. <laughs> there you go. Or that, was, that, was for, or that was for you, you know. These aren't Birkenstocks. These are these UFOs things. I didn't even know. Well, what's the difference? I thought they were, on? Ward. I'm sorry. I was trying to, you All know. Right. No, so who's, clearly, the, who's the football player who broke his leg really bad and uh, he wears Joe Montana? Hands. No, not Joe Montana. <laughs> Smith. He did, he did break his leg pretty bad, though. Yeah, Smith. No, he, oh no, that was Joe Theismann. Joe yeah, Theismann. No, no, yeah, not, yeah. When, not, when Lawrence Taylor jumped ago, on his back not and it went. Ago, this was more recently. He was, he was quarterback for the Redskins. Smith, but he wears these. Um, they're really comfortable. The Commanders. Huh? The Commanders. The Commanders. Well, I think this is back when they were still the Redskins. Hey, Ward, if you're, but, 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 but Ward, if you're yeah, out playing too. Nirvana covers, right, you're not going to yeah. wear those. No. <laughs> no. I got my I got my grunge thing going on. I, I'm dressed appropriately for what we're playing. Nice. Yes. All right, yeah. Ward, I want to I wanna show you something here. Okay. I'm clearly at a uh, New Year's Eve hockey party right now, and I was asked to bring over a few albums – um, because the host has a really great turntable. So I brought over five albums. I'm going to show them to you, and then I'm going to get off the channel here. But I want you to, like, give a comment, okay? Okay. And, and Rick, you can do that too, okay? okay? So here's the first one I brought. I can't see it. Let's see. I'm putting it in. Hang on. Credence. I can't see which one it is. Okay. Greens live okay. at Woodstock. Okay. All right. Here's a second one. Yeah. Love it. K. 
Okay. Great one. Okay. Yeah. Can't yeah. miss. Can't miss with that either. That's Rick's boy. Does that have uh, murder okay. numbers on it? No, right? It does not. No, 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 that's, no. that's earlier than that. Yeah. Oh, Joe Pass, JJ Johnson. I know that one. That's that would probably one thing you would not know. That's a very obscure Joe Pass record, but our dad listened to that people, yeah. in his last days of his life, I have to say. He did. All right, here's the last one. You ready? I'm ready. Oh my god. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Right the party will life. never die with that on. No. That's right. Yeah. So Ward, I want to be on your channel one day. I'm I'm still hoping. So I, okay. I, I keep practicing we'll every day and, and reading the uh the the proper uh uh political literature. Uh, yeah, literature. So um well we'll do happy, it. I look happy to New it. Year, guys, and uh Brother, you're doing great work there. Thanks, I mean, John. When you, when you when you have Andy Summers and Steve Morris in like the same week, I mean, come on. Like no, Steve Morris, I got to just say, first of all, one of the most elegant, cool, intelligent gentlemen, but sonically, rhythmically, and the chicken picking, he's got it all going on still. So unbelievable. I, I loved it. Uh, I won't say he's underrated, but you know he's, un he's a friend. Though. He's a friend but, of Ward's, you know, John. Well, then that shows the quality of person that he is. Well, we've known each other for a long time. Yeah, he, that was an amazing interview. I hope people watch that. So, yeah. All right, guys. All right, happy All right, New John. Year. Happy New Year. All right, see you, see John. You. All right. Bye. Bye. Whoops. Where's where? Where? Uh, hold on. <laughs> what I just click on Ward? I don't know. You got to put click the two of us. You're on solo. Oh yeah, here we go. The two of there us. There you go. Ward, there we go. Yeah, I like it. No, so I mean said, we're talking about Steve Morris. Um, that episode was a triumph, and I love how well it's doing, and I love the comments. People are coming out of the woodwork to give Steve the props that have always been there. Yes. Um, but most recently, as you and I have discussed, he was dissed along with other guys in that Rolling Stone top 250 list. And it seems like he's just sort of left out of some of these, you know, top of mind uh, influential guitarist lineups to a degree that I think is uh, is is criminal. Profane. Criminal. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I was pinging you for a long time that we needed to get him on the channel. Um, and it, you know, it happened and in your hands, he, he gets his, his due, you know, and, and that's what I love about how this all came together, not to mention, and I've loved how people have commented about how you chose to start that episode, uh, which was, uh, unique in, in terms of it, you know, just opens up with him playing, uh, that Baroque piece, Highland, whatever it's called. And Highland Air, I think it yeah. was. Yeah. And uh, it fully demonstrates, you know, his light touch and then his attack. And in, in a few minutes, you're you're immersed yes. in his artistry. And then you get to know what a cool guy he is, how thoughtful he is. Oh. So I I met him and we'll tell the folks, you know, because they haven't heard the story. Uh, so I'm Dregs fan, long time uh, Academy classmate of mine named Dave Bell introduced me to the Dregs our freshman year, our plebe year. Um, and I got what if, and then the other albums around that, uh, you know, and, and was just, I would listen to it just, you know, flip it over. I used to study to it. And then I had a chance to see the dregs the summer of 81 at the Bayou in Georgetown, which is, you know, striking distance from Annapolis. And that was the, what album had cruise control on it? Um, was it Un Unsung Heroes album um, was what they were touring in support of on, on, on that one. And so the bio was a weird, if you were too close to the stage, you couldn't see the back of the stage. So I, I could see Steve and Andy West. And I don't know if T. Lavis was playing keys then, but I couldn't, I, see, so. I couldn't see Rod Morgenstern. I could only see the symbols moving. I couldn't right. see him. Yeah. Right. Which is, which is a, a problem because he's it's really fun to watch him play he, he's having a blast and so i've seen him dozens of times subsequent to that 
But um, so that was 81. Fast forward, 1986. So I'm aboard the USS John F. Kennedy, the conventionally powered John F. Kennedy, because they're making a nuclear powered one called the John F. Kennedy, but the old John F. Kennedy CV-67. I'm in my first fighter squadron on my second deployment, VF-32. And so we're off the coast of Crete. We're south of Crete in the Mediterranean, and we're standing what's called the Alert 7. So I'm in an airplane on the flight deck, ready to launch with seven minutes notice. And by, you know, at seven minutes, you've got to be airborne. So you have all this stuff hooked up and you're ready to go. And it's sort of a high attention kind of thing. And a USO show was aboard the ship. And they included Kansas and Tom Johnson, the Doobies, and the lead singer of Pablo Cruz and some other odds and ends. And they were called the first airborne rock and roll division. There was actually a, a, a thing created by Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick, who I also got to know later, um, and Stephen Stills. But this version of it, some years after they did the first version, had different guys in it. And so I was hearing the, the show start, and I was like, damn it, I'm missing it. And I had arranged with another Rio who didn't care about music, a guy named Boo Boo Kingsley. And so he came up and relieved me early so I could go down to the show. Okay. The show is taking place in the hangar bay of the aircraft carrier, which is some decks below the flight deck. So I rage down to the paraloft, take my flight gear off. Now I'm just in a flight suit. And I go to the side of the hangar bay and I flip one of these hatches to go in to the hangar bay. I can hear the shows going on. I'm not sure where that it's set up. So I open this hatch and I'm backstage. <laughs> Lord. And I literally walk through the hatch and there's Steve Morse playing music man. Number one. Right. Warming up, warming up. Always has it. Always playing. Always playing. And so the Pablo Cruz slash Tom Johnson band was playing. They were kind of the warm up and, the headliners were Kansas. And so I'm like, Steve, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm in Kansas. I'm like, that's fantastic. I'm a huge Drake's fan. Um, I said, hey, after the show, and we're kind of talking loud because the rock and roll is going on. I go, after the show, I'll meet you here. Let's go up to the ready room and we'll talk. We'll, we'll talk. He goes, great. So we did that. And he went up to the ready room and I put on a cassette. That was the format we had in the ready room for our music of the dregs. I had made this greatest hits dregs cassette for the deployment. And I broke out my beater Yamaha guitar. <laughs> I mean, it was, this thing had, you know, huge, the intonation was like this big and, <laughs> and I handed it to him. I'm like, Hey, can you play little kids? Which is this cool Baroque song off of what if, and he just cranked it out. He just started playing it, you know? No problem, right? No even problem. With high, even no with problem. the high action. Well, first he had to tune the guitar. He's like, this thing's out of tune. I'm like, I apologize, right? Um, and and he just played it. And everybody's just sitting around, even guys who had no idea who he was. Right. Because they're, you know, you get a group of fighter pilots together. It's like, okay, who who's impressed by anybody else, right? You know, like certainly not a long-haired rock and roller. And And so they were just like, oh, my God, this guy's really good. I'm like, well, you hear that band that's on the, the cassette deck? That's his band, you know? And so we just started chatting and we were talking aviation because he's a pilot, as you pointed out in the episode. Yep. And, uh, you know, he was asking the fighter guys about landing techniques for flying the ball on the aircraft carrier, or how you land on the boat, comparing it to the techniques that he would use with his stunt plane to fly around his own personal field. And, and, and he was just loving it. Uh, and we, I was loving having my guitar idol, you know, right here in this very weird environment off the coast of Crete on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> so we're like, Hey, let's keep in touch. And, uh, he, he finished the tour. He went all over the world with this UF, USO show. Okay. So fast forward now it's 2001. I'm teaching at the Naval Academy. 9-11 has just happened. And, the drags are playing Ram's Head, which is a club here in, in Annapolis. It's only uh, 
it's very close to where I live now, but it was also close to where I was living at the time. I was still in the Navy, living on the Naval Academy grounds. It was my last tour on active duty teaching at the Naval Academy, which is my alma mater, and saw that they were coming in. So I don't even know, because this is kind of semi-pre-internet, how I got in touch with him, but he called me back, my office phone at my office there in Loose Hall, and he's like, you want to come to the show? I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. And so um, had I was literally, my feet were against his monitor because this is a very small venue, um, a very intimate venue. And when you hear, when I hear the dregs play, just like when I hear Steve Morse band play, but more so with the dregs, it's like religion for me, right? This is the soundtrack of my young life. Uh, uh, you know, when they're playing all of the, the early stuff um, and, you know, when he's doing his thing and you see how he loves it, just like the expression on the show. Yeah. Where you see him. He's it's, he's happy sometimes. And then he's, he's feeling it and he's working hard and you know, all of that stuff. It's just so infectious, you know, and then you watch the rest of the guys in the band, all virtuosos. Um, and that's why I loved hearing him talk about charts and, you know, breaking down the construction of particularly the dregs, um, not to mention his early influences there at the University of Miami. So um, that was 01. And again, we're like, okay, we'll keep in touch. Two years later, I'm working now my first day job out of the Navy. I worked for the, the V-22 program. V-22 is an airplane that the actually currently grounded because it's having problems, but um, half helicopter, half prop plane that the Marine Corps and the Air Force use uh, for a, a variety of reasons. So it has two prime contractors, Bell, famous for making the Huey, and wow. Boeing, that has made the Phantom and all kinds of other, the Hornet, Super Hornet. And it's a that Boeing is like a, a big company, and Bell was kind of a sleepy little Fort Worth company um, that was known for making helicopters. And so the Boeing people come to me, and they're like, we want to make a promotional video for the centennial of flight. So it's the 100th anniversary of flight. We're going to go down to Kitty Hawk. We're going to take an Osprey down there. And they want to have a promotional video that will be played on Jumbotron. I'm like, what's your budget for this? Like, oh, <laughs> not a problem. Whatever you got. I go, because I, I got a friend who could do the soundtrack. Um, it would be pretty cool to have him associated with this. They're like, yeah, go for it. Whatever you need. And so I coordinated with Steve, what the price point was going to be and made sure he wasn't touring with purple. Cause that was his, you know, he was doing a lot of deep purple touring and he was, he was around. And then we talked on the phone and I gave him an idea of what this video was about. And I gave him some of the, you know, airplane coming in in a hover and then it goes into airplane mode and it goes over a building and these seals are fast roping out of it. And then it's on a ship and, and a sunset and you could just hear the wheels turning on the other end of the phone. And so I went down to his, his house uh, down south. And um, by the time I got there, he'd kind of figured it out. And he got Dave LaRue to, to do the bass parts. And so imagine sitting at the elbow of Steve Morris for two days as he's constructing this song in his studio, which doubles as the hangar for his airplanes. Um, and so what a blast. I mean, what a, what a gift. And I slept, you know, in the studio that he has a, a bed there and, um, you know, and ate with the, he and Janine in the, in the main house. And he's got a grass strip out there for his airplanes. And it was what, what a cool bucket list. Uh, you know, so the first time I saw him at the bio, it's like, I never imagined that some years later, 20 years later, I'd, I'd be, you know, at his house watching him play. So the song is called flight of the Osprey. It's on one of his albums um later um if you if you go up spotify and, and type in fly of the osprey you can you can hear it it starts very baroque you know yeah. that, that nylon string guitar and yeah. then it goes into a a crunchy riff and then the soaring leads and then there's like a breakdown for when the seals are coming out and it just captures all the different flight regimes and so this video came out great and boeing was happy as hell with the result he insisted that he retain the copyright though which at the time is like why does that matter but 
obviously he knows these things, right? He's learned by burning, yeah. Uh, you know, at the hands of Capricorn Records and other places along the way. Yes. Uh, so, you know, every time the dregs are in town, and in town means either Annapolis or DC, or the Steve Morse Band. I just saw the Steve Morse Band a couple of months ago in Alexandria at the Birchmere. You know, I go to see them and we have we spend some time together. Sometimes we're able to do dinner together. Other times it's just backstage before or after the show. Um, but it's always so special um, to catch up with him. And, and now to, to see him growing old and obviously I'm growing, growing older and and so forth and so on. And, and uh, he's just as you see in your episode, it's demonstrated very uh, smartly just how cool he is how thoughtful he is how much he loves music the craft um and i love what he said about how he could do the deep purple gig because he's a fan yes right? and come at like being a fan it wasn't about him yeah you know, he bears the scars of not being richie blackmore and he he does that sort of with that's, wide eyes i mean yeah. that is that's a tough uh you know that's that's that that must have been a tough well you could the way he answered your question explains how tough it was. Yeah. I mean, he leads with the fact that, you know, there were the haters. Yeah. You know, and he'd just do his thing and he'd honor Richie while showing his little interpretation of him. I mean, they had a part of the set where he was, the other guys would go off and, you know, and he'd whatever. Do his own solo thing. Yeah. And he'd, he'd yeah. do it. He'd go off. And the, you the think that that would, it. you think that that would, uh, uh, you know, bring in the, the fans. Hold on. Hold on. I'm bringing in a, uh, uh, bringing a new, uh, who is this guy? Nobody. Kid. What's up, y'all? What's up, Brett? What's happening? Nothing. We're talking about Steve Morse. Yeah, I was enjoying the conversation, and then all of a sudden, I'm I'm here. So yeah. don't, don't mind me, please. Continue. Wait, uh, board. We have to actually tell people because there's people in the chat that don't know you. Okay, so there's some people that don't know you. Ward is a YouTuber. More tell, just, tell, just tell everybody about about your channel because I am now people, a YouTuber. People think, people think that you're a uh, that you're a musician. Your music YouTube channel because you know so much about music. Yeah, I'm definitely not a music YouTube channel. Every time I do a music episode, it bombs. But uh, <laughs> I, I I do that just to indulge myself. Um, and uh, so yeah, those episodes do about twelve thousand views, right? <laughs> um, you know, here's my band playing. Uh, so I, yeah, I have a YouTube channel now because of Rick's encouragement back in 2018 timeframe. Yeah. So it's really yeah. Rhett, Rhett's fault. In yeah. So yeah. it starts with Rhett. Yeah. We're like the Seattle scene where everybody, everything starts with green river, right? Then you go over here to, you know, these guys and then over here to Pearl Jam and mother love bone. So that's, that's how this goes. Uh, so yeah, we were sitting down as Rick had just finished touring the PRS factory and he came over to Annapolis and we're sitting at one of my favorite watering holes, McGarvey's a legendary bar in at city dock in Annapolis. And, and we're just chatting about everything and we're finishing each other's sentences, you know, twin brothers of different mothers kind of a thing. And Rick's like, why do you do so much Twitter? Why don't you do YouTube? And at the time I had sort of this identity, you know, on Twitter, this airsatz political thing. And I was hanging with all the cool kids um, you know, and, and that had some, you know, it, it was flattering, but it definitely wasn't moving any needles, you know? Um, so Rick's like, you should start a YouTube channel. I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, do you have a phone? I'm like, in fact, I do. He goes, talk into the phone. That's it. Right. And, and so I'm like, what do I talk about? And so the first idea was talk about whatever you're doing on Twitter that day. Right. So that was very, let's just call it eclectic. You know, it's like Ward hacker guitarist, Ward novelist, Ward uh, guy who went to the Naval Academy and dealt with a cheating scandal, Ward uh, military expert, Ward Tomcat backseater <laughs> who knows some things about the F-14. Right. And so I did episodes about gerrymandering. I predicted the insurrection on my channel or whatever we're calling it these days, right? So that thing that happened on January 6th, um, because I saw what the, how Pence was getting sort of boxed in and and how Cruz was sort of teeing it up. And I did just episodes, very unbiased episodes about the interpretations of the Constitution and, and the Electoral College and all this sort of stuff. 
nobody gave a shit about my two cents on any of this. Right? <laughs> I had like 40 views per episode. I had eight subscribers. <laughs> right. So I do this one called The Truth About the F-14 and Goose's Death. And I'm talking about flat spins. I'm using this model right here. I'm just holding it. There's no post-production. It's just me extemporaneously rambling about that's that's a real youtube right there yeah, right and and yeah. so i post it among these other mix of things and uh it sits there for four months with literally 100 views and then mid april of 2021 2021 it had 95,000 views in a single day and so i call rick i'm like wtf bro He's like, I told you this would happen. This is because I was I was that guy like nobody cares about me, dad. And, you know, and you're like, no, son, just go up there to the plate. And if you get hit by the ball, it's fine. Go back up. And it's like, you know, bad news bears, you know, and he's like, no, keep at it. And so he was right in that the algorithm, not human beings, the algorithm found me due to a confluence of Top Gun Maverick trailers Mm -hmm. This this gaming system called DCS, which is digital digital combat simulator, and other interests in the F-14, sort of triangulated on me in that episode, and boom! All of a sudden, I'm a subject matter expert. So I'm like Rick, what do I do? He's like, unlist everything that isn't aviation. Like get rid of all your political stuff, right? And now you have an aviation channel. The audience gets a vote. He said, is that all right? I'm like, in fact, that's a huge relief because I got all these stories in me. This is the best part of my profile, the most credible part. And so I just started creating episodes around primarily the F-14. And then as we all know, if you're going to have a horizon, it needs to be inventory, right? So as I'm running out of F-14 stories of my own, I'm like, I wonder if my friends would come on and talk about their F-14 stories. And it turns out they would. And so former Tomcat guys that are now astronauts like Scott Kelly or Reb Edwards or guys who had something crazy happen or guys who shot down a MiG or guys who were at Top Gun, they were all coming on the channel. So this extended my, my inventory. And then after that, it's like, okay, what if I talk about history? Military history, aviation history, would that be okay? Would, would the audience tolerate that? You know, or would they crush me like a buck? And I did an episode about Robin Olds, the legendary Air Force ace in World great. War II and Vietnam, great guy. And that one did really well. And so it's like, okay, people are, uh, you know, okay with me doing history. They're okay with me doing, obviously, Tomcat stuff, air, aircraft carrier stuff. And then the last piece of the formula and this is what I'm trading on these days. In fact, today uh, I have an episode that's a scream machine um, may hit a million. It's already through 650. Um, and and so current events. I watched it when I had 85,000 this morning, Ward. It's at yeah. 650 now. God. It's at, yeah. Um, so <laughs> let's take a look. Um, Rhett, his, his Ward sent me his his graph. And, and it, it, I've never seen him go straight up. Uh oh, has the second bump. Oh, yeah, man. this is the nighttime bump, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, this started with the war in Ukraine. You know, me covering current events. Um, and so, oh, and also, Rick and I talk on a near daily basis, and we're brainstorming. He's like, "Hey, how about UFOs?" I'm like, really? That's not really my lane, you know. And I did this one about that Tic Tac, the F-18s, the Super Hornets. Uh, and their their forward looking infrared footage with those you know things. The sixty minutes covered it, and you know it's like what is that? And so I did a, my interpretation of what I thought it was, and that one started slow, right? And, and this again, as all three of us know, we can obsess about the back end metrics, mm -hmm. you know. And YouTube gives you very granular metrics, and you can sit there and watch your little rocket like not come off the launch pad or <laughs> start to go to the moon, and then like oh no. We're going to go fall back in the atmosphere. And yeah. Go. Yeah. Or sometimes it, you know, it's just like it goes. And I, I, I hope the audience appreciates how hard it is to do a million views. Uh huh. That that's like winning the masters. Yep. You know? Um, so I'll have a bunch that'll go like, and I'll, I'll text Rick. I got a, a screen machine and then uh, not so much. <laughs> you know? 
It's like, yeah, <laughs> not so much, you know. And so it's fickle, it's capricious, and it's there's it's not up to us, right? Um, and if you if you obsess too much, you get in this nose low spiral where you're like white knuckling <laughs> the next episode. Brad, these right? are great analogies, right? So on brand, Ward. Oh my yeah. god. No, no, but it's like if if you start believing the hype, you know, this is the tyranny of success, right? And so the analogy I use is it's like trying to be a golf pro. And I have a bunch of friends, including a guy who's won a PGA Tour event, um, who went on to lose their cards and struggle and so forth and so on. So current success is no guarantee of future career progression. You know, and, and so that's the life we live as YouTubers. So at some level, you have to kind of not care while you care, because if you care, the audience can see it in your eyes yep. that you're trying too hard yep. and you're trying to synthesize a success and you're reverse engineering something that happened before and it's derivative and it's not original and all that sort of thing. So. I have had this YouTube channel. In fact, about now is my three-year anniversary, right? I mean, I started yeah, about right. Christmas time in 2020. Yeah. Um, became a YouTube partner in June of 2021 and quit my day job about a year after that, a year and a half after that. Um, and, and hit five over 500,000 subscribers now, which is a massive, yeah. very Love few it. people. And if you had told me three years ago that I'd have that milestone, I wouldn't have believed it. Not yeah. to mention that I would be able to walk away from, from my job, you know, and as we know, I've never worked harder. There's not a harder job on the planet, but there's not an, a, a job for the right person that's more rewarding. And it's a very unique breed that can succeed at doing this. Um, and I think Rick recognized that in me, just like he recognized that in Rhett and, and Rhett recognized that in Rick and so forth and so on. Right. And, and so, um, we know intimately what I'm what I'm talking about here. The intangibles of what I'm talking about here, and so um, it turns out that my horizon, because I've diversified, is really unlimited now, mm. right? So I can do a history of Billy Mitchell or that World War II air battle, and then I can cover how the Houthis just got their asses handed to them by U.S. Navy H-60 helicopters, mm. you know, or the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. Um, so I, I can draw on any of those and I can just celebrate a particular airplane, do a tribute to the F4 Phantom or the P51 and just keep diversifying and always keep my toes tapping. Now, not every one of those is going to break the internet, you know, and I'm, I'm cool with that. But or you have broken the internet to have, you've had multiple million view videos, million views in a day, which is. I mean, it's one thing to have a million view video over time. It's yeah. another thing to have a million view video in a day. And and Ward holds the record for, um, I've never had a subscriber day as big as Ward's. You've had 11,000? 11,000. 11, uh, that was the day that I posted that uh, aircraft carrier episode about the USS Ford moving from the Adriatic to the Eastern Met yeah, in the wake record. of October 7th. Right? So it's, it's a pretty basic explainer. Right. It's like, here's what an air wing is. Here's what the Ford is. Um, I had some sound bites because I'd interviewed the commander of the Naval Air Forces Atlantic at the air show a couple of months ago. Um, so I have some cool, you know, sort of sidebar things that I can add in there for color commentary. Um, and uh, it's my space. I can talk about air wings and I can talk about the difference between the Super Hornet and the Growler. And I can talk about who the air wing commander is and who the strike group commander is, because I know most of these guys, right? Um, and so seven minutes, 1.2 million views in 24 hours. You what know? I really appreciate about your channel, the award, is like you do a great job of breaking down the realities of, of how this stuff works in a non-Hollywood sort of dressed up, gussied up kind of way. Um, and and it, it makes sense. It's it's really interesting and entertaining to watch. And and I I love seeing you talk about everything from current events to the U, UFO stuff to what it was like being a Rio and an F fourteen. I mean, it's it's rad. You know, my dad went to military college, and and um, you know, a lot of his classmates are you know went on to be probably some of your contemporaries actually. So it's like I've grown up knowing some of these guys, but 
never like close enough to actually talk to them about this stuff. So you kind of have become my, uh, and I think for many people, the, the translator for what all this stuff means, you know, when strike groups are moving around and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, what's cool about this platform is we all have a niche. We all operate in a niche, but you can reach an incredibly wide audience, even in a somewhat seemingly narrow niche. Yeah, uh, Rick told me this was possible, right? And and until you see it, um, you know the the magnitude. Uh, you know, I get stopped. I mean, we we're flying back from Florida, and this guy leans over as we're boarding the airplane. He's like, "I love the channel," which makes my wife it drives her crazy when that happens. <laughs> we were in an I ice do. cream store down in Ocala, not Ocala, in Vieira, Florida. Uh, at night, we made an ice cream run. We're down there visiting my dad. My brother and I are there, and this guy's at the registry. He goes, "This is kind of a weird question, but are you Ward? You know, in the middle of nowhere." And my brother's like, "WTF?" You know, <laughs> ran home and told my dad. So you know that kind of impact. I mean, I'm I'm here for it, right? I'm ready to be, uh, you know, the kid or whatever. Um, and uh, it, it's rare. And like I did on tonight's live stream, when you look at the year. In, in review and some of what I was able to do in terms of um, charity work, in terms of solving problems uh, for different groups that have reached out to me. One is to get these Afghan pilots out of Islamabad back to the United States. Um, my involvement raised them $40,000 and pushed them over the edge in order to fund their repatriation or patriation to the United States. It's going to happen in a few months here. Um, there, I had this female medic American who's helping the Ukrainian military on live from Kiev. Uh, amazing uh, woman who just wasn't happy sitting at home in Texas and went over there and, and is seriously on the front lines mm. um, doing that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's just this not to mention like former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mullen, and former vice chairman, uh, Admiral Winnefeld, and all these guys. Heater Heatley, who was the uh, guy who uh, was the uh, inspiration behind the original Top Gun. Um, that's I'm super proud of that, that episode. And also he's suffering from cancer, so I don't know how long he's going to be with us. Um, so it's sort of like his tribute. You know, and 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 it was it, this one turned out beautiful. We did it outdoors in 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 it was a warm fall day a couple of months ago, in front of this F-14 that's there on the Naval Academy grounds. Um, and uh, I entreat the viewers to to check out that that it's called the Real Maverick, is the name of the episode. And Heater is this eclectic guy, uh, very credible as a fighter pilot, but also he's an artist like we are, and uh, he's a photojournalist. And he took a picture that was in a magazine that was on the coffee table at the dentist office when Jerry Bruckheimer was getting his teeth worked on. And he handed that magazine to his partner, Don Simpson, who's passed away, and said, that's our next movie. And they got Heater involved. And he's in the movie a bunch. And I point this out, what the different scenes that he's in. Uh, so, you know, he's not going to tell the story to just anybody. You know, so that these guys come to me or if I ask them, hey, Admiral Mullen, can, can I have you on the channel? And they say, yes, that's heady stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And well, so this enterprise I'm very proud of and, and I, I don't trade on it lightly. So, so, Rhett, you're, you know, in our own spaces, we come across people like this that uh, that that are. um whether you're interviewing people or um, uh, the things that wouldn't be possible that YouTube is really the only platform for, yeah. there is nothing. Uh, Rhett, did you think that though, when you started doing this, do it, cause you were always a student of YouTube. You watch YouTube way before I got on YouTube that you were a, one of the few people that I knew that actually consumed the content. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think is, at least from your perspective, is um, has changed or just things, you know, that more niches have developed? I mean, yeah, lots of has has changed. I mean, I've been watching YouTube. 
YouTube is my primary source of media consumption and has been since probably 2010, I'd say. Um, and so I've seen a lot of stuff come and go. And we we were talking about this the other day that YouTube has eras, right? Like when you started, you started in sort of what was the vlogging era, which was like 2015 to 2019, really, like the Casey Neistats and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we we just came out of the sensational era, you know, the, I, I think Mr. we beast era. Yeah. Mr. Beast era. And that's not to say that channels like Mr. Beast are, are done. Obviously that's not the case, but it, there seems to be, I think right now we're kind of in between uh, two eras on this platform where, you know, there's not one type of content that's really dominating the, the platform as a whole. Um, but yeah, I mean, lots of lots has changed. I think one of the biggest things that's changed for, for me is that YouTube now has become part of the zeitgeist where it's like when you ask kids and I, I heard this anecdotally somewhere that uh, supposedly um, and take this with a grain of salt. I can't remember where I saw this, but it's like, you know, kids that were polled, I think it was like fifth graders said that, you know, the majority of them, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's like, well, YouTubers. And even when you started doing this in 2016, that wasn't the case. You know, I think there was still an element of, oh, what is that? You do YouTube, you make videos for what is this thing? YouTube. But now it's become much more prevalent, just at, at least in, you know, the Western world as a, you know, a place where people go to learn. It's, yeah, a, it's, a, it's a legitimate, it's a, it's a legitimate occupation. I was, I was being interviewed yesterday by, a, a, for a podcast and, and I told the, the, uh, the host that when I was, uh, when I first started my channel for the first two years, I was on the school board at, at Dylan and Lennon school. And when parents would ask me what I do for a living, I wouldn't, I would never say I was a YouTuber. Oh, I'm a music producer. But eventually I started saying I'm a YouTuber and they would give me the strangest looks because back then in 2017, it was still kind of a weird thing. You know, you're a what? A YouTuber. Yeah. 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 I've started saying that myself too in the last couple of years. When I first started, it was like, oh, I'm a guitar player. I'm a musician. I'm a touring guitar player, whatever. And I make YouTube videos. That was kind of like the last thing. And then about, I don't know, a year or two ago, I was like, you know, because the pandemic ended my touring career for the most part. I still get out a couple times a year and, and do a handful of, of dates. Um, whereas before the pandemic, I mean, that was my full time job was being on the road and making YouTube videos. And then once the pandemic happened, obviously all the gigs went away. And um, but now, yeah, over like two years, it's like, OK, yeah, I'm a YouTuber. I'm a content creator and a musician. And my my niche and my platform is based around guitar and music and music production. You know, it's interesting using the term content creator um, th that I've always resisted that, although that's what we do, I guess. But um, but I, I resist influencer even more. <laughs> that is the that yeah. is the oh, are you an influencer? Uh, no, well, that because that's because it draws up like, you know, we're out here doing TikTok dances or like the Instagram thing, or if you don't follow there's this amazing Instagram account called influencers in the wild, which if you don't follow that, it's, it's one of my favorite accounts. And so, yeah, when you say influencer, that's where my mind goes. And I think really what we are is more of, we're just a, a bunch of nerds that decided to make videos about the things that we really care about and are really nerdy about because at some point we learned this stuff and you know had youtube been around when i was 13 years old 14 years old and first picking up guitar i i don't know where i would be as a musician now i'd probably had probably would have been exposed to much a much wider array of stuff in those earlier formative years which i think would have made me a much better musician Today. Well, well, there are there are definitely things that kids do now that that are, I won't say impossible, but they would have. They're pretty much impossible if without YouTube they couldn't be done. Mm. There's technical things that 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 kids learn that I'll see people in their 20s that they've learned through all the different tutorials that there are uh, different playing techniques that people have mastered um, that were not invented, you know, when, um, 
when I was growing up. I mean, a lot of the, or at least if they weren't invented, they were invented, but, but nobody talked about them. You know, when I had Frank Ambali on, you know, uh, back in 2019, Frank's techniques with the sweet picking. Yes, people did sweet picking, but nobody did it like Frank. Mm. And, and that was something that came up in the eighties and the, you know, the VHS instructional tapes that Steve Morris said that, that, you know, Lukather had that, that Frank had those things were, you know, only people that could afford to have those things. Now that's post me, the, the stuff I learned, I was already a college professor at that point. There was, you know, plus I couldn't afford a VHS recorder on the college <laughs> professor's uh, <laughs> salary. Hold on. I got to bring Mike in here for a second because Mike, we're doing our merch. Mike, I'm bringing you back in here. Unmute. Uh, we're gonna do it. We're doing our, our, we, this is our only time that we've, Mike? that we've sold merch board. in, um, hey, Mike. okay, Mike, uh, show our merch. How All much right. are we out of hats now? I'll tell you how many, well, I have one here, so, okay. <laughs> Let's check it out. Ooh. We have limited merch, Rhett, that we're three left. Three check left, this out. Three. Check this out, boys. three like that hats left. Okay, <laughs> hell yeah, in the store looking good. I like it. Good look, that's a good look. Okay, then the what about the trucker hat? Trucker hat, everything music. There we go. Looks even better on you, Mike. I like it. Yeah, hold on. We got these cut. This, this, they're hard to get on here, man. I'm getting. Once I get, yeah, once I slip it on, there we go. Yeah, the, Got to cover up my LaCroix for a second. The the like that koozie. Nice. I don't even have one of those. I feel like the Vanna White of uh, the stream right now. <laughs> and then. Um, okay. Then we have a shirt. Gray shirt. And our favorite piece that Lennon drew, Rhett. Yes. Oh, nice. I got to get one of those. That's definitive right there. Pelham, Pelham Blue guitar on there. Those are our items. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to do a shout out. Taylor Momsen. Taylor, Happy New Year. You're watching with your family. She just texted me. Uh, you're going to be on the channel this coming year. So these, so these are my, um, oh, and, uh, till midnight sale, the bundles on sale. Okay. My new year's resolutions for my channel. Cause I have channel uh, resolutions here. Um, I am going to ha do more, um, <clears throat> contemporary music. I focus in my interviews. I'm going to have more female artists on. Uh, but I'm going to really try to focus on contemporary music. I'll continue to do the, 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 you know, the old school legends, right. As they come up. Um, and I'm going to do more, uh, music playing videos and recording in the control room. I'm going to do actually engineering and, and creating songs and things like that. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to ask, uh, Rhett and Ward, Rhett, what is your what What are you going to do different in twenty twenty four? I've actually been thinking about this a lot recently. Um, well, we're launching a new series on my channel tomorrow called Live to Tape, which is in studio live performances, one take, no edits, no click track, nothing. Um, the week before Christmas, we recorded five of them. I had a friend of mine named Dylan Adams come up from Jacksonville, Florida, who's an incredible slide guitar player and we recorded some with my band and some with he and I. So we'll be doing this new series that I'm really excited about. Um, and the idea there is just to have some more music on the channel and to do it in a way that kind of celebrates and highlights analog recording. Hey, where did you get that tape machine from that you're using? I don't know what you're talking about. The uh, Well, actually, I'm not using it because I don't have a 20 amp circuit installed and it'll blow the breaker. Um, so what we did for the first few uh, episodes is we we tracked them just straight into Pro Tools and treated Pro Tools like a tape machine. Then I dumped it to my Tascam 388 and did the mix on that. But so more live music, more music on the channel. Um, I want to do more storytelling 
this year and highlighting you know i've been doing this for six years now and i've gotten to meet so many amazing people in this industry in terms of like guitar builders and pedal builders like we, we all know these people it's like you don't get into that as you're living without some kind of interesting story behind it and so many of these people are just really great down to earth like matt ike from mule dennis fano uh from from novo i mean so I want to do more storytelling stuff that highlights them. And then I just want to continue to make the stuff that I find fun to make and, and kind of engages my creativity. Um, so, yeah. Ward, what are you, what are you doing new this year? Well, I think I'm doing my version of what you were talking about, which is more contemporary. I, I need to get back in touch with the folks doing it now. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to embark on an aircraft carrier. I want to do a lot of squadron visits. I want to talk to uh, the uh, the aviators in the ready rooms now. All the stories coming out of these deployments would be super interesting to my core audience. And my cred is a function of not just aging out and telling stories about WW Cold War, but also understanding what's going on now and it's not just the technology it's also the sort of metaphysics of of being in the navy or in the military the, these days and the challenges if you've read my novels then you understand that's sort of where i focus it's not tom clancy techno thriller it's more of the who are the people who do this job warts and all and so i want to i want to do more of that and some of what i'm going to do is sort of determined by what's happening in the world uh, like we were talking about, I, I will continue to do these current events uh, episodes when uh, the situation demands that I do it. Um, I'm not going to force that hand because uh, I think that'll get old fast if I do. Um, and that'll be diminishing returns. But I'll do that. And then the rest is my core competency, which is celebrate the profession, celebrate military aviation. And I got that takes more time. Uh, to do the research and the, there's a lot more post-production than those episodes. And, and you got to be right because there's a lot of fans who will slice and dice you. If you go loose and free with some fact sets that, uh, you know, I've learned it's this the hard way. You know, it's interesting because Keith and I were talking about this earlier about these list videos, right. And that if you don't, he, he just did this three thirty five video and, uh, he, you know, if you leave someone off that people think should be on there and then the comments start to stack up at the top about yeah. that, that it, that it disrupts the, the, um, uh, it dip, disrupts kind of the flow of how the, uh, how the video goes out to people. I did a, um, I, I mentioned earlier that I did a top 20, on. Uh, uh, pop punk songs of the nineties video. And I didn't have the offspring on it. And I, I said, I need to change it to uh top 20 pop punk hits or ba bands of the nineties with um, excluding the, off the <laughs> offspring. offspring. Yeah. <laughs> um, Subi said, happy new year. I thought, I thought I saw Rick's two wait in the background at Rhett's. I yeah. Rick two. Wait, the, what's the that? Tape machine. He's talking about the tape machine. Yeah. yeah you can see it. Um, yeah, for those of you, yeah, Rick gave me the the old tape machine, which is the machine I learned on at your place. What? He did. 10 year, 11 years ago now, whenever that was. Yeah, so we were talking and I said to, and Rhett was like, I'm going to I'm going to use a tape machine and and uh and and do some videos with it. I said, you got a 20 amp circuit, right? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, you, you will blow if you have a 15 amp circuit if you go into rewind or fast forward, the servos will pop the circuit breaker. Well, I was, I, I was, I kind of knew about that, but I was like, I, you know, maybe it'll probably be fine. It'll probably be did fine. You, did you try it? Uh, no, no, but I, we're going to get some more work done on the studio this year. That is one of my, my resolutions is to finally finish up the, the studio. And the next big thing that has to happen down there is the electrical. Um, and so, I'm having a bunch of stuff done and then uh, we should be able to use the tape machine then once I can power it properly. Yeah. You know, I, I actually had only one 20 amp circuit installed in the control room uh, that the tape machine was plugged into and all the rest are 15 amp. Mike, you got any 20 amp circuits there? Oh yeah. yeah. You got 
lot of them or no? Uh, four. Yeah. And why? What do you need to run with them? I just wanted to make sure I had enough power for any amps or lights or anything that I was ever going to put in here. Yeah. We've got four specked out for my room too. I built when, when we, this is just was an old church from uh, pre-Civil War. Um, so it was like down to the studs. The whole thing was a mess. So it was like you, if you had the opportunity, you would put it in there. You would have enough to cover whatever you need to use, even if it was just a home. So yeah. Try nice. to do it the right way the first time. So I don't have to bust any walls out. Yeah. It was tough to run the, uh, to run that circuit from the control room, you know, with all the trip, you know, double sheet rock and all that stuff in the ceilings to fish the wires through over to the, to the circuit box was very difficult to do so it'll be easy right you got all the walls open so it should be easy to do that yeah yeah, yeah and the hardest part's over which was just getting the damn thing down there uh it took four of us and and a hand truck and a, a furniture dolly and yeah it was it was gnarly and it's i just have to go on the record here that it's on permanent loan to rent okay, okay? Yeah. sure Sure. Well, if, if you ever come asking for it back, you know, that's fine. You're going to have to figure out how to get it out of my space, though. It's 428 pounds. And and just to lift it down the two inches off the, from the uh, or three inches, whatever, in the control room. Oh, my God. Well, it's, it's great, too, because it has these big four big metal handles on the side of it. But then it says on the side to not lift it by the handle. Yeah. Well, I don't, <laughs> it's just like, I don't know what you're supposed to do with that. Oh. Uh, Maybe that's just there for liability reasons. I don't know. But it is – when we first brought it, we were going to try and move it upstairs into my our, my room where I shoot all my videos. And then we we started to kind of get up there, and I was like, I don't – I mean, I'm sure it's fine, but I don't know if – this thing might end up coming through the floor at some point. <laughs> you know what? So – and where it would be was is like our, our bedroom is right under that. So it would literally have fallen through onto the – onto where we sleep so that yeah be. that, that pro probably would be wouldn't get, wouldn't be good you know uh so we were talking earlier that ward just got an, an sg this week Rhett. Nice. he's got a brand new sg right there nice is it neck uh, dive or no is it what does it neck dive yes it does okay. like every sg well not every sg there's there's the rare there's the rare occasion so i have a 65 sg jr that doesn't neck dive but it's you know only having the one p90 helps uh but you can you can find them they're they're tough to find though yeah well i, I didn't want a p90 i wanted these burst buckers right i mean i got the junior for the p90 stuff um but um yeah i mean like we're saying if if you take your hands off of it it does that now right. my 65 does not do that. My my 65 doesn't do that, but the other ones will do that. My other 3 will neck dive. And the Les Paul custom one is the probably the the heaviest guitar I have here. The white. Well, I guess the lesson is just don't let go of it. Yeah. The lesson is don't let go of it. Yeah. What what does Angus play Ward? What what year uh, SG's does he play? Do you know? I think he's got the like original 61s, right? He I mean, he's got the their... on it, right? No. No, he doesn't have the vibrolas or anything. He's he's got. Uh, I thought know, it still has a has a bigger tailpiece on it. Does it not? Does it? I don't know. No. Let me look. Hold on. Let me do some research here. Um, um but I'm pretty sure 61. Is that Rhett? You know anything about that? I actually, don't. It would make sense though. Um, what he doesn't? There's no what whammy does. Do they do on? No, he doesn't do any whammy. But no, yeah. but the, the the it doesn't have the. It's not the. No, my friends. He okay. So I'm looking at a picture right here. Yep. He, it, it's a. Stop no, Yeah. No. No. Just a standard tailpiece. No vibrola of any kind. Right. Yeah. So that's good because those Gibson vibrolas were the worst. They look great. They now his great. signature guitar um, has a vibrola, um, and I see some pictures of him playing with with one. Oh, his signature guitar right. does. That must be why yeah. I think that. Yeah, but you know, at Donegan and all the other classic early stuff, he doesn't have any any whammy bar at all. Yeah, I don't, yeah. he he's a blues player, right? He's not he's not doing any yeah. whammy stuff. No. Uh, Rhett, you have an SG, right? I do. 65 SG Jr. Bought it 
two years ago from Maple Street Guitars here in Atlanta. So it has has the one P90, right? One P90 in the wrap wrap around tailpiece, and it's oh, I know that one. That's a great guitar. It's and it's super lightweight. It's a uh, no headstock brake. Basically, I bought it from the second owner, Lindsay from uh, Maple Street, who had had it for a couple of years, and he bought it from the original owner. Who the story on that guitar is? It was he he bought it in '65. Grew up in Atlanta. And bought it in 65 when he was a senior in high school to play with his high school band played it for a couple years and then just put it under his bed in the case and it came with the the old school gibson neck breaker case and everything um and yeah it's the only vintage guitar i own and it's a ripper man it's so good that is the only vintage guitar right yeah, the only two real pieces of vintage gear that I have are that, and then I've got a 64 uh, AC30, which also came from Lindsay at Maple Street, um, which was excellent. That that one, I actually, I remember I told you to go check that amp out. Right, and that, so then I went to check it out, and I said, you need to buy this. Yeah, because I wasn't looking for an AC30 at the time, but I know you and, and your nerd like myself for U2 and, and all that. And you up until then had the best AC30 that I had played through your Korg era, early nineties AC30. But that one was unreal. So I thought, Oh, well, yeah, you'll just buy this. So Rhett called, so Ward, Rhett had me go to play this at the store and I played it and it sounded amazing. And then I got in my car and I called him and I said, no, you need to buy this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, all right, well, so he's sure? like, what am I? I have to sell something to buy it. Yeah, I sold some stuff to buy it, but it was uh I'm so glad because it's got the original, it's got the stand with it too, you know, the, yeah. the wheels on the side and everything. And um that was a one owner piece as well. The guy who came up in Jacksonville, Florida. So I guess in 64, someone in the chat that knows more about this than me can tell me, but I think 64 would have still been built in England, right? Because they didn't open the JMI at what is now Sound City until 65, right? Like Okay, so the the thing I didn't know until the other day is that Ward used to play an AC30. And, and I thought, that's an incredibly loud amp to have played. Yeah, I had the one with the sort of purple appointments, right? It was a special edition. Oh, yeah. Um, You know, and I was... a I was into the dandy war halls at the time. And so I'm like, I got to get an AC 30. Um, and I, I didn't love it. And in fact, I traded it when I moved here um, for a blues junior with at our local music store. Um, and then once the, and the band was on hiatus and when the, when the band got back together, it's like that, that's not enough amp for what we're doing. Mm. Uh, not to mention not the right so, uh, sound of an amp. And so that's when I got this, this Marshall here uh because I, I i i'm a i'm a sucker for marshall just because of everything about it the logo the heritage the you know just the sound of it but i fought with some of the marshall heads i've had over the years um you know i had a 2205 that the split channel one that sucked and i paid more to those have were, it hot rod or those were really inconsistent the 22 well i mean i paid more to have it hot rod than i than i paid yeah. to have the 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 thing there's this guy in northern virginia who's the hot rider to the stars and he made it so the the distortion was so buzzy and mm. to your point it would if i if i had it dialed in if i barely nudged it, it would it would go out and and uh, not never to be found again so there's too much work and so i went from that to an orange then back to that vintage modern marshall that i didn't like no yeah um, that was supposed to be half what jtm yeah. half jcm 900 or whatever the two combos were um and i was I about that that now. well it, and it had kind of the light purple tolex which was not awesome um and then uh i got the uh i had a buddha for a while oh yeah you know but wow but it was too midi there was too much mid in the buddha yeah. I'm not sure you can have too much mid-range ward well yeah you, you can you can yeah, right? you turns out you can rick Yes, um, and, and, and so, um, and I, because I had, I, I had been introduced to the Buddha early on down at a music store down in Virginia Beach, um, and it, the 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 guy in the shop dialed in, and it sounded so cool. And then I, when I came into possession of one, they they went away from the hand wired, uh, you know, sort of circuitry, and then went back to it, 
here's here's my girl sailor here um and uh but uh so it was a high-end buddha but it just i couldn't you know this is interesting about the buddhas i i used to see them around all the time probably in when was this 2010 something like that yeah we had them at aim that we had they had just gotten them at aim when i started there and they had a vintage modern marshall as well yeah everyone wanted the buddha they were the hot thing you know? yeah it was hot it was like that was the yeah thing. everybody was using those mike did you ever run across people using buddhas when you're out touring yeah yeah it was a, it was a pretty hot phase well that was the first sort of boutique like generally available boutique you know i mean you got top hat and matchless and all these others but that was the first sort of a yeah whatever happened to them you know it's like I, they were so hot for those two or three years and then i just stopped seeing them around and and i i haven't seen one i can't remember the last time honestly that i saw buddha amp anywhere i think i I saw one like music go around or something yeah i i I, um yeah i can't i can i cannot because they were kind of going for that i think that that part of the amp market got a little crowded because they were going for that super mid-rangey i think dumbbell-ish kind of smooth clipping overdrive kind of thing and now it's like you know, there's so many people out there going for that, and you can get that sound out of a pedal or a plug-in or you know, so many different ways. Yeah, but they but they disappeared way before that, though. They, I, I don't, I probably haven't seen one since 2014, maybe. That that was yeah, kind of a, a a a uh, an amp that when I was producing, I mean, nothing that I had because I I tend to stick with, you know, most of the classic amps the the marshals well so chris chris in the chat says did didn't pv buy them i don't know if that's true if that's true that would be the beginning of the end right (laughs) (laughs) mississippi marshall man come on yeah no meridian mississippi that's there's a there's a bunch of flight school squadrons there that's where the advanced (laughs) training yeah interesting that's great Naval aviator students and PV amplifiers. That's Meridian. So when I moved here to Atlanta in 1994, November, so it's now my my uh, next year in 2024 will be my 30th year here in Atlanta. Which you still say Atlanta like you moved here six months ago. <laughs> right. So I, um, the, my instruments, I had a PV Classic 30. Yep. And I had a Mexican Strat. It's classic rig, man. Yeah, you know, you like that. I had sold all my gear because I was broke, and I um, and that's literally all I had when I got here. Did and you have I, a? Were you running a tube screamer with that rig? I feel like that's kind of a prerequisite. <laughs> like, you got a strat, you got the the PV Classic Thirty, you got to have the tube screamer. And was that a solid state amp, or was it a no, tube amp? It was a tube yeah. Amp. Okay. yeah, dude, people sleep on those classic series amps, the Classic Thirty, and I think there was a fifty watt. Once again, yeah, there was a 50 watt. Once again, I haven't seen, I didn't, I never see those classic amps. Uh, somebody has a, a super chat here that was, uh, anyone in Annapolis at July 13th come to the, to Moochapalooza to hear J- Danger Boy. Who's Danger Boy, Ward? That's my band. Uh, you tell, tell people about your band, Ward. Um, we're a three piece high energy cover band yep that that does uh deep cuts and surprises you with what we cover we're not your average bar band you know we um, talked about it earlier when when keith was on we were talking about his band but for the people that are joining right now yeah i, I was in a four piece called miles from clever for 20 years and we broke up this past year because the drummer got divorced um and in the interim during covid we found a new bass player who lives close to me up here in annapolis and so the bass player and I found a drummer locally and we formed the new band Danger Boy. And we debuted at Moochapalooza, which is a gathering of my YouTube subscribers and patrons here in Annapolis every summer. So we we had our debut at Moochapalooza this this past summer, which was great. And, and so, um, you know, th- these guys are awesome. The drummer was Charlie Watts's drum tech for a while. Um, and uh, the bass guitarist is the best bassist I've ever played with. And uh, he, he's, he, you know, 
bears the scars of playing in everything from an Elvis impersonator band to, uh, you know, very speed metal groups and his chops are, are all over the place. So we can play anything. Um, and the lead guitarist in miles from clever was fantastic. Another retired Naval aviator a guy named Ed Gassy, who longtime music guy who stumbled into Naval aviation, kind of like me. Um, and so Ed and I were musical soulmates and he let me be lazy in terms of guitar prowess because he was just fantastic. And so all of our set list was us playing different things. Um, and now he, with, he could play the, he could play the solo to, for, to, uh, do you feel like we do right? The whole, yeah, in all fact, the he, we posted that and Peter Frampton commented on it. No way. Yes. Yes. He said, good job, lads. It was like, my my lead guitarist, it was the best, greatest day of his life. You know, he flew Tomcats, but the fact that Peter Frampton complimented him on his, you know, talk box action for Do You Feel Like We Do. But we did that song at the end of our second set, note perfect. Okay, Ward, the okay, so I will attest to this. I tried to do the talk box. I have a talk box. I tried to to I had never used it before. And when I did my hundredth, what makes a song great? And do you feel like we do? I can play all the notes of the solo, no problem. But I tried to do the talk box and I was thinking, okay, the, it's hard to do yeah. all the, the inflections. To do, I mean, it's really difficult to do yeah. that. So Ed has been doing this since high school. Okay. Right? So, um, and when you'd play, it's sort of indulgent to do that song at a bar, mm -hmm. you know, for the kids. Come on, these 14 days. minutes. Come on, Ward. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, if you know, you know. Right. And and so the, the, the older members of the crowd would get it and would love it. And the other people would be like, WTF. <laughs> right. They'd wander off the dance floor with their arms folded. Like, are you done yet? You know? Um, so we used to do it. And at the end, we'd finish you know that 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 flourish um and sometimes it was crickets and we'd look at each other like well i liked it <laughs> you know, well, I had fun. yeah i had fun i thought you were great um and so yes we did that song um we shan't be doing it in danger boy um and uh so yeah so danger boy is we're doing a beatles medley um you know it starts with she's a woman and ends with um the end and I do all three, as you pointed out, Rick, I, I do all three of the lead parts. I saw, I witnessed Ward yeah. do it here in my control yeah. room. He did all three solos, which is kind of fun. And we also do, you never give me your money in a three priest version of it. And we're not the analogs, right? So it's, it's, it's a poor man's interpretation of it. Um, but I love the fills and the, you know, the, the outro. And uh, now I have two other guys who can keep the, the glue going so I can do those things in and out. We do some Judas priest. Um, and now that I have the SG, um, we're going to do some Sabbath. Nice. Like, there you go. Ward. War pigs into paranoid into fairies wear boots kind of a thing. Okay. You know? Nice. So it's going to be interesting to see how the local crowd, cause you got kind of this bro culture, you know, the university of Maryland weekenders that come down here. Um, I don't know if they'll know not what they the Black it. Sabbath, probably. Yeah, probably not. And we also do, we do like plush and Vaseline, you know, and, and, or, and things like dude, that. You yeah. know, maybe focus a little bit here. No, I mean, we, we're, man, not, man. we're not going oh, to. Play, play no, that's, it's just indulgent. It's just like our, our yeah, set I love it. kind of all over the place. I love it. Right? Oh, oh says, which we, start with, we start with um, uh, double feature, science fiction double feature into time warp. That's how we start the first set. Um, and, and so that's another one. Like, if you've never seen Rocky Horror, you're going to be like, what is going on? But you, if you have seen it, you're going to be like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And so that's the reaction we got at Mucha Palooza when we started with those two songs, you know, because most of the folks at Mucha Palooza, are, you know, skew a little bit older. And they got the joke, as it were. Right. We do decent readings of it. I mean, I can do a good Richard O'Brien. That's kind of my vocal range, you know. Um, and so, and then we go right into walking the dog into mama kin, into the innocent by driving and crying into, you know, we're doing all kinds of different things. 
Um, and so it's fun. And, you know, four guys, it's hard to build consensus. Three guys, it's not hard. It's like orders of magnitude easier to agree on the set list now. Well, it's easier to get a majority, Ward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Okay. So, Rhett, Ward gave us a tour of his pedal board earlier. What, Rhett, what is on your pedal board right now? God, I don't even know at this point. I'll tell you what I have loved recently is that new Chroma console from Hologram. I bought that. Like, I saw I saw the day they launched it and just immediately went on. on okay. Wait. Board. I think I know that. What is that one? So, it's like the multi effect lo fi modulation yes. thing. That's right. It's, yeah. Dude. Looks honestly, cool. I haven't even been playing guitar much through it. I've been using it mostly on like drums and vocals and that kind of stuff because it's it's sick. Um, and then the, my favorite fuzz at the moment is um, this. It's it's called a super fuzz, but it's not a clone of the original super fuzz. It's a Stromer super fuzz. A guy in New York City is building them. As far as I know, he's building them like in his apartment, like bending the metal enclosures on his kitchen table type thing um and that's just a really great octave fuzz uh germanium thing and um uh, what else working on some new stuff right now in the pedal realm that we'll be able to announce in march so there's some prototype stuff on my board right now um yeah and everything else just kind of comes and goes you know it depends on like what we're playing what we're doing um the the chase bliss preamp mark ii the one with the flying faders you know yeah. that has the, the you make it a fuzz an eq a boost a preamp that's really great and then the chase bliss mood that basically never leaves my board i don't know that what is that that's like their kind of ambient ethereal micro looper granular thing so it's kind of two pedals in one the right side is a is sort of this looper that's always listening to what you're playing. Mm -hmm. It's not a traditional looper like a ditto. It's it's just kind of always recording. And depending on how you have the parameters set, when you hit the button, it just starts playing back a certain part of what you're playing, and you can reverse it and do all kinds of stuff. And then the other side is a reverb or a delay or pitch shifted delay. So you can create these really cool soundscapes because in the middle you have control over the clocking you can actually like turn the clock down and get a really low resolution low bit depth kind of ambient thing it's one of my favorite pedals i've ever owned okay so my brother john who was on earlier just sent me a picture of his pedal board so he's obviously watching he has a uh uh el capitan or el caps caps what is it el capstan what is that Dryman? like their tape Tape Echo. Tape, tape Echo. He has a Eventide H9. Great. He's got a, uh, what is this, Engine Room Level 5 Fender? What is that? Oh, that's a power supply. Um, He's got a, a, a Mod Modulator Electro Harmonics. I don't know that pedal. What is that? Either. Electro Harmonics builds so many pedals, it's hard to keep up. He also has an Electro Harmonic Pitch Fork. That's cool. a pitch shifter, right? Yeah, that's cool. And then he has the SL drive. Classic. Yep. I uh for if who who makes that exotic? Is that right? Yeah. If anybody from exotic is watching, I have an SL drive and I dropped it about five years ago and I, I broke one of the knobs on it. And I'd like if I get a replacement knob, you know, I'll buy it. <laughs> but um um I need a replacement knob for it. Don't get a replacement knob for something it, else, man. You don't need them to send you a specific knob. No, I want the matching. I can't not have the matching knob. Mike knows that, right, Mike? I do know that. Oh, my God. I was, I was, I was saying earlier, Rhett, I got all these pedals that Tim Pierce convinced me to buy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. the classic, the Nobles, you know, the, the, the Nashville secret, as it were. Yeah, this one that right that was the yeah yep. It that sounded great. It sounded great for a while, and then the magic's just sort of wandered off. Uh oh, did you try yeah. changing the battery? Well, oh, oh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the battery. Um, so the, you know what I don't like about this pedal is the two the two things. Right, so in the heat of battle, I'm always stepping yeah, on the really wrong thing. Close. too close together, right? Yeah, and it yeah. walks you off. So I'll have it dialed in to the really cool thing, and then I'll step on the wrong thing, and it marches to the other channel. And now it's just yeah. out, of, out of whack. 
I know. built a board a few years ago at the height of like the Instagram, like church bro kind of pedal board shot, you know, where it was like everyone, the, the trend then was to like have your board packed as tightly as possible with all the pedals. So there was like no gaps and spaces and everything. And I built a board like that. And after playing it for 10 minutes, realized the, the mistake that I had made. Uh, but I didn't have time to change it because I was getting ready for a run of shows. And so I had to like for a month, basically make do with this board where it was like, would you I, have point, pointy, pointy shoes? And yeah, literally like having to like dip my toe in to hit a specific pedal. And I was knocking <laughs> like parameters around. It was a nightmare. So yeah. I yeah, need to your price size things, you know, like <laughs> yeah, my first pedal board type situation. Yeah. Okay, Tom McGill, best thing about your channel is the guilt I feel when I haven't practiced guitar and it's been eight months. <laughs> Thank you for the amazing interview, sharing your creative approach to music and being an all-around great person. Tom, it's always great to hear from you and you need to come and visit again. I haven't seen you in, in way too long. Always welcome to come over to the studio and hang out. Um, hey, my bass guitarist is in the chat, TJ Collins. Nice. What's up, TJ? He's a great American. Um, uh oh, Mike, I'm gonna have you dip out here because I have another guest here. All right, what see, you, good see you, Rat. Good to see Mike. Good to see okay. you, I'm gonna hit remove see, here. Okay, I'm gonna add our fourth guest here. Mike, you see, you Oh, my Tim god, Pierce. there he is. <laughs> Tim, I was just talking oh, about you. I heard. I've been watching. I've been lurking for like. He saw minutes. the ODR one, and that was his cue. He's like, "I got to jump on." I heard. I've been watching. Yeah, but you need there's there's the, there are better ones now. You Ward, you got to sell you got to sell that one, and there's better ones now. <laughs> Where am I selling this? How do I sell this? What is that? Well, you you whatever however you want to do it, you could take it down to the you know street and sell it if you want. Somebody will buy it in the chat. Probably it's a great okay. pedal. Okay, okay, here we go. Let's see. I'm building my. I'm rebuilding my pedal board right now. Oh, this is awesome! Here we go. Let's see. See, I have the ultimate standing desk here, and I'm, I'm, I'm rebuilding it because I have a gig coming up that I have to do, so it has to be ready to go. So, nothing as fancy as a Rets uh, palette, but what are you talking about? That's it's like pretty good for an older gentleman. <laughs> 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 okay so what do we got here tim what is the okay the main thing that that's good, cool about this wait let me turn you guys off because i, I I've been, like i said about wait did you just say nothing is fancy with is that an h90 on the board no it's not it's a uh, lvx so that's pretty fancy it's a delay that is uh -huh. a very fancy delay yeah, yeah what is that delay i've never seen that before tim maris lvx delay pretty fancy yeah pretty fancy <laughs> Because, you know, you can actually, when you want to change stuff, you just, you go to, it's got these bubbles, see, and you can just turn the thing, and these really cool bubbles, everything changes, you know, it's like, well. Wait, so what what what, what would that be akin to, Tim? <clears throat> I don't know, it's just a really advanced delay, like a timeline, or, you know, uh, yeah, like a timeline. Okay. So it can kind of do anything, basically. It can be yeah, any, any delay you could possibly think of with any... Yeah any tweaks or whatever so but the great thing about it is that each this reverb and this delay are hooked to expression pedals so the cool thing about this pedal board is that okay so the sounds bone dry and then if i want to bleed in delay i just press down this pedal and it gradually fill uh, uh feathers in and if i want to bleed in reverb i press this pedal and i gradually felt filter filters in but check this out. I can do them both at the same time. Woo! Wow. Now that's a good use of things being close together. Exactly. So this is spaced so that my big foot can do either or both. And so I'll be playing a solo that's bone dry and I'll just bleed in a little reverb and delay just for, uh, you know, like an event. And then it'll come back out. Okay, so Tim, how do you hit the nobles if you need to, or is that always on? No, well, th these this has presets that you can do, so you can actually oh. do scenes with this loop strip down here. Very smart. I'm talking about Tim. Program scenes in here. It's a pro yeah. rig right there, man. That's a now, pro the, pedal board. The nobles is great if you get a, a real one, but word. So you have to sell the one you have and get this guy. It's my friend Greg Droman made this one. So how much are those going for generally? 
I think this is two hundred dollars. Oh, but done I can, deal. I can, I'm there. I can pro probably get you a deal. I no, have that I, one. I love it. Okay, I gotta have one immediately. Yes. This is sounds exactly like the real nobles, as does the Keeley, which you know uh, you've seen on on YouTube many many times now. The Keeley, I have it here. This one actually is a clone. Also, Rhett knows all this. He's. he's I don't know that pedal. This is the Keeley clone of the Nobles ODR one from the early '90s, so you don't have to pay eighteen hundred dollars or whatever. Oh it, my God! It, However, it was, what, what's I think my I think my buddy's Karma MT10 actually sounds a, a little better. And Tim, who is the one that makes the Karma? The um... Greg Droman, uh, yeah, famous Greg. engineer, husband of Marilyn Martin, yep. your friend. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So wait, Tim, what's the difference? The, like the newer ones have too much low end, right? Is that the, they, the, the, the newer I'm getting my drink. Hold on. The newer ones don't have um, a pleasing. Oh, God, I hate saying this in front of 2,500 people. The newer ones don't have a pleasing tone in the top end. Uh, okay. Got it. But didn't the original, there's something with the low end of the ODRs though. That's like the, the original ones were real. Cause the new ones, they have a base cut switch. Uh, Ward, yours has a cut switch in it, right? Like if you take that top cover off, like uh this one i mean it's not a bad pedal it's okay it's there's nothing wrong with it but it doesn't equal the early 90s ones and they've been cloned it's been done it's it's this and this both do it nice i have literally have not seen that keely pedal oh there's a big splash on youtube with all our buddies they all demonstrate it i don't really watch a lot of um pedal demo things unless it's my friends that are demo demoing them yeah i i i don't suppose you do rick <laughs> i don't see a cut switch red i don't see any cut switch i think it might be under the the nameplate if i'm not mistaken the that nobles odr1 i could be wrong ward but i think if you like flip that up on the side or something yeah so this is cool this oh is the my Fair, gosh. fairfield circuitry falling water this is just a great little modulation never seen that before it's either cool. do you know that rat yeah fairfield makes some really cool stuff they do yeah, yeah. They, do. they do all kinds of they're one of the pedal companies what's interesting right now is there's sort of this blend that's happening in our industry where the guitar effects industry and the synth industry and the modular synth industry are all starting to come together it's like the synth world a few years ago started to discover guitar pedals and the modular world starts. So now you have these guitar pedal makers, traditionally guitar effect makers now stepping out into the synth world. And Fairfield is one of those companies where they do some really cool stuff. That's not your traditional fuzz overdrive type thing. Thanks, Rhett. Yeah, I don't, um, I have so many pedals here and, and um, uh, I basically just put things on a board for whenever I need to do something for a video. The only uh, uh, time that I've actually had to have a pedal board was when I was doing the billionaire thing and I had very specific things I needed that were from my old pedal board back in the day, 25 years ago. But um I used to have 13 pedals on my pedal board back then, but damn. Were you doing the old school thing where you had the just the power strip on top with all the wall warts plugged in? Yeah. yeah. How noisy yeah. was it? Well, I, I had batteries in almost everything, so. Yeah, but, but I, your, I, your I, I had a few. Has the, has the power supply built in, right? With the yeah, so my so my memory man and my, and my MXR flanger both had to be plugged in, so they were in the power strip. I made my pedal board though out of two by fours and and I routed little feet for the uh, for my wah pedal for my Vox wah um, that it was a poor man's pedal board back then you know just with gluing I spray painted it black I remember doing it at this house I rented out at uh, one o'clock in the morning I'd be out there doing stuff in the carport <laughs> building my pedal board outside and you know. I had a uh, a pedal board building station in my garage in Sherman Oaks, and I would go out there on a nightly basis and turn on K Rock. And I, I actually have so much nostalgia about that. I did for about a decade. I would it was just a giant workbench surrounded by 
all the stuff, you know, the dual lock and the pedal boards and the pedals and the cables, and the power cables. And I would stand out there and remake my pedal boards constantly. And then I'd go in the studio and be not quite satisfied and then remake it again and then go in the studio and not be satisfied. But uh, in my heyday in the studio, I had three. I had one in front of me, one on each side of me. And then uh, and then before that, I had uh, pedals in rack drawers. You know, I had that era too, that, that whole thing. So. so, Tim, when did you go away from, like, when did the, the arms race stop and you started like went back to pedal boards uh it was probably the the mid late 90s there was enough rack <laughs> there was enough interest in rack stuff in the early 90s to where it lived for a little while uh and then people they just wanted amps and pedal boards they weren't interested in and rightly so because the rack stuff was always an imitation and it was oh no that's not true see what happened the rack thing Okay, I'm going to be very quick about this. Very quick. The rack thing peaked in an amazing way where we all started carrying our own mic pre's. So what you would do is you would have a Neve mic pre and it would go through all of the rack effects just like they were at the console. So you would use your vintage AC30. It would go through a 57 into your mic pre out in stereo to all your stereo effects and the engineer would capture that through xlrs which were also on the front panel of your rack so that was it really the first guy to do it was michael landau the second guy was michael thompson and then everybody started doing it you would bring your mic pre and you would use your vintage amps in mono and bust them out in stereo with the effects the way they were supposed to be used okay Tim, but where does the mic pre where how do you plug in the if they're coming out of your mic pre what does it go into right uh, well, the mic pre, the, the mono out goes into your first to stereo effect, and that splits it into stereo. And then it travels through all the other stereo effects, and then stereo out to the engineer who can either take mono or stereo or blender or whatever he wanted to do. It confused some people, but the guys that, that didn't have, like, resistance to it really actually loved it. So you would have your tone, you know, just completely dialed. So it, it reached a pretty amazing place before it ended. It really did. Now you can just do it all with your axe effects, you know? True. I, I, I mean, there's just so many ways to get effects now. You know, you can print, you know. It's, I just, I always feel like a mono guitar is easier to play. So you guys all are going to yeah. agree with me. Yeah. A mono guitar is going to be so much easier to deal with. Stereo guitar, it's kind of weird. There are not two guitars. There's only one. And, and yeah. you turn it into two guitars. You know this. I mean... A stereo guitar, it should be used as a seasoning, uh, an event. But if you're giving people stereo guitar all the time, then they, what do they do? They take one side or do they sum it to mono? Weird stuff starts to happen. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, to make records, anybody making records, I believe, is going to want a mono guitar. And if you want to print an effect, great. If you don't, the, you know, you'll do great plug-in effects. But, Tim, you would typically print... You would always print your effects, right? The people that you worked with, the producers wanted you to print stuff. Absolutely, they? generally, generally, yes. Except on solos, I don't like to print the delay because the delay is a wonderful thing to experience, but it's also really tragic when you can't diminish it later. So I would always do solos with plug-in delays so that it could be negotiable and it could be taken away later. So here's the thing, stereo guitar, was a fad that developed and was amazing and what it did is it made the tracking date confidence better for a guitar player because everything sounded amazing on the tracking date except for the guitar generally because the guitar was this skinny little mono thing so if you're on a tracking date and you're steve lukather and you have your stereo delay it it spreads and it sounds just as big as the drums and just as big as the stereo keyboards and that gave everybody confidence to feel like uh it was a room full of winners with a winning song that would go to a winning mix engineer and uh, make a well, winning. Tim, when he would play those muted picking parts and everything with the stereo guitar sounds, they, they would sound amazing. You know, that would be. Yeah. A stereo. I wish I had a stereo rig right now. It's like everybody should have a stereo rig to enjoy as a hobby, you know, it's like, really fun. Yeah. At home, like by yourself, but or especially in a live setting, I just don't, I personally don't understand stereo and 
most live settings because more than likely the system's in mono anyways. And if it's not, it's like if they were really panning you left and right, then you, to hear the perfect stereo image, you'd have to be standing equidistant between the mains and whatever room that you're you're listening in. And it's, you know, it's cool and it sounds great and lush and fun, but yeah, I, I just well, and well, you know, I, amps and it's a whole thing. And I think if you're if you're a guitar artist, it can be great because you can create the space you need to where you can hear all those effects. Where, you know, if you have control over the three piece that's playing behind you, and when you go for a solo, it fills out the room in stereo, fine. But in any other situation where you're you're supporting a vocalist or in a, like you said, Rhett, in a band where you know, it's it's more traditional. It, there's no room for it. One thing really cool, uh, Andrew Sinewick, when he goes into the baked potato, he plugs his effects into the PA and stereo in the, in the, it's so cool. It's like, he's so, so smart about that stuff. It's, it's like the effects are up in, in the roof, you know, in the, in the that's all. yeah. All right, guys, um, I got to jump off. All right, Rat. Happy New Year. Night. Happy New Year, Rat. See you guys. Okay, so my brother is is on here. He probably wants to add something about effects here. Let me see if he's going to say something. John, you got to turn sideways. Were you going to say something about effects here, John? Is it snowing right there? It looks like it's, it's snowing. It's snowing outside. I'm standing outside only because Tim is on. I already saw Ward. but uh... <laughs> No offense, Ward. <laughs> no offense, Ward, of course. None but, taken. Hi, Tim. You got a ski hat on, but I'm the one standing in the snow. You see this? Well, I, I got to cover this. <laughs> what do I do with this thing? It's the hockey. It's actually snowing, snowing, John. It's actually snowing outside, and I'm standing outside right now. So I to add. It's it's yeah, true. it's true. Um, yeah, so we're uh, we're we're watching this little uh, pedal extravaganza going on. Ward, I I I just can't fathom that you had the phase ninety at the end of the chain, though. That was kind of. That's really bugging you. But it, it's not bugging me, but we'll have a conversation. No, no, it is. It is it's, it's, it's bugging me. <laughs> it is. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to change it if you can convince me why. Okay, what is, Tim, what is the theory what is, about, about pedal order? This, is, this has always been a um, – people have different, you know, tone – no, to, pitch – no, tone, pitch, time. No, time, tone, pitch. <laughs> time mod yeah what, but what nobody's right though nobody's right i mean let tim speak tim, where, does, tim. where does the phase okay pedal so go? so drive pedals go first drive pedals okay yeah now here's where i do something not everybody does i put a volume pedal after the drive pedals and that way every time uh i finish a phrase with a noisy drive pedal my foot pulls back like i'm on the gas pedal and there's no noise. So I've developed right. a, a second nature habit of I play a phrase, there's noise, it's gone. Play a phrase, right. there's noise, it's gone. Okay. Uh, so you're all, you're you're a noise get you noise gate it yourself. Right. Now, and that includes a fuzz pedal. You need to put a fuzz pedal first because the any buffer that's in, you know, a lot of pedals have buffers. If there's a buffer in a pedal, it'll kill the fuzz. Right. Tone. So put the fuzz first, yep. put your drive pedals next. And if you're me, you put a volume pedal next, okay? And then all your, here's what you're, here, here wait for it. You're, you're, this is what you're searching for, Rick. Your time-based pedals go next, okay? And the phase is a time-based pedal. So it's it's anything with modulation or delay or reverb goes after the... the uh, Tim, Tim, I have to tell you, I Warren. put a compressor before the tuner. Well, I don't use a compressor, so then okay. you know more, and then, that's great. Well done, you know? I, it's... it's <laughs> I, I don't use a compressor. I should. I, I just just don't. You know, I, Ward, missed, I forgot. Ward, are, you, are you vindicated, Ward? Vind I think I'm vindicated here. I, I think you that's are. What I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. You know, you know that I didn't disagree with your placement of that. Yeah. But uh, but I, I'm um, not going to sleep tonight. Just uh, well, no, I probably won't anyway. I do, I'm still, I'm I do, still I do. wondering why Rhett's so mad at me that he 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 left the chat. <laughs> he left immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so so um, nothing personal. Okay, can, can, we, personal. can we talk a little bit about um, uh, pre effects loops um, and effects loops and and 
the idea of going in the front end of the amp were like most of the classic players of the sixties and seventies. I mean, their effects loops came in when the early, well, they had no the, choice, but to go exactly. in front of the, we had, I mean, that was, that, there was just amplifiers and then the effects were okay, coming but, into. But, but we have gotten used to hearing those sounds on all the records that we love. We, we hear the, uh, the effects going into the amplifier straight in. And I've always been a believer of that. Yeah. But some of those things were added after the fact though, too, even back as far as you're you talking know, about the, the they were added in, the, in the control room, yeah. like Van Halen, with Van the Halen one, you know, with the plate reverb or whatever that was, I mean, you know, so, so well, that was. You're right, to, John, you're right. No, you're right. John, uh, but th these are people who knew how yeah. to not overload the front end of an amp with the delay or, you know, people that found that exact spot where they weren't pushing it too hard. Like if you take the police and Andy Summers and those effects, they made darn sure that they weren't smashing the input of the amp too hard with the delay or the chorus or the reverb. Hugh Padgham, you know, staying all those guys working really hard to make sure it was done right. Uh, and in Van Halen's case, that's interesting because I don't know. You tell me, how much did he use the Echoplex on the first record? No, he used the Echo, Echoplex quite a bit. But the John is talking about the reverb on the, the you know when they would hard pan the reverb sounds. Those but were that's the that's the room, that. isn't it? That's that's that's. I, I thought it was. I always thought it was a plate reverb. And, there. Yeah, yeah, plate reverb. It's the room at the. It's probably the the egg egg shaped room at Sunset Sound Studio Two or whatever it is. I don't know. It's yeah. pro it's probably on Google right now for us to discover. And it must be true if it's on there. I think it's a real room sound, though, don't you? Why why wouldn't it be a real room sound? Uh, That's why we have to get Ted Templeman on the on the yeah, channel. We have to read his biography. Out what it is. Yeah. I I have said hello to Ted Templeman when Greg Bissonette called him to ask him a question about the um about Van Halen. He asked him about the intro to um to um um what is it? The double kick. Hot for teacher. Hot for teacher. Thank you. He called him to, to, to ask him about hot for teacher and Ted picked up and, and said, uh, uh, I forget what he said. <laughs> it was something about the, what was Eddie's Ferrari or was that not it? That the, that was the muffler sound or something was. That was, was Panama. Wow. Oh, it was Panama was. Okay, that was that's Panama. Right. It was Eddie's Ferrari. Yeah, maybe that's what it was, right? <laughs> you see my commitment to this show, right? That you're all in the comforts of the home studio, and I'm actually standing out in the snow, right? Well, if you've lived in Rochester your whole life, it's you know. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. I've heard. Yeah. yeah. Why are you outside, John? What's uh, going on? Because there's a ho hockey party going on inside, and there's like you know, my son plays on a, you know. 12 year old hockey team so they're like mounting off the walls in there oh okay so yeah but the sg that you got i want I, I gotta hear that thing you should crank that up tonight before midnight <laughs> <laughs> i'd like to hear that yes yeah, so no, is, is, sg tim is Streamyard like zoom where it cuts off the music you can't play I don't know if because I've tried to no, play guitar I don't think, on No, Zoom. you can figure it out. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's test right now. Yeah. If you don't play it good, then they shouldn't. I'm trying to play no, guitar. Think, on. No, you can figure it out. Okay, oh yeah, I'm hearing you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. If you don't play it good, then they shouldn't. Oh yeah, I'm hearing you. Oh, yeah. yeah, that sounds good. If yeah. you don't play it good, what's the delay? What am I? What's this delay? I'm hearing. I, I, you know what? It's my microphone. Oh, okay. That's well, weird. Wait, what did I do? Tim, you're it's it's keep playing. Uh, you know what? It's my microphone. Oh. Okay, no, it's gonna be my microphone. Wait, what did I do? Tim, you're okay. Mute it for a second and see if it comes back on here. <laughs> Is it still doing it, Tim? No. Good. Is it still doing it? Tim? No. No. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
That was weird. That was like uh, still doing it no, no. Oh my gosh! Now my voice is feeding. It's it again. Yeah. <laughs> That was weird. That was Damn, what did you do? No, no. Oh my gosh! Now my voice is it it again. freaking me out. What is going on? That was weird. Okay. That was Damn, what did you do? No, no. Oh my gosh! Now my voice. Is Happy New Year. Freaking me out. What is going on? <laughs> okay, so I just muted my infinite delay. That's pretty. Okay, so cool that really fact. did. Uh, it de definitely did something there, Tim. They did. Uh, I missed. Like definitely did something there, Tim. Tim, yeah, it's your your your. <laughs> you I think uh, your is like, is uh, making a piece. Yeah, maybe you have to to come back on or something. That was really weird. John, your SG is. Uh, do you ever you play your SG right? Yeah, I got it from a very renowned uh, YouTuber, actually. <laughs> no, but you play a lot. You you do use it on your gigs, don't you? I try not to because one uh, hit on a mic stand, it could be over with. But I, wait, mean, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Wait, you run in your mic stands a lot? <laughs> You've seen my band. We play for like hours. So we're True. like delirious at the end of the night. Lord, I've never made it through one of John's. Not, I've never even gotten to the end of the first set of any of his gigs I've come to because they play an hour and a half set, two hour and a half sets. That's what we do. What's wrong with that? Oh my God. Lord, he's actually left before we started playing, though. That's what, the other thing. How long are your sets? <laughs> What's the set? That's that's kind of your basic set. How, like, how long are your Like, sets? if you've ever seen the E Street Band, we're like, yeah, they you know, play like, like our three warm up four act, hours. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. We just go, like no right. break. That's how Let's we just are. Keep going. That's how we are. No break. No right. break. Let's just keep going. Yes, because the crowd yeah. may leave if you stop. <laughs> yeah, we well, right. Your crowd yeah. may leave, but ours. The Ward. I always say to John, "Listen, I'm going to come to the show tonight, but I I won't be there when you're. I might not even be there when you're done with the first set." Well, what's the set to you? An hour? What? How long is the set? No. Ours is at least an hour. Oh, no, I'm talking, about Rick. Hour I'm talking about Rick. I'm not talking about no. you, John. I'm talking about Rick. What you yeah, say, one plus minutes. 30 set is too long? He's that's in kind for 25 of, minutes. That's fleet average. 25 minutes? That's after the music starts. You might be there 10 minutes before that. So yeah. 35 minutes is his max, I would say. Yeah. I only stay that long if I'm, you know, if I was watching, uh, you know, no, I mean, if it was somebody that he really loved, he would, you know, he might stay. I'd stay for the whole minutes. show. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Perhaps not. All right, Tim, how do you read? Tim, how's is it working, Tim? Sound? Yeah, it's working fine now. Yeah. Okay, good. That was, uh, that was really crazy. It is actually it was so stupid that I'm not going to tell you what actually happened. I know exactly what happened. <laughs> But it's a level of stupidity that, you know, I can't share with you. I love it. I love it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I did that during Sam, my live Sam, stream. Um, I, I had my wife as the moderator, and, and <laughs> we had a loop going on. It was kind of ugly. A studio musician of your accomplishments, that's, like, completely unacceptable. Of course, it is. But, it's unacceptable. And... Yeah, <laughs> but but totally entertaining at the same time. Well, at least, at least it was that, right? Yeah. 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 To be, Mr. Big Shot was ready with his guitar and look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tim, in 20, uh, I, I'm going to go around and ask all three of you this. What is one piece of gear that you're going to buy that you really want to get in 2024? Is there anything that you can think of that is, is a wish list in 2024? Tim, you start. Well, uh, I'm going to bend your question. Um, okay. Fender is going to make me a custom guitar, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be a custom Jazzmaster style guitar with P90s, but the, the pick guard will be interchangeable with their full range pickups, with, which are the humbuckers that were in the Tele specials that were, you know, the, the cold play guitar. You know, the yeah. humbucker with three screws on each. The big humbuckers. Yeah, right? the big humbuckers. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's going to be chambered, and it's going to have a Gibson scale. It's going to be very unique. Really, really looking forward to that. 
And um, I have a couple more heritage guitars coming that are to my specifications, which is the, um, they have the 60s um, slim taper neck and particular high medium jumbo fret, which feels really good. Um, so those are coming. Uh, I'll let, let's go around and, and hit me twice. Hit me again. <laughs> John. Tim, you're only allowed one, actually. So you named like three. Uh, but... okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to say a uh, Gibson um, J180 cutaway uh, okay. from early 2000s. Um, bigger, bigger body guitar. Tim, you probably have one, right? You might have one. You don't have one. Cutaway. Right. So J180, is it electric? Or is it 185 or 180? Because I have an acoustic. It's, no, it's a, it's an acoustic. Oh, okay. I do yeah. have one of those. You mean the J one hundred and sixty, the John Lennon one? No, no, no. I think it's one hundred and eighty or one hundred and eighty-five. I might be wrong yeah, on that. So I have to Google have that, one. but you do. Yeah, I would. Do you want to sell it? <laughs> I unfortunately could, do not. We could we could close the deal before the end of the night. <laughs> That's a great guitar. Get another wire. You should. You should. Um, you should have I, one I, I think I I think I want one of those. Um, it's just kind of on my kind of wish list. Um, as far as pedals go, you know, my wife got me a pedal for Christmas. Isn't that like I what? Mean, what everybody wants? She did. She got me a GHS. Um, it's one of those three series, the octave up down uh, reverb pedals. So I'm excited about that. So I had it before the end of the year. So if that's allowable. Okay. Ward. But, uh, I want the Jubilee head of this series, the 20 watt. And I'm going to get that. And I may get the cabinet to go with it just because you want the matching tool. Kind, of, kind of do Ward. If you had the two, if you had the two amps next to each other there. Yeah. I, that will never happen because none of the stages we play are big enough for that. No, I'm um, saying in the background of your video. Oh, yeah. For your shoot, you got to have a, you got to get the Rick Beato thing behind you. Yes. I like it. Well, I need a Rick Beato guitar right here. Yes, yeah, we'll get to exactly. we'll get one there. Um, but there. no, if I get that, it'll I'll keep it at my drummer's house, which is where we practice. So I don't have to lug this head back and forth. Um, and that's probably the one I would use live. Um, so that's that's my, you know, I think I'm good for guitars for right now, but I need I need another amp. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, um, Alan Hines says hi to John and Tim. Hi, Alan. And Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, buddy. Happy New Year. Alan. Um, okay, so, um, and Alan, we're, I'm going to have you on. You're going to come here and, we're, and we'll make a video. Alan, it's amazing. Okay, amazing. so, okay, so um, I, I love Alan. He's, he's the best. Um, but right, I'm looking at the piece of gear that I want to get right now um, in 2024, and it's right behind Tim's shoulder. What is it? Yes, the Fender. Yeah. What is that? A basement? Basement. Tuxedo basement. Yeah, yes. tuxedo basement. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Very that's nice. that's one of the things that I want to get for this year. I don't need it, but I've wanted one forever. It's all that um, matters, <laughs> right? So nobody um, needs anything. Nobody yeah. needs anything. So somebody just uh, did a super chat and said, "I'm from the UK. Just got here. Happy New Year." Have you spoke about what the best Oasis album is yet? My favorite is Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. Well, um, what's the story? Morning Glory is the best Oasis album. So that's that's uh, that, that was an easy uh, easy answer to that. Um, somebody says, uh, and if and if you're in the chat and you want to you want to put in what your um, pieces of gear that you want to. Uh, uh, to get in 2024, um, we would be happy to see that. Uh, I, um, I'm going to practice a lot more in 2024. That's one of my. Uh, Me too. One of my things. Me too. Wow. No Me too. I got to practice, guys. Yes. Me too. We're all going to practice. Uh, and uh, and I'm going to make. Um, Definitely do some recordings this year for sure, or next year. We still have we still have right. uh, fifty two minutes. So, 
Well, I'm going to oh, sign up because because I, you know, I'm I'm. In Looks the like it's really here. swollen now, John. It's it's yeah, it's pretty good. But you know what? I love you guys all, uh, all of you guys. But Alan Hines said hi to me tonight, so that makes my night complete, and I can rest well into 2024. So I'll say good night to everybody and uh, Tim and Ward. God bless. And bro, I'll talk to you in the morning. So all right, see ya. See you, John. Bye. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, John. Um, so, um, I'm ready, Rick. What, come on, let's go with the hard hitting questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I make a, I make, make, make a, I want a Moochie. Who won the Moochie Awards? Uh, this year? Um, so it was won by the, the guest with the most views in a single episode was a guy named Brad Penniston. And the guest of the year was a repeat winner, a guy named Justin Bronk in London. So he's my Ukraine war expert. Yes. And, uh, yes. He's done, he's done good work. Good. He's been taking some big hits lately. Um, and so I, I'm protective of him. Um, but uh, he soldiers on. The guy's super smart. He's a, he's a wunderkind. So he won it second year in a row. So, you know, I thought about this, about, uh, you know, how you do your awards your awards ward that um, of, of the most views. So if I did an award for the most views of, of interviews, Tim Pierce is definitely the winner of that because we have millions and millions of views. We have multiple videos that have over a million views. I don't know, Tim, are, are our videos interviews though? Yes, they are. <clears throat> yes, they are interviews. And I, I interview love- Tim. There, there's, a level of uh, closeness that's kind of, I don't know why we roll so powerfully when we get together, but luckily some people have been interested. Now, the, it could be that we have completely exhausted our body of knowledge at this point, and uh, no. I hope that's not the case because I know you're coming over in, in uh, January, so. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so we'll have, to have, ready. We'll, we'll have to find a good topic, but um, yeah, but the... Uh, um yeah they are interviews uh it's just been nice because we both ran the gauntlet of the music business and for anybody who's you know wondering what that's like it's pretty uh it's pretty intense i made not as intense as flying a jet aircraft but no no it's it is equally intense no doubt um different ways i uh uh I, you know, when Steve was here, Steve Morris was here, he was, um, um, he offered to take me for a ride in his plane, which I was, you know, I was uh, something that I'm not, not a big fan of flying. I mean, I don't hate flying or anything, but, um, but I've never been in a small plane before. Um. Well, one time I was in a prop plane flying in a ice storm from um, from New York to Burlington, Vermont, and that was not fun. And uh, it was a pretty small plane, and I thought, mm, I'm thinking I'm gonna stay away from these small planes. Sounds like the Buddy Holly story, right? <laughs> you just uh, wonder, you know, what, 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 what? You just don't want that one bad luck moment to happen while you're on the ride right you know it's like this, this you know uh, well i mean that'd be kind of cool if you die with steve morse right no we don't want the legendary anything that'd be great it's the like merch. oh yeah he was killed like, flying with steve morse that's like when i flew the blue angels people are like you afraid you're gonna crash i'm like that would be an awesome way to die he, he was killed flying with the blue angels are you kidding me you're kind of right you're right kinda, yeah. you know um, you're right. So, so I want to talk a little bit about YouTube here. We talked a little bit about it earlier about the, um, board show Tim, the, uh, the, your, the screen machine. You, what's it at now? Is it over 700,000? Oh, I don't know. Let's look. Okay. So or, um, Tim Ward, uh, I, I watched his video that he put out this morning, Tim. And, when I watched it, it had 85,000 views and it was probably, I probably an hour into it. Maybe 
here's a weird thing though. As I'm watching it, Ward, it went 85,000. And then by the time I, I finished the video, it was over a hundred thousand. It jumped while I was watching it. I didn't even have to refresh. Yeah. I mean, I was working on my live stream assets right after I posted it. And the first time I looked at it, it was at 93,000. I'm like, this has got to be, there's got to be a, this is wrong. You know, that just yeah. the number was just like, Oh my God, how is that possible? Right. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It struck a nerve. It's a good thumbnail, you know, and I think the topic is resonating um, with people right now about this whole Houthi thing. And, you know, okay. But I want to, I want to talk about the, the, about the, you can only talk about this with other YouTubers. Okay. And when you put out a video, the, the, the relief of getting it out, which is immediately followed by the dread of, you know, either the, um, you know, that there's going to be a, a next thing that you're going to do. And it's like, what is, what are you going to, what are you going to make the video on? Or, um, or even when you film something and it's, you know, you've done an interview with somebody that's an hour and 30 minutes long, and then, you know, you're going to have all these assets to put in there and you have to do the camera switches and you have to do all this stuff and just the, the, um, and you never think that you can get these things done, but then you always do and you put it out and then you have, then you're faced with the same thing. And I remember Ward, you saying this to me when you first started and, but you started posting a lot of stuff. He's like, how do you keep doing this? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the arc of what you've just described um, reminds me of what it takes to write a novel, you know? And so you start off with this sort of, you know, entering onto this great journey and there's all this optimism. And then you get to the middle part where it's drudgery and you're convinced it sucks, you know, and it's inconsequential. Mm -hmm. And then in the end game, you're like, well, maybe this is pretty good. And then you give it to the world and they decide. So that arc happens instead of writing a hundred thousand word novel over a year, this happens over 24, 48 hours, three, four times a week. That's what being a YouTuber is. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the audience gets the vote, the final vote, you know, today I was not planning on doing that episode. I, I didn't even have it in my scan when I started the day. And then I was like, you know, helicopter shooting, like sinking Houthi craft is a big deal. That's a, that's a, a new wrinkle in this war. That's a new platform that's been involved and, and so forth and so on. So I'm like, I got to do this. And, and so I, put this together literally like I texted you, Rick. I yeah. put that episode together in an hour. You know, yeah, because so, you were busy, you were getting ready for your for yeah. your live stream tonight. And I used I used some um I used a previous interview that I had with two two H60 helicopter guys down at the air show a couple of months ago and that episode bombed. Um and so I used that as sort of an explainer about what does this helicopter do in terms of agility. Boom, make it live. And I think it had a cool thumbnail. And I think people are kind of interested about this topic because this war against the Iranian proxies is growing and, and, and it's getting more and more uh, involved. And we're getting drawn in a way that I think people are concerned, you know, rightfully so. It has nothing to do with the Israel Hamas war at this point. It's a completely separate conflict. And so I think all of those things led to this velocity and it's it's you know every time i refresh or look at it it's it's another fifty thousand views higher okay yeah. so but but the tim i'll go to you here the the what ward's describing about the making a video right the 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 highs and lows of this of what we do here um what, talk talk about that about the what what it yeah I mean you'll many times call me Tim and you'll be in the middle of a video and wait is Tim frozen oh he's back go. he's back okay the highs and what what did you say the, the highs and lows of of you know sometimes you'll be in the middle of an edit of a video and you'll think is this any good 
Well, you know, the thing is, everybody has a completely different game. And uh, Ward, you are the man of the moment in a lot of ways, and you have exactly what we need in this moment. And it, I'm not surprised that that happened today. Um, it, you know, for me, I've been doing this a long time, probably longer than, I've been doing it longer than you, Rick, right? Yeah. And, yeah. <clears throat> couple years longer you know i'm super slow at it but this has been my best year ever on youtube i have a couple of things i do i do a production video and i do a live stream the live streams i do a lot of research and rehearsal and pre preparation so i get the facts right which you were talking about ward you know people are really quick when when you don't have a fact right they come come at you hard a lot of them you know and they just keep doing it as the, the video builds so what happens to me is if i'm doing a production video uh, if it's an interview with somebody, it's really arduous because I try and make them look amazing and I try and add energy to an interview, which is usually not very energetic. OK, so uh, so I really I really craft the energy <laughs> level. <laughs> I really craft the uh, the the interview. I don't do a lot of them anymore for that reason, too, because I, I really, really kind of over I try and keep keep them moving and uh so they are arduous but when i do a production video and it's about anything literally if if i, I i'll work on it when you say production you mean video on demand tim like no a, what i mean is not a live stream yeah not, I mean, yeah right yeah video on demand or regular video yeah regular video yeah uh it's a mess until about two days before i finish it i mean it's a mess and it's it's just a just a bunch of dead weight and confusion. <laughs> yes. And then yes, you know, just keep keep. I replace parts. I change parts around. I cut parts, and then a couple of days before I finish it, it's like, oh, I don't hate it anymore. At least I don't hate it anymore. And then the next couple of days, I really try and and build on that and get it up to speed. And then there's the whole gut-wrenching moment when you release, and for whatever reason, you get a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. Now I've had that happen and I'll just pull it down after 15 minutes, go back a few days later with a new title, a new thumbnail, uh, and it'll it'll do better. Uh, just because of maybe the environment is not, doesn't want any on a Saturday morning, the environment is too competitive or people are not watching. I'll put it out again with a different ad campaign different thumbnail title on a tuesday morning and it'll go uh but and then i'll even make peace with uh, an underperforming video but usually by the second day my stomach starts to really bother me and i have to start changing the title and thumbnail so that i can try and save it so i really do try and save an underperforming video and i usually can uh yes but I, I go to a really, I go to extreme tastelessness with, with the title and the thumbnail. And, and that's, it never, that doesn't feel good, but at least it feels good not to have a video that's failed. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> Ward, I love that Tim is so <laughs> honest about this stuff. Well, I'm, I mean, thinking, no, I, I I'm thinking, what I are the totally repercussions relate. of people hearing this? I don't think there are any. I mean, it's like we're, we're, a, we're a club. Those of us, you know, the three of us and everybody else, we're, we're a club. So, so I, yeah. I don't ever, um, I pretty much make my videos other than the interviews. My videos are just made at, just at once. Yeah. So they're, and I make my videos sequentially where I, you know, I know what I want to talk about and I know what the beginning and end is, is, and, and what the steps are. So, so there's really, there is no, um, I don't work on the things over and over because I, I have, I pretty much have the narrative in mind and I just make the video and I've always done that. I don't know if I know how to make videos any other way. Um, so I don't either. I mean, that's part of it. You can't, you honestly, once you figure your out your process, you kind of have to keep doing it that way. I yeah. Can't. Um, we have a, a super chat here that says uh, from Tom, 
Fellow YouTuber here, I know the struggle all too well. Tell Mooch hello for me. I did his ending theme song. Huge fan of you and Tim, Rick and Tim. Tom, nice to meet you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, Tom also warmed up Danger Boy this year at Moochie Palooza. He's a great guitarist and vocalist and composer. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, you guys talk for one second because my dog. Well, that, that's the thing. You guys, you guys are better at this than I am. So I have to work harder, but I do okay. I mean, it's just everybody has their way of of getting their, you know, their broadcast done. You know, it's like uh, I love the live streams because they're easier for me. And I, although I do pre prepare and rehearse, I mean, Tim, your live streams are like, come on, your live streams are so well prepared that. Yeah. that it's um that they are they're just like a regular video but I, i'm i'm at peace with the whole thing now because i only do two videos a month and everything motors along just just fine and uh a, a lot of people don't realize that when i say it because they see they 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 perceive that there are more videos coming out uh but like i said it's different for everybody everybody does and i've been doing this a long time you know so this works for me it, it, it gets the eyeballs over to the subscription, you know, education membership site, which is my entire, you know, formula. So, well, the, the, um, the, I can relate to the stuff that Ward does with the long interviews and editing those. And they are, um, it doesn't matter how interesting the people are. There's, there are just technical things of getting, you know, when you're dealing with, I, I'm interviewing people that are playing in here. So their audio is being recorded in the control room. Their labs need to be muted when they, when they're playing. Uh, sometimes they're talking over the playing as they're demonstrating things. So those have to be mixed. So there's all these different um, elements that, um, I mean, when Andy Summers was playing, he didn't have any effects on his guitar. I put the effects on. He played just with a straight, clean tone, and I just put the effects on afterwards. Um, and I told him that I would do that. So I said, "Ah, oh, don't worry about. It. I'll put the I'll put the uh, I'll put the effects on after." Even though he had pedals there and everything, he didn't want to mess with that. So he just played the parts, and I just made it sound like what it would sound like. Great right. particular songs, you know, and but the just even the the camera changes and things like that the things that people don't that probably they don't care about but it really makes the conversation roll along and ward you know that you've done things with people that are that were where you really have to save the thing that that they may like tim says some people that are maybe not that interesting yet you can make somebody interesting just by the edit yeah. Well, I relate to what Tim was saying about it's a mess, right? It, when, when you're done, when you're done with the conversation and you have all these assets and this B-roll, you're like, this is just a mess. And and you're not sure how you can salvage it, you know, um, but you start to shape it and trim it and, you know, bring it up to where it needs to be. And suddenly it emerges like, oh, maybe this is better than I thought at first blush and then by the time you're done like okay i think this is actually pretty good but that process i mean i almost every episode i'm like even the interview with admiral mullen um you know i'm like this is just a rambling like who's gonna care it goes all kinds of different places there's tributaries there's sidebar conversations there's thinking out loud and then you start to sort of make the guest better than they were alive by sort of it's not what you said it's what you meant to say and i'm going to make you through the edit you know and like you said cutaways and you know sharp editing and i, I think i've in my poor man's iMovie version have gotten good at at being able to do that using yeah. multiple you know drop in an asset to hide a, a, a an awkward cut or you know a closer view of the person um, all these kinds of tricks that make it, you know, the final product is very tight and, and, you know, that's work. That's where the work happens. Yeah. You know, 
And, it's and filmmaking. Like, how long do you spend? Whether yes, they're like, how long do you spend on these? I'm like, it varies by episode. Right, as long um, as you need to. But an but an asset heavy episode, um, it's probably a hundred hours for every one hour of shooting. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. macrame. It's macrame. You're you're stitching. You know, you're pushing out a an hour long video three seconds at a time. You know, and 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 that's onerous. That's that is drudgery, if, especially if you're against a, a deadline. Like if I have something that's time sensitive, like I'm afraid the competition is going to post this before I do, then then it's it starts to get a little bit not fun, um, and because you you're working against the clock, and uh, you know that's 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 a tough gig. Um, so you know. I mean, this isn't easy. What we do, it's not easy, and and my friends can't quite figure out how I walked away from my day job, you know, because I have a bunch of straight nerds as friends. <laughs> you know, I mean, guys who come from my pedigree are not given to this creative thing and 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 venturing off in the unorthodox. You know, these are straights. These are day job guys. You know, they fly airplanes for twenty or thirty years and then they go work for the defense industry. You know, and so it's pretty that path is pretty straightforward so they can't quite figure it out and when we meet at tailgaters at football games or whatever they're like what is it you're doing now <laughs> you know it doesn't even they can't Dude, how many out. people call it a podcast what? yeah yes yes what's this thing your blog no they call it my blog so <laughs> how's your blog doing like what is this 2002 yeah, what, what, a blog that. what are you even talking about tim you've yeah. heard this right about people calling things blogs and 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 podcasts and stuff yeah, they they really don't understand how it works. They don't understand how hard it is, and like everything else, they think it just takes you the time. If you have a ten minute video, they think it take took you ten minutes. Exactly. That same thing with music. Uh, but a lot of people have questions about how you make money, and that's different for everybody too. Uh, but Okay, wait. I'm gonna I'm gonna use I'm gonna use this segue right now, Tim. You get just gave me. A, I'm gonna interrupt you. I hate to do this, but I'm gonna bring Mike in for talking about making money. Mike, how much merch do we have left? This is our only time, Tim, that we sell merch. Let's see tonight. here. What's up, Tim? Mike, miss you, miss you greatly miss you too, man. Oh, there's only there's only one be or two beanies left, Rick. Including Come the on. one you're wearing. Come on, people. A few things of everything else. It's getting it's getting down there though. Okay, so this is our one night that we offer merch. Yep. Uh, Mike, you quickly show them again. This is our lovely uh like that. Like that hat. Okay. Yes. And then using it, using it to cover up my sweet hairstyle. Yeah. <laughs> The trucker hat, got to have that. Yeah. Yes. If it wasn't my own hat, I'd wear that. That's pretty stylish. I like that. It's nice. Okay. Uh, and then the t-shirts. My second favorite. Well, we're gonna we'll get to the t-shirts. This is my. This is, I use them to you know to insulate my Lacroix. <laughs> like that. I need Uzi's. one, Mike. Come on. Yes. Yeah, so do you need one? Okay. And then mm -hmm. we have our two shirts that we have. Everything yeah. music. Yeah. And then? And then the big piece. My daughter Lennon's design here. That's the one. Ooh, That's the one. Yes. that I like. Nice. Yep. You I can like see somebody one. wearing that. So uh, blue, just like the signature Les Paul. So that's it. So we're selling, we're selling the merch tonight. Uh, it's on the store. Go there and see what whatever's left. And uh, so there you go. All right, Mike, that's it. I'm going to pop you back off here. Happy New Year, Tim Ward, Brick, yeah. everybody else. Happy New Year. Yeah. See you in 2024. So um, <clears throat> you were saying, Tim. What was I saying? Uh, hold on one second. Before you before we even start. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Rick and Tim, for being part of my musical education. What do you do when you're stuck at a plateau? I think I think. I'm at like a starter stage of intermediate, but I still feel mechanical and like scaly. I'm not sure what scaly means. Probably use some moisturizer with that. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, okay, so just kidding. There, I mean, it was a joke. Okay, so I'll take that. Okay, good. So, first of all, play along with your favorite songs, and if you if there's a player that you consider a loose player that you'd like to emulate, spend time trying to mimic that player. Also, I would say if you start playing melodies on one string that can actually alleviate a lot of this because it all of a sudden if you play on one string it sounds fluid and connected yes. and and it stays simple and it is automatically a melody so that that's a cure uh, the other thing is maybe you're not playing enough blues. I mean, I started playing blues when I was 12 years old and that's all I played for, you know, seven or eight years and go back to the blues, do single string, simple melodies. Um, make sure you use pick dynamics. You punctuate a phrase. So the first note's loud. The second note's a little less loud. The third note's a little louder the last notes loud again. So it's just like the way you speak, punctuate your phrases, make sure that you're, you're hitting different notes louder than the others. And you know, there's a, you know, a simple general rule, the first note and the last note can be the loudest notes. That'll help. Um, make sure you're not rushing. Uh, make sure you're, Make sure your amp isn't a monotone of pure distortion or pure clean. Either one. If your amp is totally clean or totally distorted, you can't, there's no expression to be had. So, right. so have an amp that's at the, at the edge of breakup where you actually have bloom and dynamics so that when you hit a clean, when you hit a note soft, it's clean, it's simple. If your amp is set right, you can hit a note soft and it's clean and you hit it harder and it's dirty. Then there's all of these levels in between those two extremes where all this expression is. So that's another maybe cure. So those are some. And use your volume and tone knobs on your guitar also. That's the other thing. Seven. You know, yeah, seven is a good volume. Yes. Seven and eight. I I play my um my guitar sometimes at very, with the pickups down very low on them. Um couple other things here. Let's see here. New subscriber here. Really loving the New York New Year's Eve chat. Heard, heard the UK culpa and the Cardi deck. If so, what are your thoughts? Possible video. Happy New Year. Anybody? Cardiacs? Ward? Negative. I have not heard of the Cardiacs. Okay. I I uh, Hold on. We'll come back to that. Thank you for your time and effort putting in the creating content. We generally enjoy uh, if. If it was pre-YouTube, I'd be bringing a six-pack and cigars to your, pick your brain and talk more about The Cure. Have an excellent year. Um, I love The Cure. I met Robert Smith one time, and he was incredibly cool. There's my Cure story. Um, so I thought about the um, – I've been thinking about this tonight, about the the – 2024 and uh, I'm going to be 62 in uh, four months. Youngster. And um, it's interesting that we all three share this in common. Other, you know, and Keith, who was on earlier, that all four of us are in our 60s. What are your thoughts, Tim? Well, it's the best time I've ever had in my life. It's my favorite chapter of life. Uh, it, it comes with physical limit. I mean, you really got to take care of yourself. You really, really got to take care of yourself. You got to eat and exercise and sleep and go to the doctor and, and keep this thing. Science, science, you know, depend on science. Um, I love it. I love being 65. Uh, I have a little less energy than I used to, but I guess, you know, I always used to read about Ray Kroc who created McDonald's when he was in his sixties or seventies or whatever. And it's like, and there was another, there's an author who named Tony Hillerman, who was in New Mexico, who did these really successful mystery novels when he was in his late sixties and seventies. And I don't know, it's, 
it's pretty amazing to have a a mission a mission like this at this age i i I took a vacation in October, and when you know when you take a vacation, you look back at your life and you go, uh, wow, I really am doing the right thing. Hanging out in my studio and just that routine that I'm living, it's the right thing. You know, I went over to Europe for two weeks, and I, I'm looking back at this life that I live, which is not an, an exciting life. There's nothing exciting about it, really. I mean, I used to play with Phil Collins and Bruce Springsteen and all these people. That's not happening right now. But... <laughs> The, the 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 great thing i look back at my life here and i'm i'm doing the right thing you know puttering around the studio trying to get stuff done buying guitars selling guitars you know um answering emails you know i'm i'm super happy i'm grateful i guess the message for me is uh you know this i thought this would be my plan b it's become my plan a and happier than I'm happier now than I was in my session career, which was, uh, it was great, but it came with a lot of pressure. And at, at this age, I, I don't need the pressure. I don't need the stress because that will kill you. The, the stress will kill you at this age. So anyway. Ward? Right. Well, I think Tim just Thank put you, it beautifully. That's, that's exactly how I feel. Uh, I think we're all living our best lives uh, but the ability to do, do that is leveraging everything we did before. So, you know, as a young man, I, I was in fighter squadrons and, and was able to do things that were pretty cool and that I'm trading on now. But I'm not unhappy. I'm happier, as Tim said. I think I'm happier than I've ever been. You know, I'm living my best life um, as a function of what we're able to do now. I, I've lost a sense of time. You know, I, I, I agree with Tim, you got to watch, you know, nutrition and exercise. And I wake up kind of like the tin man, you know, and it takes me a while to get going. Um, and, uh, however, when I, in my case, when I look at, we call them year groups, when I look at what year groups are now commanding fighter squadrons or what year groups are now the admirals it kind of freaks me out because I don't feel like I've aged as these guys who were my junior officers have now are now two and three star admirals. And I run into them around, you know, different conventions or whatever. Um, that's where it hits you. Like 10, 20 years has gone by and I I'm not feeling it at all. You know, so I'm sort of into this suspended animation, which is maybe a function of having this YouTube channel where I'm just this guy that, is the raconteur of everybody else's sort of lives and, and, and accomplishments. Um, and so I'm like, even my Academy classmates, I'm like, you guys really got old. You look old. You know? and I'm like, <laughs> I'm Peter Pan. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm this hip dude who's on the internet, you know, doing this thing, you know, and making a living at it. So I don't know. This is a gift. What we're able to do is a gift. Um, and, um, but I think Tim, Tim put it exactly right in terms of the, the sort of state of mind uh, that, that I'm in. I, I agree entirely with what he was saying there. So I am looking right now, when I look at myself here, I haven't shaved in a few days, and I see this guy with a white beard and white hair. And I, I think, wow, when did that happen? And... It's, I don't know why 62, that sounds kind of, um, it just seems, it, it seems impossible that I could be 62 years old now. Like, where is this time gone? I, you know, and I, I have a white beard now. I'm going to be saying, I'm. I'm past Christmas. I'm going to be Santa Claus next year if I don't shave for a year. Um, hold on. I got a... Um, uh, <laughs> this is my accountant, Alan, my dear friend. Hello, my favorite guitar player. Just got home from dinner and tuned in. Did you make your fourth quarter estimated payments yet? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yes, yes, he did. We know. He told us all about it, and and uh, he was he was in agony, but, but he did it. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, 
Brian, thank you very much. Appreciate that. I like that. That's um uh hold on, man. This thing keeps going down. Where how do you Ward, what do you how do you get to the bottom of the chat here? Okay, I guess I'm there now. You scroll down. Okay, yeah. You I um don't shave for a year, Rick. So I uh have only only one time in my life did I not shave for a year, and that was when I had my huge beard that was down below where well, it was down to you can't even see it was long i long remember that yeah it was black though you, you had yes. black hair then. yeah that's a yes. great photo. i love that photo yeah so i um that was my beard i i didn't shave for 11 months and two weeks i actually did not make it to a year a year they call it a yeared <laughs> who knew right so i almost made it that far but i shaved it off and um uh, if I did this, if I let this grow for one year, it would look like, um, you'd be like Rick Rubin. I'd be a wizard. Gandalf. I would be Gandalf. Yes. Um, so I don't know if I will, if I will do it, but, uh, but it looks kind of cool right now. Yeah. It's a good look. Um, let's see here. Leland Scalar Beato. So I am I'm coming out to visit Tim in Los Angeles coming up soon. And um uh I always enjoy my trips to California. I always enjoy visiting Tim. The first I my here's my routine every time I go to LA. I fly there, I go from the airport, I drop my stuff off at my hotel, and I go immediately to Tim's place and we make a video. It's so fun, yeah. So, and I walk in and sometimes I bring my camera, sometimes I don't, and we'll use Tim's camera. And, um, and we set up two chairs and we decide what guitars we're going to hold. Cause usually we hold guitars and don't play. <laughs> I'm going to play this time though. Cause I've read how you like your players to play. So I'm going to be ready to play. Last time I think I held a black Les yeah. Paul custom. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. and then what should we talk about, Tim? I don't know. Well, uh, let me just start the camera is usually what I say. Yeah, we usually come up with something or you change your mind and come up with something. Entirely. Well, we come up with something and then as soon as I get there, I change my mind. Yeah, you, you do that. You do that a lot, yeah. It's pretty much I do that all the time. Yeah, I, I, that's I, kind I, of make... abnormal for Rick, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, here's what I make a video on and then I'll talk to Ward in the morning and then three hours later I put out a video. Wait, what was that video on? I thought you were going to do it on this or that. No, or in the room when we show up. You're like... <laughs> Here's the idea. You're like, no, that will not work. Let's do this. <laughs> okay, hold on. We got another super debt. John, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, John. Wow, amazing. Sweet coin. Appreciate that. Uh, we only have um, about 13 minutes left in the new year. And on the sale, my uh, my bundle is, um, is for sale. My Beato bundle is for sale for another 13 minutes here. Ultimate bundle. Mike's putting it in the chat. <laughs> Um, follow these two gentlemen, gentlemen, if you already don't, I think that, uh, that obviously Tim's been on my channel so many times, everybody here knows Tim, but Ward, Ward Carroll on YouTube, please follow. Um, it's, it's, uh, 2024, you know, I remember sitting in study hall in 1979 and thinking, having a conversation with one of my buddies about, man, can you imagine living to the year 2000? What is that going to be like? We're going to be flying around in cars. We're going to be doing this and that. Like, what, 2000? I can't even imagine the year 2000. And we're a quarter of a century just about past the year 2000. Wow. Yeah, the time really does speed up and you you the age thing it's like an awakening that comes out of nowhere and takes you by surprise. Because and and I know both you guys still feel the same as you did when you were 25. Yes. Barring the wake up in the morning, I feel the same way. It's like you got to get moving in the morning, but but the age thing boy, it just it you and at this point you really really are aware of uh, how quickly it descends or, you know, and, and that's part of it. That's, that's part of the, the, uh, 
you know, the conundrum. It's it's just it's like all of the sudden you're 60 and your your hair's white. Yeah. All of a sudden. Well, I I see it. I mean, I remember when my kids were babies. Dylan's 16 yeah. now. He's got a beard and a mustache and and um and I did, you know, I've been jamming with the kids playing you know Lennon on the bass, Layla on drums and Dylan on guitar and me on guitar. And that's like the most fun thing imaginable, playing rock music with your kids. I mean, stand by folks, that's going to be a dimension of the channel that is going to break the internet once he gets this squared away. I'm not kidding. That's I, great I, stuff. I, I, um, it's it's really that is just fun to see the 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 them just rocking out it's it's i just crack up when i when we're doing it you know and uh and they love the power of it there's nothing that that like <clears throat> playing in an ensemble playing loud music with guitar bass and drums oh my god well i mean we all remember the first time you were in a, a band and and that magic happened across the room you know um, it, it's, it's power. Like you said, it's a powerful feeling. And then once you have it, you, you want it for life. Yeah. The first time playing with a drummer and a bass player that, that man, just right. Tim. Yeah. The early days when, when you hear and feel and, and you're, you're locked, you're locked with other musicians. And, and then when you start to play, when, you know, it's one thing to, to play with musicians, but when you begin to encounter great musicians, yes, and uh, and so, and you're all of a sudden you're playing with a great drummer, and you go, oh my god, this is a different level. And then you're playing with a bass player who can sing lead like nobody's business and play bass at the same time. You go, oh my, this is a different level. That's that that for me was the next thing. You know, I played with musicians, but then I I was you know lucky enough to play with musicians who were extraordinary you know and and then you then you rise you're, you're you naturally your pocket gets better your dynamics get better and your taste and your tone get better it's it's wonderful it really is you make me want to do it again i mean part of this age is the regression to looking at it almost almost like it's a hobby again it's a, a dream again it's you know i i love it like when I was 12 again, and that's another, that's one of the, uh, the other benefits of this, this chapter. Yeah. I I'm uh, when, when we come downstairs and play, I, I, it makes me realize when I did my billionaire reunion here and then playing with the kids, how much I miss playing with other people. Well, and Ward's doing it. He's the uh, Ward he's is the, doing more it. Than you and me. I, right. I'm not doing, I should be doing it. I used to do, you know, it's like, I don't have the band. Ward, you're doing it. You're Ward, doing you're it. the only one gigging out of, out of us here, really. <laughs> well, because I, I have to, right? It's just it's, it's a fundamental part that what we're talking about. I remember. Yeah. I have, ne I have never done it to the level. When, when Tim's talking about playing with these, you know, world-class musicians. But for me, it was in middle school, and I was living in Holland at the time, and we played, we would start the set with Evil Ways. And we played that opening riff and it just sounded fantastic. And I remember looking at some of the girls in the audience and they were like moved and you're like, Oh my God, this is it. This is what I want. You know, just a minor D and then Annie Benson was the lead player and he played that there, 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 there. And it just sounded so good, you know? Um, and, and so that's what you want to capture like in perpetuity. And, and so I, I, I can't not be in a band, you know, and, and so I'm always seeking guys who are of like mind and I'm fortunate enough to have uh, some other dudes in my current band that are exactly like me, you know, at least, right. And so it's important. It's important. It matters. Um, and practicing every Tuesday night is like therapy and religion, you know, and, and, and so, you know, we're not going to set the world on fire. It's a cover band you know, but it's really, really important. And I've never been a better guitarist either than I am now. Um, that's the other thing that I really enjoy is pushing myself like that. You know, the, the thing that I, when I've had people like Andy Summers in here, it's, 
and any of the people I've interviewed, these Dude, you've, had them, you've had all of them at this point. Yes. You've and, had them and, all. And, and to think, you know, he was in the studio playing these parts of these songs I've listened to a billion times, you know? And yeah, you can't even process it. that. You can't even process it. You can't process it. It's really, no. I'm, I wonder what it's, how they process it. You know, and I said to him in my interview, I said, you know, people don't, I think a lot of people don't think about the fact that these songs start with a blank tape. Yes, there's the idea in the song, but you actually put these parts down in time that people are so used to hearing them, but it's, but there was an actual performance that you did in the studio that we hear that one performance, maybe with a couple punch-ins or whatever, but you know, and it's difficult. I mean, Stairway to Heaven was played one time, you know, the, that. And Bonham was probably sitting there reading the paper while Jimmy Page is playing the intro, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it was edited together. But but uh, maybe they're just sitting around thinking, oh, when am I going to come in here? Do I come in here? And, you know, these songs music happens it's just not created out of thin air and it has to be recorded and, and the things that you listen to and the, that's the thing that blows my mind when i'm interviewing these people that that they were there at the creation of these songs i've listened to my whole life or this music and they uh, um and it's just kind of hard to wrap your head around. Well, Tim, how do you how do you process it being in the room at certain moments in these songs that endure? What how does that seem to you when you look back? Is are you you able to be in the moment or is it like a different person? Where does that live? Uh there was kind of a sixth sense when I moved here from Albuquerque and I would it took about a decade but I started ending up in rooms with people who are my heroes. Like uh, I was in the room with Peter Cetera recording a Peter Cetera solo record. And I'd listened to him sing with Chicago for a million times. And I knew that something we did was going to get played on the radio. So I got there early and I tried really hard to, to be the best guitar player they'd ever experienced, which was, you know, impossible. But I tried, you know, I tried to be or at least the most uh, motivated guitar player they could, you know, find or whatever. So it was a, a fantastic era. I mean, probably the greatest, a few really great moments. But when I showed up to work with Phil Collins, he was in the room tuning his drums when I walked into the room. And he starts hitting the toms and it is that sound. It's in the air tonight. It's that wow. sound. It's the I only mean, sound he makes. Right. He only that's, makes that sound. sound when he hits yeah. the drums. Yeah, that's it. And, and, and he has that pocket. And and I'm sitting here going, I if you'd have told me this was going to happen to me when I was a little kid, and that's happened to me a lot. So I, I was lucky in the 80s and the 90s to actually end up in rooms with people that I thought were my heroes. And then even in later days, you know, I, I'm doing a video now, getting a video going about Glenn Campbell, and I got to do a Glenn Campbell record and, and do the Grammys with Glenn. And, and I was a fan of his in the 60s, you know, and... Uh, and even some really crazy ones. I was a huge Three Dog Night fan. Oh, okay? I love Three Dogs. A little yeah. kid, and that band just sent me to the moon. Yes. And then I, you know, I ended up having Chuck Negron doing his solo records here in this room, you know. And I'm looking at him going, if you'd have told me when I was eight or ten years old, listening to One is the Loneliest Number. That I'd be in, yeah, I'd be in a room with the man, you know, who sang. I, so... So it is, it's amazing. It, it, it really is. It's amazing. I, I wish it for everybody who can, you know, have their version of that. Um, but you're right. It's music is recorded. It's like a snapshot of what's happening in the moment. And it really happened in that moment. And in some cases it was live, Rick. Yeah. And, and then overdubbed, you know, and made, made sweeter, you know, uh, but in a lot of cases, especially with the late sixties, early seventies, early eighties stuff. Those are performing. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so I have to break in here. We have uh, one minute and 25 seconds left into 2023. Um, 
It's 11.58. I have a, a timer here, whoops, here that uh, is counting down. Can you guys see this? Yes. 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 <laughs> so I can't believe it. <clears throat> are we going to hear? Uh, I, I, see, the people that are on here are not watching the ball drop. They're watching us. And we have 54 seconds, 53, 52, 51. Man, I can't even believe this. 51. 2023 is going to going to be in the uh, record books here in, in uh, 40 seconds or so. Pretty crazy, right? Greetings from Amsterdam. I love, I love New York for three years. I lived in The Hague for three years. When I got up today, I was I look. I have a friend that lives in Sydney, Australia, and it was already two thirty in the morning. It was already New Year, and you know, I was thinking, man, it's already, already twenty happened. seconds, nineteen seconds. Okay, so 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Bingo. Happy New Year, Happy gentlemen. New Year, boys. Can't believe it. 2024. Woo! Wow. Unbelievable. I know, Tim, you still have three hours left, but... <laughs> oh, Tim, what are you going to do now? Are you are you going to go... Uh... I'm going to go have a big piece of carrot cake. Ooh, that sounds lovely. Yeah. It's going to be great. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to go... Um... I'm not sure what I'm going to go do right now, but I'm going to go play with the dogs here for a few minutes. Well, thanks. Right. Thanks for making me part of your uh, live stream. And, and Guys, I'll, thank I'll you see. all for that. I'm going to bring Mike back on here and say, Mike, thank, thanks, Mike, for uh, for being here. Yeah. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, Happy New, New Year, Mike. Here. Good to see you, Tim. I'll see you soon, hopefully. And Yeah. You Lord, it's great to see you. Good to see you. All right, guys. Have a great evening. We'll me see too. you. Take Night. care. Happy Bye. New Year. Happy New, New Year. Year. See you guys. Bye. Bye.